Section 1 of Under Fire, The Story of a Squad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. Under Fire, The Story of a Squad by Henri Barbousse. Translated by William Fitzwater Ray. To the memory of the comrades who fell by my side at Crewe and on Hill 119, January, May, and September 1915. Chapter 1 The Vision Mont Blanc, the Dent du Midi, and the Aiguille Verte look across at the bloodless faces that show above the blankets along the gallery of the sanatorium. This roofed-in gallery of rustic woodwork on the first floor of the palatial hospital is isolated in space and overlooks the world. The blankets of fine wool, red, green, brown or white, from which those wasted cheeks and shining eyes protrude, are quite still. No sound comes from the long couches except when someone coughs, or that the pages of a book turned over at long and regular intervals, or the undertone of question and quiet answer between neighbours or now and again the crescendo disturbance of a daring crow escaped to the balcony from those flocks that seemed threaded across the immense transparency like chaplets of black pearls silence is obligatory besides the rich and high placed who have come here from all the ends of the earth smitten by the same evil have lost the habit of talking they have withdrawn into themselves to think of their life and of their death a servant appears in the balcony dressed in white and walking softly she brings newspapers and hands them about it's decided says the first to unfold his paper war is declared expected as the news is its effect is almost dazing for this audience feels that its portent is without measure or limit these men of culture and intelligence detached from the affairs of the world and almost from the world itself whose faculties are deepened by suffering and meditation as far remote from their fellow men as if they were already of the future these men look deeply into the distance towards the unknowable land of the living and the insane austria's act is a crime says the austrian france must win says the englishman i hope germany will be beaten says the german they settle down again under the blankets and on the pillows looking to heaven and the high peaks but in spite of that vast purity the silence is filled with the dire disclosure of a moment before war some of the invalids break the silence and say the word again under their breath reflecting that this is the greatest happening of the age and perhaps of all ages even on the lucid landscape at which they gaze the news casts something like a vague and sombre mirage the tranquil expanses of the valley adorned with soft and smooth pastures and hamlets rosy as the rose with the sable shadow stains of the majestic mountains and the black lace and white of pines and eternal snow become alive with the movements of men whose multitudes swarm in distinct masses attacks develop wave by wave across the fields and then stand still houses are eviscerated like human beings and towns like houses villages appear in crumpled whiteness as though fallen from heaven to earth the very shape of the plain is changed by the frightful heaps of wounded and slain each country whose frontiers are consumed by carnage is seen tearing from its heart ever more warriors of full blood and force one's eyes follow the flow of these living tributaries to the river of death to north and south and west afar there are battles on every side turn where you will there is war in every corner of that vastness one of the pale-faced clairvoyants lifts himself on his elbow reckons and numbers the fighters present and to come thirty millions of soldiers another stammers his eyes full of slaughter two armies at death grips that is one great army committing suicide it should not have been says the deep and hollow voice of the first in the line but another says it is the french revolution beginning again let thrones beware says another's undertone a third adds perhaps it is the last war of all a silence follows then some heads are shaken in dissent whose faces have been blanched anew by the stale tragedy of sleepless night 
Stop war? Stop war? Impossible. There is no cure for the world's disease. Someone coughs, and then the vision is swallowed up in the huge sunlit peace of the lush meadows. In the rich colours of the glowing kine, the black forests, the green fields and the blue distance, dies the reflection of the fire where the old world burns and breaks. Infinite silence engulfs the uproar of hate and pain from the dark swarmings of mankind. They who have spoken retire one by one within themselves, absorbed once more in their own mysterious malady. But when evening is ready to descend within the valley, a storm breaks over the mass of Mont Blanc. One may not go forth in such peril, for the last waves of the storm wind roll even to the great veranda, to that harbour where they have taken refuge. And these victims of a great internal wound encompass with their gaze the elemental convulsion. They watch how the explosions of thunder on the mountain upheave the level clouds like a stormy sea how each one hurls a shaft of fire and a column of cloud together into the twilight how they turn their wan and sunken faces to follow the flight of the eagles that wheel in the sky and look from their supreme height down through the wreathing mists down to earth put an end to war say the watchers forbid the storm cleansed from the passions of party and faction liberated from prejudice and infatuation and the tyranny of tradition these watchers on the threshold of another world are vaguely conscious of the simplicity of the present and the yawning possibilities of the future the man at the end of the rank cries i can see things crawling down there yes as though they were alive some sort of plant perhaps some kind of men and there amid the baleful glimmers of the storm below the dark disorder of the clouds that extend and unfurl over the earth like evil spirits they seem to see a great livid plain unrolled which to their seeing is made of mud and water while figures appear and fast fix themselves to the surface of it all blinded and borne down with filth like the dreadful castaways of shipwreck and it seems to them that these are soldiers the streaming plain seamed and seared with long parallel canals and scooped into water-holes is an immensity and these castaways who strive to exhume themselves from it are legion but the thirty million slaves hurled upon one another in the mud of war by guilt and error uplift their human faces and reveal at last a burgeoning will the future is in the hands of these slaves and it is clearly certain that the alliance to be cemented some day by those whose number and whose misery alike are infinite will transform the old world End of chapter 1。section two of under fire the story of a squad。this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org。under fire the story of a squad by henri barbus translated by william fitzwater ray。chapter two in the earth part one the great pale sky is alive with thunderclaps each detonation reveals together a shaft of red falling fire in what is left of the night and a column of smoke in what has dawned of the day up there so high and so far that they are heard unseen a flight of dreadful birds goes circling up with strong and palpitating cries to look down upon the earth the earth it is a vast and water-logged desert that begins to take shape under the long-drawn desolation of daybreak there are pools and gullies where the bitter breath of earliest morning nips the water and sets it a shiver tracks traced by the troops and the convoys of the night in these barren fields the lines of ruts that glisten in the weak light like steel rails mud masses with broken stakes protruding from them ruined trestles and bushes of wire in tangled coils with its slime beds and puddles the plain might be an endless grey sheet that floats on the sea and has here and there gone under though no rain is falling all is drenched oozing washed out and drowned and even the wan light seems to flow 
now you can make out a network of long ditches where the lave of the night still lingers it is the trench it is carpeted at bottom with a layer of slime that liberates the foot at each step with a sticky sound and by each dugout it smells of the night's excretions the holes themselves as you stoop to peer in are foul of breath i see shadows coming from these sidelong pits and moving about huge and misshapen lumps bear-like that flounder and growl they are us we are muffled like eskimos fleeces and blankets and sacking wrap us up weigh us down magnify us strangely some stretch themselves yawning profoundly faces appear ruddy or leaden dirt disfigured pierced by the little lamps of dull and heavy-lidded eyes matted with uncut beards and foul with forgotten hair crack crack boom rifle fire and cannonade above us and all around it crackles and rolls in long gusts or separate explosions the flaming and melancholy storm never never ends for more than fifteen months for five hundred days in this part of the world where we are the rifles and the big guns have gone on from morning to night and from night to morning we are buried deep in an everlasting battlefield but like the ticking of the clocks at home in the days gone by in the now almost legendary past you only hear the noise when you listen a babyish face with puffy eyelids and cheekbones as lurid as if lozenge shaped bits of crimson paper had been stuck on comes out of the ground opens one eye then the other it is paradis the skin of his fat cheeks is scored with the marks of the folds in the tent cloth that has served him for nightcap the glance of his little eye wanders all round me he sees me nods and says another night gone old chap yes sonny how many more like it still he raises his two plump arms skywards he has managed to scrape out by the steps of the dugout and is beside me after stumbling over the dim obstacle of a man who sits in the shadows fervently scratches himself and sighs hoarsely paradis makes off lamely splashing like a penguin through the flooded picture one by one the men appear from the depths in the corners heavy shadows are seen forming human clouds that move and break up one by one they become recognizable there is one who comes out hooded with his blanket a savage you would say or rather the tent of a savage which walks and sways from side to side near by and heavily framed in knitted wool a square face is disclosed yellow-brown as though iodized and patterned with blackish patches the nose broken the eyes of chinese restriction and red circled a little coarse and moist moustache like a greasing brush there's Vopata. How goes it, Fermin? It goes, it goes, and it comes, says Vopata. His heavy and drawling voice is aggravated by hoarseness. He coughs. My number's up this time. Say, did you hear it last night, the attack? My boy, talk about a bombardment, something very choice in the way of mixtures. He sniffles and passes his sleeve under his concave nose. His hand gropes within his greatcoat and his jacket till it finds the skin and scratches. I've killed thirty of them in the candle, he growls. In the big dugout by the tunnel, mon vieux, there are some like crumbs of metal bread. You can see them running about in the straw, like I'm telling you. Who's been attacking? The bouquets? The bouquets and us too. Out vimi way, a counter-attack. Didn't you hear it? no the big lemuse the ox-man replies on my account i was snoring but i was on fatigue all night the night before i heard it declares the little breton biquet i slept badly or rather didn't sleep i got a doss house all to myself look see there it is the damn thing he points to a trough on the ground level where on a meagre mattress of muck there is just body room for one talk about home in a nutshell he declares wagging the rough and rock-hard little head that looks as if it had never been finished i hardly snoozed i'd just got off but was woke up by the relief of the one twenty-ninth that went by 
not by the noise but the smell ah all those chaps with their feet on the level with my nose it woke me up it gave me nose ache so i knew it i have often been wakened in the trench myself by the trail of heavy smell in the wake of marching men it was all right at least if it killed the vermin said tourette on the contrary it excites them says lamuse the worse you smell the more you have of them and it's lucky biquet went on that their stink woke me up as i was telling that great tub just now i got my peepers open just in time to seize the tent cloth that shut my hole up one of those muck heaps was going to pinch it off me dirty devils the one twenty ninth the human form from which the words came could now be distinguished down below at our feet where the morning had not yet reached it grasping his abundant clothing by hands full he squatted and wriggled it was papa blair his little eyes blinked among the dust that luxuriated on his face above the gap of his toothless mouth his moustache made a heavy sallow lump his hands were horribly black the top of them shaggy with dirt the palms plastered in grey relief himself shrivelled and dirt bedight exhaled the scent of an ancient stew-pan though busily scratching he chatted with big barquay who leaned towards him from a little way off i wasn't as mucky as this when i was a civvy he said well my poor friend it's a dirty change for the worse said barquay lucky for you says tourette going one better when it comes to kids you'll present madame with some little niggers blair took offence and gathering gloom wrinkled his brow what have you got to give me lip about you what next it's war time as for you bean face you think perhaps the war hasn't changed your physog and your manners look at yourself monkey snout buttock skin a man must be a beast to talk as you do he passed his hand over the dark deposit on his face which the rains of those days had proved finally indelible and added besides if i am as i am it's my own choosing to begin with i have no teeth the major said to me a long time ago you haven't a single tooth it's not enough at your next rest he says take a turn round to the estomatological ambulance the tomatological ambulance corrected barquet stomatological bertrand amended you have all the making of an army cook you ought to have been one said barquet my idea too retorted blair innocently some one laughed the black man got up at the insult you give me belly ache he said with scorn i'm off to the latrines when his doubly dark silhouette had vanished the others scrutinized once more the great truth that down here in the earth the cooks are the dirtiest of men if you see a chap with his skin and toggery so smeared and stained that you wouldn't touch him with a barge pole you can say to yourself probably he's a cook and the dirtier he is the more likely to be a cook it's true and true again said martereau tiens there's tirloir hey tirloir he comes up busily peering this way and that on an eager scent his insignificant head pale as chlorine hops centrally about in the cushioning collar of a greatcoat that is much too heavy and big for him his chin is pointed and his upper teeth protrude a wrinkle round his mouth is so deep with dirt that it looks like a muzzle as usual he is angry and as usual he rages aloud some one cut my pouch in two last night it was the relief of the one twenty ninth where had you put it he indicates a bayonet stuck in the wall of the trench close to the mouth of a funk hole there hanging on the toothpick there ass comes the chorus within reach of passing soldiers not dotty are you it's hard lines all the same wails tirloir then suddenly a fit of rage seizes him his face crumples his little fists clench in fury he tightens them like knots in string and waves them about allure quoi ah if i had hold of the mongrel that did it talk about breaking his jaw i'd stave in his bread-pan i there was a whole camembert in there i'll go and look for it 
he massages his stomach with the little sharp taps of a guitar player and plunges into the grey of the morning grinning yet dignified with his awkward outlines of an invalid in a dressing-gown we hear him grumbling until he disappears strange man that says pepin the others chuckle he's daft and crazy declares martereau who is in the habit of fortifying the expression of his thought by using two synonyms at once tiens old man says tulacque as he comes up look at this tulacque is magnificent he is wearing a lemon yellow coat made out of an oilskin sleeping sack he has arranged a hole in the middle to get his head through and compelled his shoulder straps and belt to go over it he is tall and bony he holds his face in advance as he walks a forceful face with eyes that squint he has something in his hand i found this while digging last night at the end of the new gallery to change the rotten gratings it took my fancy off-hand that knick-knack it's an old pattern of hatchet it was indeed an old pattern a sharpened flint hafted with an old brown bone quite a prehistoric tool in appearance very handy said Tilacque, fingering it yes not badly thought out better balanced than the regulation axe that'll be useful to me you'll see as he brandishes that axe of post tertiary man he would himself pass for an ape-man decked out with rags and lurking in the bowels of the earth one by one we gathered we of bertrand's squad and the half section at an elbow of the trench just here it is a little wider than in the straight part where when you meet another and have to pass you must throw yourself against the side rub your back in the earth and your stomach against the stomach of the other our company occupies in reserve a second line parallel no night watchman works here at night we are ready for making earthworks in front but as long as the day lasts we have nothing to do huddled up together and linked arm in arm it only remains to await the evening as best we can daylight has at last crept into the interminable crevices that furrow this part of the earth and now it finds the threshold of our holes it is the melancholy light of the north country of a restricted and muddy sky a sky which itself one would say is heavy with the smoke and smell of factories in this leaden light the uncouth array of these dwellers in the depths reveals the stark reality of the huge and hopeless misery that brought it into being but that is like the rattle of rifles and the verberation of artillery the drama in which we are actors has lasted much too long for us to be surprised any more either at the stubbornness we have evolved or the garb we have devised against the rain that comes from above against the mud that comes from beneath and against the cold that sort of infinity that is everywhere the skins of animals bundles of blankets balaclava helmets woollen caps furs bulging mufflers sometimes worn turban wise paddings and quiltings knittings and double knittings coverings and roofings and cowls tarred or oiled or rubbered black or all the colours once upon a time of the rainbow all these things mask and magnify the men and wipe out their uniforms almost as effectively as their skins one has fastened on his back a square of linoleum with a big draught-board pattern in white and red that he found in the middle of the dining-room of some temporary refuge that is pepin we know him afar off by his harlequin placard sooner even than by his pale apache face here is barque's bulging chest protector carven from an eider-down quilt formerly pink but now fantastically bleached and mottled by dust and rain there lemuse the huge rises like a ruined tower to which tattered posters still cling a cuirass of moleskin with the fur inside adorns little eudor with the burnished back of a beetle while the golden corselet of tulacque the big chief surpasses all the tin hat gives a certain sameness to the highest points of the beings that are there but even then the divers ways of wearing it on the regulation cap like biquet over a balaclava like cadillac 
or on a cotton cap like barque produce a complicated diversity of appearance and our legs i went down just now bent double into our dugout the little low cave that smells musty and damp where one stumbles over empty jam pots and dirty rags where two long lumps lay asleep while in the corner a kneeling shape rummaged a pouch by candlelight as i climbed out the rectangle of entry afforded me a revelation of our legs flat on the ground vertically in the air or a slant spread about doubled up or mixed together blocking the fairway and cursed by passers-by they present a collection of many colours and many shapes gaiters leggings black or yellow long or short in leather in tawny cloth in any sort of waterproof stuff puttees in dark blue light blue black sage green khaki and beige alone of all his kind volpate has retained the modest gaiters of mobilization mesnil andre has displayed for a fortnight a pair of thick woollen stockings ribbed in green and tourette has always been known by his grey cloth puttees with white stripes commandeered from a pair of civilian trousers that was hanging goodness knows where at the beginning of the war as for martyrose puttees they are not both of the same hue for he failed to find two fag ends of great coat equally worn and equally dirty to be cut up into strips there are legs wrapped up in rags too and even in newspapers which are kept in place with spirals of thread or much more practical telephone wire pepin fascinated his friends and the passers-by with a pair of fawn gaiters borrowed from a corpse barque who poses as a resourceful man full of ideas and heaven knows what a bore it makes of him at times has white calves for he wrapped surgical bandages round his leg cloths to preserve them a snowy souvenir at his latter end of the cotton cap at the other which protrudes below his helmet and is left behind in its turn by a saucy red tassel Potterloo has been walking about for a month in the boots of a german soldier nearly new and with horseshoes on the heels caron entrusted them to potterloo when he was sent back on account of his arm caron had taken them himself from a bavarian machine-gunner knocked out near the pylones road i can hear caron telling about it yet old oh, man he was there his buttocks in a hole doubled up gaping at the sky with his legs in the air and his pumps offered themselves to me with an air that meant they were worth my while a tight fit says i but you talk about a job to bring those beetle crushers of his away i worked on top of him tugging twisting and shaking for half an hour and no lie about it with his feet gone quite stiff the patient didn't help me a bit then at last the legs of it they had been pulled about so came unstuck at the knees and his breeks tore away and all the lot came flop there was me all of a sudden with a full boot in each fist the legs and feet had to be emptied out you're going it a bit strong ask euterpe the cyclist if it isn't true i tell you he did it along of me too we shoved our arms inside the boots and pulled out of em some bones and bits of socks and bits of feet but look if they weren't worth while so until caron returns potterloo continues on his behalf the wearing of the bavarian machine-gunner's boots thus do they exercise their wits according to their intelligence their vivacity their resources and their boldness in the struggle with the terrible discomfort each one seems to make the revealing declaration this is all that i knew all i was able all that i dared to do in the great misery which has befallen me mesnil joseph drowses blair yawns martyreau smokes eyes front lamuse scratches himself like a gorilla and eudore like a marmoset Valpate coughs and says i'm kicking the bucket mesnil andre and has got out his mirror and comb and is tending his fine chestnut beard as though it were a rare plant the monotonous calm is disturbed here and there by the outbreaks of ferocious resentment provoked by the presence of parasites endemic chronic and contagious barque who is an observant man sends an itinerant glance around 
takes his pipe from his mouth, spits, winks, and says, I say, we don't resemble each other much. Why should we, says Lamuse? It would be a miracle if we did. Our ages? We are of all ages. Ours is a regiment in reserve, which successive reinforcements have renewed partly with fighting units and partly with territorials. In our half-section there are reservists of the territorial army, new recruits and demi-poils. Fouillade is forty. Blair might be the father of Biquet, who is a gosling of class 1913. The corporal cars martereau grandpa or old rubbish heap according as in jest or in earnest mesnil joseph would be at the barracks if there were no war it is a comical effect when we are in charge of sergeant vigile a nice little boy with a dab on his lip by way of moustache when we were in quarters the other day he played at skipping rope with the kiddies in our ill-assorted flock in this family without kindred this home without a hearth at which we gather there are three generations side by side living waiting standing still like unfinished statues like posts our races we are of all races we come from everywhere i look at the two men beside me potterloo the miner from the cologne pit is pink his eyebrows are the colour of straw his eyes flax blue his great golden head involved a long search in the stores to find the vast steel-blue tureen that bonnets him fouillade the boatman from setta rolls his wicked eyes in the long lean face of a musketeer with sunken cheeks and his skin the colour of a violin in good sooth my two neighbours are as unlike as day and night Cocon, no less a slight and desiccated person in spectacles whose tint tells of corrosion in the chemical vapours of great towns contrasts with biquet a breton in the rough whose skin is grey and his jaw like a paving stone and mesnil andre the comfortable chemist from a country town in normandy who has such a handsome and silky beard and who talks so much and so well he has little in common with lamuse the fat peasant of poitou whose cheeks and neck are like underdone beef the suburban accent of barque whose long legs have scoured the streets of paris in all directions alternates with the semi-belgian cadence of those northerners who came from the eighth territorial with the sonorous speech rolling on the syllables as if over cobblestone that the one hundred and forty-fourth pours out upon us with the dialect blown from those ant-like clusters that the auvergnats so obstinately form among the rest i remember the first words of that wag tourette when he arrived i mes enfants i am from clichy la garenne can any one beat that and the first grievance that paradis brought to me they don't give a damn for me because i'm from morvan our callings a little of all in the lump in those departed days when we had a social status before we came to immure our destiny in the mole hills that we must always build up again as fast as rain and scrap iron beat them down what were we sons of the soil and artisans mostly lamuse was a farm servant paradis a carter cadillac whose helmet rides loosely on his pointed head though it is a juvenile size like a dome on a steeple says tourette owns land papa blair was a small farmer in labri barque porter and messenger performed acrobatic tricks with his carrier tricycle among the trains and taxis of paris with solemn abuse so they say for the pedestrians fleeing like bewildered hens across the big streets and squares corporal bertrand who keeps himself always a little aloof correct erect and silent with a strong and handsome face and forthright gaze was foreman in a case factory tirloir daubed carts with paint and without grumbling they say tulacque was barman at the throne tavern in the suburbs and eudor of the pale and pleasant face kept a roadside cafe not very far from the front lines it has been ill-used by the shells naturally for we all know that eudor has no luck mesnil andre who still retains a trace of well-kept distinction sold bicarbonate and infallible remedies at his pharmacy in a grand place 
His brother Joseph was selling papers and illustrated storybooks in a station on the state railways at the same time that in far-off Lyon, Coucan, the man of spectacles and statistics, dressed in a black smock, busied himself behind the counters of an ironmongery, his hands glittering with plumbago, while the lamps of Becuera Adolf and Potterloo, risen with the dawn, trailed about the coal pits of the north like weakling will-o'-the-wisps. And there are others amongst us whose occupations one can never recall, whom one confuses with one another, and the rural nondescripts who peddled ten trades at once in their packs, without counting the dubious Pepin, who can have had none at all. While at the depot after sick leave three months ago, they say, he got married to secure the separation allowance. The liberal professions are not represented among those around me. Some teachers are subalterns in the company or Red Cross men. In the regiment, a Marist brother is sergeant in the service de santé. A professional tenor is cyclist dispatch rider to the major. A gentleman of independent means is mess corporal to the C.H.R., but here there is nothing of all that we are fighting men we others and we include hardly any intellectuals or men of the arts or of wealth who during this war will have risked their faces only at the loopholes unless in passing by or under gold-laced caps yes we are truly and deeply different from each other but we are alike all the same in spite of this diversity of age of country of education of position of everything possible in spite of the former gulfs that kept us apart we are in the main alike under the same uncouth outlines we conceal and reveal the same ways and habits the same simple nature of men who have reverted to the state primeval the same language compounded of dialect and the slang of workshop and barracks seasoned with the latest inventions blends us in the sauce of speech with the massed multitudes of men who for seasons now have emptied france and crowded together in the northeast here too linked by a fate from which there is no escape swept willy-nilly by the vast adventure into one rank we have no choice but to go as the weeks and months go alike the terrible narrowness of the common life binds us close adapts us merges us one in the other it is a sort of fatal contagion nor need you to see how alike we soldiers are be afar off at that distance say when we are only specks of the dust clouds that roll across the plain we are waiting weary of sitting we get up our joints creaking like warping wood or old hinges damp rusts men as it rusts rifles more slowly but deeper and we begin again but not in the same way to wait in a state of war one is always waiting we have become waiting machines for the moment it is food we are waiting for then it will be the post but each in its turn when we have done with dinner we will think about the letters after that we shall set ourselves to wait for something else hunger and thirst are urgent instincts which formidably excite the temper of my companions as the meal gets later they become grumblesome and angry their need of food and drink snarls from their lips that's eight o'clock now why the hell doesn't it come just so and me that's been pining since noon yesterday sulks lamuse whose eyes are moist with longing while his cheeks seem to carry great daubs of wine-coloured grease paint discontent grows more acute every minute i'll bet plumet has poured down his own gullet my wine ration that he's supposed to have and others with it and he's lying drunk over there somewhere it's sure and certain martereau seconds the proposition ah the rotters the vermin these fatigue men tourloir bellows an abominable race all of em mucky-nosed idlers they roll over each other all day long at the rear and they'll be damned before they'll be in time ah if i were boss they should damn quick take our places in the trenches and they'd have to work for a change to begin with i should say every man in the section will carry grease and soup in turns those who were willing of course i'm confident cries coucan it's that pepere that's keeping the others back he does it on purpose firstly and then too he can't finish plucking himself in the morning poor lad 
he wants ten hours for his flea hunt he's so finicking and if he can't get him monsieur has the pip all day be damned to him growls the muse i'd shift him out of bed if only i was there i'd wake him up with boot toe i'd i was reckoning the other day cocon went on it took him seven hours forty-seven minutes to come from thirty-one dugout it should take him five good hours but no longer cocon is the man of figures he has a deep affection amounting to rapacity for accuracy and recorded computation on any subject at all he goes burrowing after statistics gathers them with the industry of an insect and serves them up on any one who will listen just now while he wields his figures like weapons the sharp ridges and angles and triangles that make up the paltry face where perch the double discs of his glasses are contracted with vexation he climbs to the firing step made in the days when this was the first line and raises his head angrily over the parapet the light touch of a little shaft of cold sunlight that lingers on the land sets a glitter both his glasses and the diamond that hangs from his nose and that prepared to talk about a drinking cup with the bottom out you'd never believe the weight of stuff he can let drop on a single journey with his pipe in the corner papa blair fumes in two senses you can see his heavy moustache trembling it is like a comb made of bone whitish and drooping do you want to know what i think these dinnermen they're the dirtiest dogs of all it's blast this and blast that john blast and company i call em they have all the elements of a dunghill about them says eudore with a sigh of conviction he is prone on the ground with his mouth half open and the air of a martyr with one fading eye he follows the movements of pepin who prowls to and fro like a hyena their spiteful exasperation with the loiterers mounts higher and higher Wire, the grumbler takes the lead and expands this is where he comes in with his little pointed gesticulations he goads and spurs the anger all around him ah the devils what the sort of meat they threw at us yesterday talk about whetstones beef from an ox that beef from a bicycle yes rather i said to the boys look here you chaps don't you chew it too quick or you'll break your front teeth on the nails Wire's harangue he was manager of a travelling cinema it seems would have made us laugh at other times but in the present temper it is only echoed by a circulating growl another time so that you won't grumble about the toughness they send you something soft and flabby that passes for meat something with the look and the taste of a sponge or a poultice when you chew that it's the same as a cup of water no more and no less tout ça says lamuse has no substance it gets no grip on your guts you think you're full but at the bottom of your tank you're empty so bit by bit you turn your eyes up poison for want of sustenance the next time biquet exclaims in desperation i shall ask to see the old man and i shall say mon capitaine and i says barque shall make myself look sick and i shall say monsieur le major and get nicks or the kick out they're all alike all in a band to take it out of the poor private i tell you they'd like to get the very skin off us and the brandy too we have a right to get it brought to the trenches as long as it's been decided somewhere i don't know when or where but i know it and in the three days that we've been here there's three days that the brandy's been dealt out to us on the end of a fork ah malheur there's the grub announces a poilu who was on the lookout at the corner time too and the storm of revilings ceases as if by magic wrath is changed into sudden contentment three breathless fatigue men their faces streaming with tears of sweat put down on the ground some large tins a paraffin can two canvas buckets and a file of loaves skewered on a stick leaning against the wall of the trench they mop their faces with their handkerchiefs or sleeves and i can see cocon go up to prepare with a smile and forgetful of the abuse he had been heaping on the other's reputation he stretches out a cordial hand towards one of the cans in the collection that swells the circumference of prepare after the manner of a life belt what is there to eat it's there is the evasive reply of the second fatigue man whom experience has taught that a proclamation of the menu always evokes the bitterness of disillusion 
so they set themselves to panting abuse of the length and the difficulties of the trip they have just accomplished some crowds about everywhere it's a tough job to get along got to disguise yourself as a cigarette paper sometimes and there are people who say they're shirkers in the kitchens as for him he would a hundred thousand times rather be with the company in the trenches to mount guard and dig than earn his keep by such a job twice a day during the night paradis having lifted the lids of the jars surveys the recipients and announces kidney beans and oil bully pudding and coffee that's all nom de dieu balls to laque and wine he summons the crowd come and look here all of you that that's the limit we're done out of our wine athirst and grimacing they hurry up and from the profoundest depths of their being wells up the chorus of despair and disappointment oh hell then what's that in there says the fatigued man still ruddily sweating and using his foot to point at a bucket yes says parody my mistake there is some the fatigued man shrugs his shoulders and hurls at parody a look of unspeakable scorn now you're beginning get your gig lamps on if your sight's bad he adds one cup each rather less perhaps some chuckle had bumped against me coming through the boyau de bois and a drop got spilled ah he hastens to add raising his voice if i hadn't been loaded up talk about the boot toe he'd have got in the rump but he hopped it on his top gear the brute in spite of this confident assurance the fatigue man makes off himself curses overtaking him as he goes maledictions charged with offensive reflections on his honesty and temperance imprecations inspired by this revelation of a ration reduced all the same they throw themselves on the food and eat it standing squatting kneeling sitting on tins or on haversacks pulled out of the holes where they sleep or even prone their backs on the ground disturbed by passers-by cursed at and cursing apart from these fleeting insults and jests they say nothing the primary and universal interest being but to swallow with their mouths and the circumference thereof as greasy as a rifle breech contentment is theirs at the earliest cessation of their jawbones activity they serve up the most ribald of raillery they knock each other about and clamour in riotous rivalry to have their say one sees even far for day smiling the frail municipal clerk who in the early days kept himself so decent and clean amongst us all that he was taken for a foreigner or a convalescent one sees the tomato-like mouth of lamuse dilate and divide and his delight ooze out in tears potterloo's face like a pink peony opens out wider and wider papa blair's wrinkles flicker with frivolity as he stands up pokes his head forward and gesticulates with the abbreviated body that serves as a handle for his huge drooping moustache even the corrugations of cocon's poor little face are lighted up Bukwe goes in search of firewood to warm the coffee while we wait for our drink we roll cigarettes and fill pipes pouches are pulled out some of us have shop acquired pouches in leather or rubber but they are a minority biquet extracts his tobacco from a sock of which the mouth is drawn tight with string most of the others use the bags for anti-gas pads made of some waterproof material which is an excellent preservative of shag be it coarse or fine and there are those who simply fumble for it in the bottom of their great coat pockets the smokers spit in a circle just at the mouth of the dugout which most of the half section inhabit and flood with tobacco-stained saliva the place where they put their hands and feet when they flatten themselves to get in or out but who notices such a detail end of chapter two part one section three of under fire the story of a squad this is the librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org under fire the story of a squad by henri barbusse translated by william fitzwater ray chapter two in the earth part two 
now apropos of a letter to martereau from his wife they discuss produce la mere martereau has written he says that fat pig we've got at home a fine specimen guess how much she's worth now but the subject of domestic economy degenerates suddenly into a fierce altercation between pepin and tulacque words of quite unmistakable significance are exchanged then i don't care a what you say or what you don't say shut it up i shall shut it when i want midden a seven pound thump would shut it up quick enough who from who'll give it me come and find out they grind their teeth and approach each other in a foaming rage tulacque grasps his prehistoric axe and his squinting eyes are flashing the other is pale and his eyes have a greenish glint you can see in his blackguard face that his thoughts are with his knife but between the two as they grip each other in looks and mangle in words lamuse intervenes with his huge pacific head like a baby's and his face of sanguinary hue allons allons you're not going to cut yourselves up can't be allowed the others also interpose and the antagonists are separated but they continue to hurl murderous looks at each other across the barrier of their comrades pepin mutters a residue of slander in tones that quiver with malice the hooligan the ruffian the blackguard but wait a bit i'll see him later about this on the other side tulacque confides in the poilu who is beside him that crab louse no but you know what he is you know there's no more to be said here we've got to rub along with a lot of people that we don't know from adam we know em and yet we don't know em but that man if he thinks he can mess me about he'll find himself up the wrong street you wait a bit i'll smash him up one of these days you'll see meanwhile the general conversation is resumed drowning the last twin echoes of the quarrel it's every day alike alor says paradis to me yesterday it was plaisance who wanted to let few makes have it heavy on the jaw about god knows what a matter of opium pills i think first it's one and then it's another that talks of doing some one in are we getting to be a lot of wild animals because we look like em mustn't take them too seriously these men lamuse declares they're only kids true enough seeing that they're men the day matures a little more light has trickled through the mists that enclose the earth but the sky has remained overcast and now it dissolves in rain with a slowness which itself disheartens the wind brings back its great wet void upon us the rain haze makes everything clammy and dull even the turkey red of lamuse's cheeks and even the orange armor that caparisons to laque the water penetrates to the deep joy with which dinner endowed us and puts it out space itself shrinks and the sky which is a field of melancholy comes closely down upon the earth which is a field of death we are still there implanted and idle it will be hard to-day to reach the end of it to get rid of the afternoon we shiver in discomfort and keep shifting our positions like cattle enclosed cocon is explaining to his neighbor the arrangement and intricacy of our trenches he has seen a military map and made some calculations in the sector occupied by our regiment there are fifteen lines of french trenches some are abandoned invaded by grass and half levelled the others solidly upkept and bristling with men these parallels are joined up by innumerable galleries which hook and crook themselves like ancient streets the system is much more dense than we believe who live inside it on the twenty-five kilometres width that form the army front one must count on a thousand kilometres of hollowed lines trenches and saps of all sorts and the french army consists of ten such armies 
there are then on the french side about ten thousand kilometers of trenches and as much again on the german side and the french front is only about one-eighth of the whole war front of the world thus speaks cocon and he ends by saying to his neighbor in all that lot you see what we are us chaps poor barque's head droops his face bloodless as a slum child's is underlined by a red goatee that punctuates his hair like an apostrophe yes it's true when you come to think of it what's a soldier or even several soldiers nothing and less than nothing in the whole crowd and so we see ourselves lost drowned like the few drops of blood that we are among all this flood of men and things barque sighs and is silent and the end of his discourse gives a chance of hearing to a bit of jingling narrative told in an undertone he was coming along with two horses fss, a shell and he's only one horse left you get fed up with it says Vopate. but you stick it growls barque you've got to says paradis why ask martereau without conviction no need for a reason as long as we've got to there is no reason lamuse avers yes there is says cocon it's or rather there are several shut it up much better to have no reason as long as we've got to stick it all the same comes the hollow voice of blair who lets no chance slip of airing his pet phrase all the same they'd like to steal the very skin off us at the beginning of it says tourette i used to think about a heap of things i considered and calculated now i don't think any more nor me either nor me i've never tried to you're not such a fool as you look flea face says the shrill and jeering voice of mesnil andre obscurely flattered the other develops his theme to begin with you can't know anything about anything says corporal bertrand there's only one thing you need know and it's this that the bocas are here in front of us deep dug in and we've got to see that they don't get through and we've got to put em out one day or another as soon as possible we oui, we oui, they've got to leg it and no mistake about it what else is there not worth while to worry your head thinking about anything else but it's a long job an explosion of profane assent comes from fouillade and he adds that's what it is i've given up grousing says barque at the beginning of it i played hell with everybody with the people at the rear with the civilians with the natives with the shirkers yes i played hell but that was at the beginning of the war i was young now i take things better there's only one way of taking em as they come of course otherwise you'd go crazy we're dotty enough already eh vermin volpate assents with a nod of profound conviction he spits and then contemplates his missile with a fixed and unseeing eye you were saying insists barque here you haven't got to look too far in front you must live from day to day and from hour to hour as well as you can certain sure monkey face we've got to do what they tell us to do until they tell us to go away that's all yawns mesnil joseph silence follows the recorded opinions that proceed from these dried and tanned faces inlaid with dust this evidently is the credo of the men who a year and a half ago left all the corners of the land to mass themselves on the frontier give up trying to understand and give up trying to be yourself hope that you will not die and fight for life as well as you can do what you've got to do we oui, but get out of your own messes yourself says barque as he slowly stirs the mud to and fro no choice to laque backs him up if you don't get out of em yourself no one'll do it for you he's not yet quite extinct the man that bothers about the other fellow every man for himself in war that's so that's so silence 
then from the depth of their destitution these men summon sweet souvenirs all that barque goes on isn't worth much compared with the good times we had at soissons ah the devil a gleam of paradise lost lights up their eyes and seems even to redden their cold faces talk about a festival sighs tiroir as he leaves off scratching himself and looks pensively far away over trench land ah nom de dieu all that town nearly abandoned that used to be ours the houses and the beds and the cupboards and the cellars the muse's eyes are wet his face like a nosegay his heart full were you there long asked cadillac who came here later with the draughts from auvergne several months the conversation had almost died out but it flames up again fiercely at this vision of the days of plenty we used to see said berardy dreamily the poilu pouring along and behind the houses on the way back to camp with fowls hung round their middles and a rabbit under each arm borrowed from some good fellow or woman that they hadn't seen and won't ever see again we reflect on the far-off flavor of chicken and rabbit there were things that we paid for too the spandu licks just danced about we held all the aces in those days a hundred thousand francs went rolling round the shops millions we oui, all the day just a squandering that you've no idea of a sort of devil's delight believe me or not said blair to cadillac but in the middle of it all what we had the least of was fires just like here and everywhere else you go you had to chase it and find it and stick to it ah mon vieux how we did run after the kindlings well we were in the camp of the c h r the cook there was the great martin cesar he was the man for finding wood ah oui oui he was the ace of trumps he got what he wanted without twisting himself always some fire in his kitchen young fellow you saw cooks chasing and gabbling about the streets in all directions blubbering because they had no coal or wood but he'd got a fire when he hadn't any he said don't worry i'll see you through and he wasn't long about it either he went a bit too far even the first time i saw him in his kitchen you'd never guess what he'd got the stew going with with a violin that he'd found in the house rotten all the same says mesnil andre one knows well enough that a violin isn't worth much when it comes to utility but all the same other times he used billiard cues zizi just succeeded in pinching one for a cane but the rest into the fire then the armchairs in the drawing-room went by degrees mahogany they were he did em in and cut them up by night case some n c o had something to say about it he knew his way about said pepin as for us we got busy with an old suite of furniture that lasted us a fortnight and what for should we be without you've got to make dinner and there's no wood or coal after the grub served out there you are with your jaws empty with a pile of meat in front of you and in the middle of a lot of pals that chaff and bully rag you it's the war office's doing it isn't ours hadn't the officers a lot to say about the pinching they damn well did it themselves i give you my word de maison do you remember lieutenant vervin's trick breaking down a cellar door with an axe and when a poilu saw him at it he gave him the door for firewood so that he wouldn't spread it about and poor old saladin the transport officer he was found coming out of a basement in the dusk with two bottles of white wine in each arm the sport like a nurse with two pairs of twins when he was spotted they made him go back down to the wine cellar and serve out bottles for everybody but corporal bertrand who is a man of scruples wouldn't have any ah oh, you remember that do you sausage foot where's that cook now that always found wood asked cadillac he's dead 
a bomb fell in his stove he didn't get it but he's dead all the same died of shock when he saw his macaroni with its legs in the air heart seizure so the doc said his heart was weak he was only strong on wood they gave him a proper funeral made him a coffin out of the bedroom floor and got the picture nails out of the walls to fasten em together and used bricks to drive em in while they were carrying him off i thought to myself good thing for him he's dead if he saw that he'd never be able to forgive himself for not having thought of the bedroom floor for his fire ah what the devil are you doing son of a pig Wopate offers philosophy on the rude intrusion of a passing fatigue party the private gets along on the back of his pals when you spin your yarns in front of a fatigue gang or when you take the best bit or the best place it's the others that suffer i've often says lamuse put up dodges so as not to go into the trenches and it's come off no end of times i own up to that but when my pals are in danger i'm not a dodger any more i forget discipline and everything else i see men and i go but otherwise my boy i look after my little self lamuse's claims are not idle words he is an admitted expert at loafing but all the same he has brought wounded in under fire and saved their lives without any brag he relates the deed we were all lying on the grass and having a hot time crack crack whiz whiz when i saw them downed i got up though they yelled at me get down couldn't leave em like that nothing to make a song about seeing i couldn't do anything else nearly all the boys of the squad have some high deed of arms to their credit and the croix de guerre has been successively set upon their breasts i haven't saved any frenchmen says biquet but i've given some bocus the bitter pill in the may attacks he ran off in advance and was seen to disappear in the distance but came back with four fine fellows in helmets i too says tulacque i've killed some two months ago with quaint vanity he laid out nine in a straight row in front of the taken trench but he adds it's always the boca officer that i'm after ah the beasts the curse comes from several men at once and from the bottom of their hearts ah mon vieux says tilloy we talk about the dirty boca race but as for the common soldier i don't know if it's true or whether we're cotted about that as well and if at bottom they're not men pretty much like us probably they're men like us says eudore perhaps cries coucan and perhaps not anyway tilloy goes on we've not got a dead set on the men but on the german officers no 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 they're not men they're monsters i tell you they're really a specially filthy sort of vermin one might say that they're the microbes of the war you ought to see them close to the infernal great stiffbacks thin as nails though they've got calf heads and snouts like snakes tirloir continues i saw one once a prisoner as i came back from liaison the beastly bastard a prussian colonel that wore a prince's crown so they told me and a gold coat of arms he was mad because we took leave to graze against him when they were bringing him back along the communication trench and he looked down on everybody like that i said to myself wait a bit old cock i'll make you rattle directly i took my time and squared up behind him and kicked into his tailpiece with all my might i tell you he fell down half strangled strangled yes with rage when it dawned on him that the rump of an officer and nobleman had been bust in by the hobnailed socks of a poor private he went off chattering like a woman and wriggling like an epileptic i'm not spiteful myself says blair i've got kiddies and it worries me too at home when i've got to kill a pig that i know but those i shall run em through bing full in the linen cupboard i too not to mention says pepin that they've got silver hats and pistols that you can get four quid for whenever you like and field-glasses that simply haven't got a price 
ah bad luck what a lot of chances i let slip in the early part of the campaign i was too much of a beginner then and it serves me right but don't worry i shall get a silver hat mark my words i swear i'll have one i must have not only the skin of one of wilhelm's red tabs but his togs as well don't fret yourself i'll fasten on to that before the war ends you think it'll have an end then asks someone don't worry replies the other meanwhile a hubbub has arisen to the right of us and suddenly a moving and buzzing group appears in which dark and bright forms mingle what's all that biquet has ventured on a reconnaissance and returns contemptuously pointing with his thumb towards the motley mass a eh, boys come and have a squint at them some people some people we oui, some gentlemen look you civvies with staff officers civilians let's hope they'll stick it it is the sacramental saying and evokes laughter although we have heard it a hundred times and although the soldier has rightly or wrongly perverted the original meaning and regards it as an ironical reflection on his life of privations and peril two somebodies come up two somebodies with overcoats and canes another is dressed in a sporting suit adorned with a plush hat and binoculars pale blue tunics with shining belts of fawn colour or patent leather follow and steer the civilians with an arm where a brassard glitters in gold-edged silk and golden ornament a captain indicates the firing step in front of an old emplacement and invites the visitors to get up and try it the gentleman in the touring suit clambers up with the aid of his umbrella says barque you've seen the station-master at the gare du nord all in his sunday best and opening the door of a first-class compartment for a rich sportsman on the first day of the shooting with his monte monsieur le propriétaire you know when the toffs are all togged up in brand-new outfits and leathers and ironmongery and showing off with all their paraphernalia for killing poor little animals three or four poilus who were quite without their accoutrements have disappeared underground the others sit as though paralyzed even the pipes go out and nothing is heard but the babble of talk exchanged by the officers and their guests trench tourists says barque in an undertone and then louder this way mesdames et messieurs in the manner of the moment chuck it whispers farfadet fearing that barque's malicious tongue will draw the attention of the potent personages some heads in the group are now turned our way one gentleman who detaches himself and comes up wears a soft hat and a loose tie he has a white billy goat beard and might be an artiste another follows him wearing a black overcoat a black bowler hat a black beard a white tie and an eyeglass ah ah there are some poilus says the first gentleman these are real poilus indeed he comes up to our party a little timidly as though in the zoological gardens and offers his hand to the one who is nearest to him not without awkwardness as one offers a piece of bread to the elephant he he they are drinking coffee he remarks they call it the juice corrects the magpie man is it good my friends the soldier abashed in his turn by this alien and unusual visitation grunts giggles and reddens and the gentleman says he he then with a slight motion of the head he withdraws backwards the assemblage with its neutral shades of civilian cloth and its sprinkling of bright military hues like geraniums and hortensias in the dark soil of a flower-bed oscillates then passes and moves off the opposite way it came one of the officers was heard to say we have yet much to see messieurs les journalistes when the radiant spectacle has faded away we look at each other those who had fled into the funk holes now gradually and head first disinter themselves the group recovers itself and shrugs its shoulders they're journalists says tourette 
journalists why yes the individuals that lay the newspapers you don't seem to catch on fathead newspapers must have chaps to write em then it's those that stuff up our craniums says martereau barque assumes a shrill treble and pretending that he has a newspaper in front of his nose recites the crown prince is mad after having been killed at the beginning of the campaign and meanwhile he has all the diseases you can name william will die this evening and again to-morrow the germans have no more munitions and are chewing wood they cannot hold out according to the most authoritative calculations beyond the end of the week we can have them when we like with their rifles slung if one can wait a few days longer there will be no desire to forsake the life of the trenches one is so comfortable there with water and gas laid on and shower baths at every step the only drawback is that it is rather too hot in winter as for the austrians they gave in a long time since and are only pretending for fifteen months now it's been like that and you can hear the editor saying to his scribes now boys get into it find some way of brushing that up again for me in five secs and make it spin out all over those four damned white sheets that we've got to mucky ah yes says fouillade look here corporal you're making fun of it isn't it true what i said there's a little truth in it but you're too slashing on the poor boys and you'd be the first to make a song about it if you had to go without papers we when the paper man's going by why do you all shout here here and what good can you get out of them all cries papa blair read em by the tubful if you like but do the same as me don't believe em wee oui, wee oui, that's enough about them turn the page over donkey nose the conversation is breaking up interest in it follows suit and is scattered four poilus join in a game of manilla that will last until night blacks out the cards volpate is trying to catch a leaf of cigarette paper that has escaped his fingers and goes hopping and dodging in the wind along the wall of the trench like a fragile butterfly cocon and tourette are recalling their memories of barrack life the impressions left upon their minds by those years of military training are ineffaceable into that fund of abundant souvenirs of abiding colour and instant service they have been wont to dip for their subjects of conversation for ten fifteen or twenty years so that they still frequent it even after a year and a half of actual war in all its forms i can hear some of the talk and guess the rest of it for it is everlastingly the same sort of tale that they get out of their military past the narrator once shut up a bad-tempered n c o with words of extreme appropriateness and daring he wasn't afraid he spoke out loud and strong some scraps of it reach my ears our lord do you think i flinched when ninois said that to me not a bit my boy all the pals kept their jaws shut but me i spoke up mon ajudant i says it's possible but a sentence follows that i cannot secure oh to say just like that i said it he didn't get shirty good that's good he says as he hops it and afterwards he was as good as all that with me just like me with the door joutin of the thirteenth when i was on leave a mongrel now he's at the pathéon as caretaker he'd got it in for me so so each unpacks his own little load of historical anecdote they are all alike and not one of them but says as for me i'm not like the others the post orderly he is a tall and broad man with fat calves comfortable looking and as neat and tidy as a policeman he is in a bad temper there are new orders and now he has to go every day as far as battalion headquarters he abuses the order as if it had been directed exclusively against himself and he continues to complain even while he calls up the corporals for the post and maintains his customary chat en passant with this man and that and in spite of his spleen he does not keep to himself all the information with which he comes provided 
while removing the string from the letter packets he dispenses his verbal news and announces first that according to rumour there is a very explicit ban on the wearing of hoods hear that says tirette to tirloir got to chuck your fine hood away not likely i'm not on that's nothing to do with me replies the hooded one whose pride no less than his comfort is at stake order of the general commanding the army then let the general give an order that it's not to rain any more i want to know nothing about it the majority of orders even when less peculiar than this one are always received in this way and then carried out there's a reported order as well says the man of letters that beards have got to be trimmed and hair got to be clipped close talk on my lad says barque on whose head the threatened order directly falls you didn't see me you can draw the curtains i'm telling you do it or don't do it doesn't matter a damn to me besides what is real and written there's bigger news but still more dubious and imaginative the division is going to be relieved and sent either to rest real rest for six weeks or to morocco or perhaps to egypt divers explanations they listen and let themselves be tempted by the fascination of the new the wonderful but some one questions the post orderly who told you that the adjutant commanding the territorial detachment that fatigues for the h q of the a c for the what for the headquarters of the army corps and he's not the only one that says it there's you know him i've forgotten his name he's like gala but he isn't gala there's some one in his family who is some one anyway he knows all about it then what with hungry eyes they form a circle around the story-teller egypt you say we shall go too don't know it i know there were pharaohs there at the time when i was a kid and went to school but since to egypt the idea finds unconscious anchorage in their minds ah non says blair for i get seasick still it doesn't last seasickness we oui, but what would my good lady say what about it she'll get used to it you see niggers and streets full of big birds like we see sparrows here but haven't we to go to alsace yes says the post orderly there are some who think so at the pay office that do me well enough but common sense and acquired experience regain the upper hand and put the visions to flight we have been told so often that we were going a long way off so often have we believed it so often been undeceived so as if at a moment arranged we wake up it's all my eye they've done it on us too often wait before believing and don't count a crumb's worth on it we reoccupy our corner here and there a man bears in his hand the light momentous burden of a letter ah says tirloir i must be writing can't go eight days without writing me too says eudore i must write to my petite femme is she all right mariette we oui, we oui, don't fret about mariette a few have already settled themselves for correspondence barque is standing up he stoops over a sheet of paper flattened on a notebook upon a jutting crag in the trench wall apparently in the grip of an inspiration he writes on and on with his eyes in bondage and the concentrated expression of a horseman at full gallop when once lamuse who lacks imagination has sat down placed his little writing block on the padded summit of his knees and moistened his copying ink pencil he passes the time in reading again the last letters received and wondering what he can say that he has not already said and in fostering a grim determination to say something else a sentimental gentleness seems to have overspread little eudore who is curled up in a sort of niche in the ground he is lost in meditation pencil in hand eyes on paper dreaming he looks and stares and sees it is another sky that lends him light another to which his vision reaches he has gone home in this time of letter writing the men reveal the most and the best that they ever were several others surrender to the past and its first expression is to talk once more of fleshly comforts 
through their outer crust of coarseness and concealment other hearts venture upon murmured memories and the rekindling of bygone brightness the summer morning when the green freshness of the garden steals in upon the purity of the country bedroom or when the wind in the wheat of the level land sets it slowly stirring or deeply waving and shakes the square of oats hard by into quick little feminine tremors or the winter evening with women and their gentleness around the shaded lustre of the lamp but papa blair resumes work upon the ring he has begun he has threaded the still formless disk of aluminum over a bit of rounded wood and rubs it with the file as he applies himself to the job two wrinkles of mighty meditation deepen upon his forehead anon he stops straightens himself and looks tenderly at the trifle as though she also were looking at it you know he said to me once speaking of another ring it's not a question of doing it well or not well the point is that i've done it for my wife do you see when i had nothing to do but scratch myself i used to have a look at this photo he showed me a photograph of a big chubby-faced woman and then it was quite easy to set about this damned ring you might say that we've made it together see the proof of that is that it was company for me and that i said adieu to it when i sent it off to mother blair he is making another just now and this one will have copper in it too he works eagerly his heart would fain express itself to the best advantage in this the sort of penmanship upon which he is so tenaciously bent as they stoop reverently in their naked earth holes over the slender rudimentary trinkets so tiny that the great hide-bound hands hold them with difficulty or let them fall these men seem still more wild more primitive and more human than at all other times you are set thinking of the first inventor the father of all craftsmen who sought to invest enduring materials with the shapes of what he saw and the spirit of what he felt people coming along announces b k the mobile who acts as a hall porter to our section of the trench buckets of em immediately an adjutant appears with straps round his belly and his chin and brandishing his sword scabbard out of the way you out of the way i tell you you loafers they're out of it let me see you quit eh we make way indolently those at the sides push back into the earth by slow degrees it is a company of territorials deputed to our sector for the fortification of the second line and the upkeep of its communication trenches they come into view miserable bundles of implements and dragging their feet we watch them one by one as they come up pass and disappear they are stunted and elderly with dusty faces or big and broken winded tightly enfolded in great coats stained and overworn that yawn at the toothless gaps where the buttons are missing tirette and barquet the twin wags leaning close together against the wall stare at them at first in silence then they begin to smile march past of the broom brigade says tirette we'll have a bit of fun for three minutes announces barquet some of the old toilers are comical this one whom the file brings up has bottled shaped shoulders although extremely narrow-chested and spindle-shanked he is big-bellied he is too much for barquet hello sir canteen he says when a more outrageously patched-up greatcoat appears than all the others can show tourette questions the veteran recruit hey father samples hey you there he insists the other turns and looks at him open-mouthed say there papa if you will be so kind as to give me the address of your tailor in london a chuckle comes from the antiquated and wrinkled scrawled face and then the poilu checked for an instant by barque's command is jostled by the following flood and swept away when some less striking figures have gone past a new victim is provided for the jokers on his red and wrinkled neck luxuriates some dirty sheep's wool with knees bent his body forward his back bowed this territorial's carriage is the worst 
tiens bawls tourette with pointed finger the famous concertina man it would cost you something to see him at the fair here he's free gratis the victim stammers responsive insults amid the scattered laughter that arises no more than that laughter is required to excite the two comrades it is the ambition to have their jests voted funny by their easy audience that stimulates them to mock the peculiarities of their old comrades-in-arms of those who toil night and day on the brink of the great war to make ready and make good the fields of battle and even the other watchers join in miserable themselves they scoff at the still more miserable look at that one and that look no but take me a snapshot of that little rump end hey earthworm and that one that has no ending talk about a sky scratcher tiens la he takes the biscuit yes you take it old chap this man goes with little steps and holds his pickaxe up in front like a candle his face is withered and his body borne down by the blows of lumbago like a penny grandpa barque asks him as he passes within reach of a tap on the shoulder the broken-down poilu replies with a great oath of annoyance and provokes the harsh rejoinder of barque come now you might be polite filthy face old muck mill turning right round in fury the old one defies his tormentor hello cries barque laughing he's showing fight the ruin he's warlike look you and he might be mischievous if only he were sixty years younger and if he wasn't alone wantonly adds pepin whose eye is in quest of other targets among the flow of new arrivals the hollow chest of the last straggler appears and then his distorted back disappears the march past of the worn-out and trench-foul veterans comes to an end among the ironical and almost malevolent faces of these sinister troglodytes whom their caverns of mud but half reveal meanwhile the hours slip away and evening begins to veil the sky and darken the things of earth it comes to blend itself at once with the blind fate and the ignorant dark minds of the multitude there enshrouded through the twilight comes the rolling hum of tramping men and another throng rubs its way through africans they march past with faces red brown yellow or chestnut their beards scanty and fine or thick and frizzled their great coats yellowish green and their muddy helmets sporting the crescent in place of our grenade their eyes are like balls of ivory or onyx that shine from faces like new pennies flattened or angular now and again come swaying along above the line the coal-black mask of a senegalese sharpshooter behind the company goes a red flag with a green hand in the centre we watch them in silence these are asked no questions they command respect and even a little fear all the same these africans seem jolly and in high spirits they are going of course to the first line that is their place and their passing is the sign of an imminent attack they are made for the offensive those and the seventy-five gun we can take our hats off to they are everywhere sent ahead at big moments the moroccan division they can't quite fit in with us they go too fast and there's no way of stopping them some of these diabolical images in yellow wood or bronze or ebony are serious of mien uneasy and taciturn their faces have the disquieting and secret look of the snare suddenly discovered the others laugh with a laugh that jangles like fantastic foreign instruments of music a laugh that bears the teeth we talk over the characteristics of these africans their ferocity in attack their devouring passion to be in with the bayonet their predilection for no quarter we recall those tales that they themselves willingly tell all in much the same words and with the same gestures they raise their arms over their heads comrade comrade non pas comrade and in pantomime they drive a bayonet forward at belly height drawing it back then with the help of a foot 
one of the sharpshooters overhears our talk as he passes he looks upon us laughs abundantly in his helmeted turban and repeats our words with significant shakes of his head pa comrade non pa comrade never cut head off no doubt they're a different race from us with their tent-cloth skin barque confesses though he does not know himself what cold feet are it worries them to rest you know they only live for the minute when the officer puts his watch back in his pocket and says off you go in fact they're real soldiers we are not soldiers says big lamuse we are men though the evening has grown darker now that plain true saying sheds something like a glimmering light on the men who are waiting here waiting since the morning waiting since months ago they are men good fellows of all kinds rudely torn away from the joy of life like any other men whom you take in the mass they are ignorant and of narrow outlook full of a sound common sense which sometimes gets off the rails disposed to be led and to do as they are bid enduring under hardships long suffering they are simple men further simplified in whom the merely primitive instincts have been accentuated by the force of circumstances the instinct of self-preservation the hard-gripped hope of living through the joy of food of drink and of sleep and at intervals they are cries and dark shudders of humanity that issue from the silence and the shadows of their great human hearts when we can no longer see clearly we hear down there the murmur of a command which comes nearer and rings loud second half section muster we fall in it is the call gee up says the corporal we are set in motion in front of the tool depot there is a halt and trampling to each is given a spade or pickaxe an n c o presents the handles in the gloom you a spade there hop it you a spade too you a pick allons hurry up and get off we leave by the communication trench at right angles to our own and straight ahead towards the changeful frontier now alive and terrible up in the sombre sky the strong staccato panting of an invisible aeroplane circles in wide descending coils and fills infinity in front to right and left everywhere thunderclaps roll with great glimpses of short-lived light in the dark blue sky end of chapter two part two section four of under fire the story of a squad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Under Fire, The Story of a Squad by Henri Barbousse. Translated by William Fitzwater Ray. Chapter 3. The Return. Reluctantly, the ashen dawn is bleaching the still dark and formless landscape between the declining road on the right that falls into the gloom and the black cloud of the alleur wood where we hear the convoy teams assembling and getting under way a field extends we have reached it we of the sixth battalion at the end of the night we have piled arms and now in the centre of this circle of uncertain light our feet in the mist and mud we stand in dark clusters that yet are hardly blue or as solitary phantoms and the heads of all are turned towards the road that comes from down there we are waiting for the rest of the regiment the fifth battalion who were in the first line and left the trenches after us noises there they are a long and shapeless mass appears in the west and comes down out of the night upon the dawning road at last it is ended the accursed shift that began at six o'clock yesterday evening and has lasted all night and now the last man has stepped from the last communication trench this time it has been an awful sojourn in the trenches the eighteenth company was foremost and has been cut up eighteen killed and fifty wounded one in three less in four days and this without attack 
by bombardment alone this is known to us and as the mutilated battalion approaches down there and we join them in trampling the muddy field and exchanging nods of recognition we cry what about the eighteenth we are thinking as we put the question if it goes on like this what is to become of all of us what will become of me the seventeenth the nineteenth and the twentieth arrive in turn and pile arms there's the eighteenth it arrives after all the others having held the first trench it has been last relieved the light is a little cleaner and the world is paling we can make out as he comes down the road the company's captain ahead of his men and alone he helps himself along with a stick and walks with difficulty by reason of his old wound of the Marne battle that rheumatism is troubling and there are other pangs too he lowers his hooded head and might be attending a funeral we can see that in his mind he is indeed following the dead and his thoughts are with them here is the company debouching in dire disorder and our hearts are heavy it is obviously shorter than the other three in the march past of the battalion i reach the road and confront the descending mass of the eighteenth the uniforms of these survivors are all earth yellowed alike so that they appear to be clad in khaki the cloth is stiff with the ochreous mud that has dried underneath the skirts of their greatcoats are like lumps of wood jumping about on the yellow crust that reaches to their knees their faces are drawn and blackened dust and dirt have wrinkled them anew their eyes are big and fevered and from these soldiers whom the depths of horror have given back there rises a deafening din they talk all at once and loudly they gesticulate they laugh and sing you would think to see them that it was a holiday crowd pouring over the road these are the second section and its big sub-lieutenant whose great coat is tightened and strapped around his body as stiff as a rolled umbrella i elbow my way along the marching crowd as far as the marshal's squad the most sorely tried of all out of eleven comrades that they were and have been without a break for a year and a half there were three men only with the corporal marshal he sees me with a glad exclamation and a broad smile he lets go his rifle sling and offers me his hands from one of which hangs his trench stick eh vieux frere still going strong what's become of you lately i turn my head away and say almost under my breath so old chap it's happened badly his smile dies at once and he is serious eh oui old man it can't be helped it was awful this time barbier is killed they told us barbier saturday night it was at eleven o'clock he had the top of his back taken away by a shell says marshal cut off like a razor Bessé got a bit of shell that went clean through his belly and stomach Bartlemy and bobet got it in the head and neck we passed the night skedaddling up and down the trench at full speed to dodge the showers and little godefroy did you know him middle of his body blown away he was emptied of blood on the spot in an instant like a bucket kicked over little as it was it was remarkable how much blood he had it made a stream at least fifty meters long Gunyard got his legs cut up by one explosion they picked him up not quite dead that was at the listening post i was there on duty with them but when that shell fell i had gone into the trench to ask the time i found my rifle that i'd left in my place bent double as if someone had folded it in his hands the barrel like a corkscrew and half of the stock in sawdust the smell of fresh blood was enough to bring your heart up and mondin him too mondin that was the day after yesterday in fact in a dugout that a shell smashed in he was lying down and his chest was crushed have they told you about franco who was alongside mondin the fall of earth broke his spine he spoke again after they got him out and set him down he said with his head falling to one side i'm dying and he was gone Vigil was with him too 
His body wasn't touched, but they found him with his head completely flattened out, flat as a pancake, and huge, as big as that. To see it spread out on the ground, black and distorted, it made you think of his shadow, the shadow one gets on the ground sometimes when one walks with a lantern at night. Vigile, only class 1913, a child, and Mondain and Franco, such good sorts in spite of their stripes. We're so many old special pals the less, mon vieux Marshal. Yes, says Marshal, but he is swallowed up in a crowd of his friends who worry and catechise him. He bandies jests with them and answers their raillery, and all bustle each other and laugh. I look from face to face. They are merry, and in spite of the contractions of weariness and the earth stains, they look triumphant. What does it mean? If wine had been possible during their stay in the first line, I should have said, all these men are drunk. I single out one of the survivors who hums as he goes and steps in time with it flippantly, as hussars of the stage do. It is Vanderborn, the drummer. Hello, Vanderborn. You look pleased with yourself. Vanderborn, who is sedate in the ordinary, cries, It's not me yet, you see. Here I am. With a mad gesticulation, he serves me a thump on the shoulder. I understand. If these men are happy in spite of all, as they come out of hell, it is because they are coming out of it. They are returning. They are spared. Once again, the death that was there has passed them over. Each company in its turn goes to the front once in six weeks. Six weeks. In both great and minor matters, fighting soldiers manifest the philosophy of the child. They never look afar, either ahead or around. Their thought strays hardly farther than from day to day. Today, even one of those men is confident that he will live yet a little while. And that is why, in spite of the weariness that weighs them down and the new slaughter with which they are still bespattered, though each has seen his brothers torn away from his side, in spite of all and in spite of themselves, they are celebrating the feast of the survivors. The boundless glory in which they rejoice is this. They still stand straight. End of chapter 3section five of under fire the story of a squad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by lynn thompson under fire the story of a squad by henri barbus translated by william fitzwater ray chapter four as we reached quarters again, someone cried, But where's Volpat? And Fouillard, where's he? They had been requisitioned and taken off to the front line by the 5th Battalion. No doubt we should find them somewhere in quarters. No success. Two men of the squad lost. That's what comes of lending men, said the sergeant with a great oath. The captain, when apprised of the loss, also cursed and swore and said, I must have those men. Let them be found at once. Allez! Farfadet and I are summoned by Corporal Bertrand from the barn, where, at full length, we have already immobilized ourselves and are growing torpid. You must go and look for Volpat and Fouillard. Quickly we got up and set off with a shiver of uneasiness. Our two comrades have been taken by the fifth and carried off to that infernal shift. Who knows where they are, and what they may be by now? We climb up the hill again. Again we begin, but in the opposite direction, the journey done since the dawn and the night. Though we are without our heavy stuff, and only carry rifles and accoutrements, we feel idle, sleepy, and stiff, and the country is sad, and the sky all wisped with mist. Farfaday is soon panting, he talked a little at first, till fatigue enforced silence on him. He is brave enough, but frail, and during all his pre-war life, shut up in the town hall office where he scribbled, since the days of his first sacrament, between a stove and some aging cardboard files, he
he hardly learned the use of his legs just as we emerged from the woods slipping and floundering to penetrate the region of communication trenches two faint shadows are outlined in front two soldiers are coming up we can see the protuberance of their burdens and the sharp lines of their rifles the swaying double shape becomes distinct it's them one of the shadows has a great white head all swathed one of them's wounded it's volpat we ran up to the spectres our feet making the sounds of sinking in sponge and of sticky withdrawal and our shaken cartridges rattle in their pouches they stand still and wait for us then we are close up it's about time cries volpat you're wounded old chap what he says the manifold bandages all around his head make him deaf and we must shout to get through them so we go close and shout then he replies that's nothing we're coming from the hole where the fifth battalion put us on thursday you've stayed there ever since yells farfaday whose shrill and almost feminine voice goes easily through the quilting that protects volpat's ears of course we stayed there you blithering idiot says fouillard you don't suppose we've got wings to fly away with and still less that we should have legged it without orders both of them let themselves drop to a sitting position on the ground volpat's head enveloped in rags with a big knot on the top and the same dark yellowish stains as his face looked like a bundle of dirty linen they forgot you then poor devils rather cries fouillard i should say they did four days and four nights in a shell hole with bullets raining down a hole that stunk like a cesspool that's right says volpat it wasn't an ordinary listening post hole where one comes and goes regularly it was just a shell hole like any other old shell hole neither more nor less they said to us on thursday station yourselves in there and keep on firing they said next day a liaison chap of the fifth battalion came and showed his neb what the hell are you doing there why we're firing they told us to fire so we're firing i says if they told us to do it there must be some reason at the back of it we're wanting for them to tell us to do something else the chap made tracks he looked a bit uneasy and suffering from the effects of being bombed it's twenty-two he says to us two says fouillard there was a loaf of bread and a bucket of wine that the eighteenth gave us when they planted us there and a whole case of cartridges my boy we fired off the cartridges and drank the booze but we had some sense to keep a few cartridges and a hunch of bread though we didn't keep any wine that's where we went wrong says volpat seeing that it was a thirsty job say boys you haven't got any gargle i've still nearly half a pint of wine replies farfaday give it to him says fouillard pointing to volpat seeing that he's been losing blood i'm only thirsty volpat was shivering and his little strapped-up eyes burned with fever in the enormous dump of rags set upon his shoulders that's good he says drinking ah and then too he added emptying as politeness requires the drop of wine that remained at the bottom of farfaday's cup we got two bosh they were crawling about outside and fell into our holes as blindly as moles into a spring snare those chaps did we tied em up and see us then after firing for thirty-six hours with no more ammunition so we filled our magazines with the last and waited in front of the parcels of bosh the liaison chap forgot to tell his people that we were there you the sixth forgot to ask for us the eighteenth forgot us too and as we weren't in a listening post where you're relieved as regular as if at h q i could almost see us staying there till the regiment came back in the long run it was the loafers of the two hundred and fourth come to skulk about looking for fuses that mentioned us so then we got the order to fall back immediately they said that immediately was a good joke and we got into harness at once we untied the legs of the bosch led them off and handed them over to the two hundred and fourth and here we are we even fished out in passing a sergeant who was piled up in a hole and didn't dare come out seeing he was shell-shocked we slanged him and that set him up a bit and he thanked us 
Sergeant Sestote, he called himself. But your wound, old chap. It's my ears. Two shells, a little one and a big one, my lad. Went off while you're saying it. My head came between the two bursts, as you might say, but only just. A very close shave, and my lugs got it. You should have seen him, says Fouillard. It was disgusting, those two ears hanging down. We had two packets of bandages, and the stretcher men fired us one in. That makes three packets he's got rolled round his nut. Give us your traps, we're going back. Farfaday and I divide Volpat's equipment between us. Fouillard, sullen with thirst and racked by stiff joints, growls and insists obstinately on keeping his weapons and bundles. We stroll back, finding diversion, as always, in walking without ranks. It is so uncommon that one finds it surprising and profitable. So it is a breach of liberty which soon enlivens all four of us. We are in the country as though for the pleasure of it. We are pedestrians, says Volpat proudly. When we reach the turning of the top of the hill, he relapses upon rosy visions. Old man, it's a good wound, after all. I shall be sent back, no mistake about it. His eyes wink and sparkle in the huge white clump that dithers on his shoulders, a clump reddish on each side, where the ears were. From the depth where the village lies, we hear ten o'clock strike. To hell with the time, says Volpat. It doesn't matter to me any more what time it is. He becomes loquacious. It is a low fever that inspires his dissertation, and condenses it to the slow swing of our walk, in which his step is already jaunty. They'll stick a red label on my greatcoat, you'll see, and take me to the rear. I shall be bossed this time by a very polite sort of chap, who'll say to me, That's one side, now turn the other way. So, my poor fellow. Then the ambulance, and then the sick train, with the pretty little ways of the Red Cross ladies all the way along, like they did to Quapelet Jules. Then the base hospital, beds with white sheets, a stove that snores in the middle of us all, people with a special job of looking after you, and that you watch doing it, regulation slippers, sloppy and comfortable, and a chamber cupboard, furniture. And it's in those big hospitals that you're all right for grub. I shall have good feeds and baths. I shall take all I can get hold of. And there'll be presents that you can enjoy without having to fight the others for them and get yourself into a bloody mess. I shall have my two hands on the counterpane. And they'll do damn well nothing, like things to look at. Like toys, what? And under the sheets my legs'll be white hot all the way through and my trotters'll be expanding like bunches of violets. Volpat pauses, fumbles about, and pulls out of his pocket, along with his famous pair of soissons scissors, something that he shows to me. Tiens, have you seen this? It is a photograph of his wife and two children. He has already shown it to me many a time. I look at it and express appreciation. I shall go on sick leave, says Volpat, and while my ears are sticking themselves on again, the wife and the little ones will look at me, and I shall look at them. And while they're growing again like lettuces, my friends, the war, it'll make progress. The Russians, one doesn't know what. He is thinking aloud, lulling himself with happy anticipations, already alone with his private festival in the midst of us. Robber, Fouillard shouts at him, You've too much luck, by God. How could we not envy him? He would be going away for one, two, or three months, and all that time, instead of our wretched privations, he would be transformed into a man of means. At the beginning, says Farfaday, it sounded comic when I heard him wish for a good wound. But all the same, and whatever can be said about it, I understand now that it's the only thing a poor soldier can hope for if he isn't daft we were drawing near to the village and passing round the wood at its corner the sudden shape of a woman arose against the sportive sunbeams that outlined her with light alertly erect she stood before the faintly violet background of the wood's marge and the cross-hatched trees she was slender her head all afire with fair hair and in her pale face we could see the night-dark caverns of great eyes 
the resplendent being gazed fixedly upon us trembling then plunged abruptly into the undergrowth and disappeared like a torch the apparition and its flight so impressed volpat that he lost the thread of his discourse she's something like that woman there no said fouillard who had misunderstood she's called eudoxie i knew her because i've seen her before a refugee i don't know where she comes from but she's at gomblin in a family there she's thin and beautiful volpat certified one would like to make her a little present she's good enough to eat tender as a chicken and look at the eyes she's got she's queer says fouillard you don't know when you've got her you see her here there with her fair hair on top then off nobody about and you know she doesn't know what danger is marching about sometimes almost in the front line and she's been seen knocking about in no man's land she's queer look there she is again the spook she's keeping an eye on us what's she after the shadow figure traced in lines of light this time adorned the other end of the spinney's edge to hell with women volpat declared whom the idea of his deliverance had completely recaptured there's one in the squad anyway that wants her pretty badly see when you speak of the wolf you see its tail not yet but almost look from some bushes on our right we saw the red snout of la Mouse appear peeping like a wild boar's he was on the woman's trail he had seen the alluring vision dropped to the crouch of a setting dog and made his spring but in that spring he fell upon us recognizing volpat and fouillard big la Mouse gave shouts of delight at once he had no other thought than to get possession of the bags rifles and haversacks give me all of it i'm resting come on give it up he must carry everything farfaday and i willingly gave up volpat's equipment and fouillard now at the end of his strength agreed to surrender his pouches and his rifle lamuse became a moving heap under the huge burden he disappeared bent double and made progress only with shortened steps but we felt that he was still under the sway of a certain project and his glances went sideways he was seeking the woman after whom he had hurled himself every time he halted the better to trim some detail of the load or puffingly to mop the greasy flow of perspiration he furtively surveyed all the corners of the horizon and scrutinized the edges of the wood he did not see her again i did see her again and got a distinct impression this time that it was one of us she was after she half arose on our left from the green shadows of the undergrowth steadying herself with one hand on a branch she leaned forward and revealed the night-dark eyes and pale face which showed so brightly lighted was one whole side of it like a crescent moon i saw that she was smiling and following the course of the look that smiled i saw farfaday a little way behind us and he was smiling too then she slipped away into the dark foliage carrying the twin smile with her thus was the understanding revealed to me between this lissom and dainty gypsy who was like no one at all and farfaday conspicuous among us all slender pliant and sensitive as lilac evidently lamuse saw nothing blinded and borne down as he was by the load he had taken from farfaday and me occupied in the poise of them and in finding where his laden and leaden feet might tread but he looks unhappy he groans a weighty and mournful obsession is stifling him in his harsh breathing it seems to me that i can hear his heart beating and muttering looking at volpat hooded in bandages and then at the strong man muscular and full-blooded with that profound and eternal yearning whose sharpness he alone can gauge i say to myself that the worst wounded man is not he whom we think we go down at last to the village let's have a drink says fouillard i'm going to be sent back says volpat lamuse puffs and groans our comrades shout and come running and we gather in the little square where the church stands with its twin towers so thoroughly mutilated by a shell that one can no longer look it in the face 
End of chapter 4《Section Six of Under Fire》The Story of a Squad。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Under Fire》The Story of a Squad by Henri Barbus, translated by William Fitzwater Ray. Chapter Five, Sanctuary. The dim road which rises through the middle of the night-bound wood is so strangely full of obstructing shadows that the deep darkness of the forest itself might by some magic have overflowed upon it. It is a regiment on the march in the quest of a new home. The weighty ranks of the shadows, burdened both high and broad, hustle each other blindly. Each wave, pushed by the following, stumbles upon the one in front while alongside and detached are the evolutions of those less bulky ghosts, the NCOs. A clamor of confusion, compound of exclamations, of scraps of chat, of words of command, of spasms of coughing and of song, goes up from the dense mob enclosed between the banks. To the vocal commotion is added the tramping of feet, the jingling of bayonets in their scabbards of cans and drinking cups, the rumbling and hammering of the sixty vehicles of the two convoys, fighting and regimental that follow the two battalions and such a thing is it that trudges and spreads itself over the climbing road that in spite of the unbounded dome of night one welters in the odour of a den of lions in the ranks one sees nothing sometimes when one can lift his nose up by grace of an eddy in the tide one cannot help seeing the whiteness of a mess tin the blue steel of a helmet the black steel of a rifle Anon, by the dazzling jet of sparks that flies from a pocket flint and steel, or the red flame that expands upon the Lilliputian stem of a match, one can see beyond the vivid near relief of hands and faces to the silhouetted and disordered groups of helmeted shoulders, swaying like surges that would storm the sable stronghold of the night. Then all goes out, and while each tramping soldier's legs swing to and fro, his eye is fixed inflexibly upon the conjectural situation of the bag that dwells in front of him. After several halts, when we have allowed ourselves to collapse on haversacks at the foot of the stacked rifles, stacks that form on the call of the whistle with feverish haste and exasperating delay, through our blindness in that atmosphere of ink dawn reveals itself, extends, and acquires the domain of space. The walls of the shadow crumble in vague ruin. Once more we pass under the grand panorama of the day's unfolding upon the ever-wandering horde that we are. We emerge at last from this night of marching, across concentric circles as it seems, of darkness less dark, then of half-shadow, then of gloomy light. Legs have a wooden stiffness, backs are benumbed, shoulders bruised. Faces are still so grey or so black, one would say they had but half rid themselves of the night. Now, indeed, one never throws it off altogether. It is into new quarters that the great company is going, this time to rest. What will the place be like that we have to live in for eight days? It is called, they say, but nobody is certain of anything, Gaucher l'Abbé. We have heard wonders about it. It appears to be just it. In the ranks of the companies whose forms and features one begins to make out in the birth of the morning, and to distinguish the lowered heads and yawning mouths, some voices are heard in still higher praise. There never were such quarters. The brigade's there, and the court-martial. You can get anything in the shops. If the brigade's there, we're all right. Think we can find a table for the squad? Everything you want, I tell you. A pessimist prophet shakes his head. What these quarters'll be like where we've never been, I don't know, he says. What I do know is that it'll be like the others. But we don't believe him, and emerging from the fevered turmoil of the night, it seems to all that it is a sort of promised land we are approaching by degrees as the light brings us out of the east and the icy air towards the unknown village. At the foot of a hill in the half-light, we reach some houses, still slumbering and wrapped in heavy grayness. There it is! Poof! We've done twenty-eight kilometers in the night. But what of that? there is no halt. We go past the houses, and they sink back again into their vague vapors and their mysterious shroud. Seems we've got to march a long time yet. It's always there, there, there. 
we march like machines our limbs invaded by a sort of petrified torpor our joints cry aloud and force us to make echo day comes slowly for a blanket of mist covers the earth it is so cold that the men dare not sit down during the halts though overborne by weariness and they pace to and fro in the damp obscurity like ghosts the besom of a biting wintry wind whips our skin sweeps away and scatters our words and our sighs at last the sun pierces the reek that spreads over us and soaks what it touches and something like a fairy glade opens out in the midst of this gloom terrestrial the regiment stretches itself and wakes up in truth with slow-lifted faces to the gilded silver of the earliest rays quickly then the sun grows fiery and now it is too hot in the ranks we pant and sweat and our grumbling is louder even than just now when our teeth were chattering and the fog wet sponged our hands and faces it is a chalk country through which we are passing on this torrid forenoon they mend this road with lime the dirty devils the road has become blinding a long-drawn cloud of desiccated chalk and dust that rises high above our columns and powders us as we go faces turn red and shine as though varnished some of the full-blooded ones might be plastered with vaseline cheeks and foreheads are coated with a rusty paste which agglutinates and cracks feet lose their dubious likeness to feet and might have paddled in a mason's mortar trough haversacks and rifles are powdered in white and our legion leaves to left and right a long milky track on the bordering grass and to crown all to the right a convoy we bear to the right hurriedly and not without bumpings the convoy of lorries a long chain of four square and huge projectiles rolling up with a diabolical din hurls itself along the road curse it one after another they gather up the thick carpet of white powder that upholsters the ground and send it broadcast over our shoulders now we are garbed in a stuff of light grey and our faces are pallid masks thickest on the eyebrows and moustaches on beards and the cracks of wrinkles though still ourselves we look like strange old men when we're old buffers we shall be as ugly as this says tirette tu craches blanc declares biquet note one pity to spoil this jest by translation but biquet's primary meaning was you're cross because you've a throat like a lime kiln his secondary or literal meaning is obvious when a halt puts us out of action you might take us for rows of plaster statues with some dirty indications of humanity showing through we move again silent and chagrined every step becomes hard to complete our faces assume congealed and fixed grimaces under the wan leprosy of dust the unending effort contracts us and quite fills us with dismal weariness and disgust we spy at last the long sought oasis beyond a hill on a still higher one some slated roofs peep from clusters of foliage as brightly green as a salad the village is there and our looks embrace it but we are not there yet for a long time it seems to recede as fast as the regiment crawls toward it at long last on the stroke of noon we reach the quarters that had begun to appear a pretense and a legend in regular step and with rifles on shoulders the regiment floods the street of gauchin l'abbé right to its edges most of the villages of the pas du calais are composed of a single street but such a street it is often several kilometres long in this one the street divides in front of the mairie and forms two others so that the hamlet becomes a big y brokenly bordered by low-built dwellings the cyclists the officers the orderlies break away from the long moving mass then as they come up a few of the men at a time are swallowed up by the barns the still available houses being reserved for officers and departments our half company is led at first to the end of the village and then by some misunderstanding among the quartermasters back to the other end the one by which we entered this oscillation takes up time and the squad dragged thus from north to south and from south to north heavily fatigued and irritated by wasted walking evinces feverish impatience for it is supremely important to be installed and set free as early as possible if we are to carry out the plan we have cherished so long to find a native with some little place to let 
and a table where the squad can have its meals. We have talked a good deal about this idea and its delightful advantages. We have taken counsel, subscribed to a common fund, and decided that this time we will take the header into the additional outlay. But will it be possible? Very many places are already snapped up. We are not the only ones to bring our dream of comfort here, and it will be a race for that table. Three companies are coming in after hours, but four were here before us, and there are the officers, the cooks of the hospital staff for the section, and the clerks, the drivers, the orderlies and others, official cooks of the sergeant's mess, and I don't know how many more. All these men are more influential than the soldiers of the line. They have more mobility and more money, and can bring off their schemes beforehand. Already, while we march four abreast towards the barn assigned to the squad, we see some of these jokers across the conquered thresholds, domestically busy. Tirette imitates the sounds of lowing and bleeding. There's our cattle shed, a fairly big barn. The chopped straw smells of night soil, and our feet stir up clouds of dust. But it is almost enclosed. We choose our places and cast off our equipment. Those who dreamed yet once again of a special sort of paradise sing low, yet once again. Look now, it seems as ugly as the other places. It's something like the same, naturally. But there is no time to waste in talking. The thing is to get clear and be after the others with all strength and speed. We hurry out. In spite of broken backs and aching feet, we set ourselves savagely to this last effort on which the comfort of a week depends. The squad divides into two patrols and sets off at the double, one to left and one to right along the street, which is already obstructed by busy questing poilus, and all the groups see and watch each other and hurry. In places there are collisions, jostlings, and abuse. Let's begin down there at once or our goose will be cooked. I have an impression of a kind of fierce battle between all the soldiers in the streets of the village they have just occupied. For us, says Marthereau, war is always struggling and fighting, always, always. We knock at door after door, we show ourselves timidly, we offer ourselves like undesirable goods. A voice arises among us, you haven't a bit of a corner, madame, for some soldiers? We would pay. No, you see, I've got officers, under-officers, that is, you see. It's the mess for the band, and the secretaries, and the gentlemen of the ambulance. Vexation after vexation. We close again, one after the other, all the doors we have half opened, and look at each other, on the wrong side of the threshold, with dwindling hope in our eyes. Bon Dieu! We'll see that we shan't find anything, growls Buck. Damn those chaps that got on the midden before us. The human flood reaches high water mark everywhere. The three streets are all growing dark as each overflows into another. Some natives cross our path, old men or ill-shapen, contorted in their walk, stunted in the face. And even young people, too, over whom hovers the mystery of secret disorders or political connections. As for the petticoats, there are old women and many young ones, fat, with well-padded cheeks, and equal to geese in their whiteness. Suddenly, in an alley between two houses, I have a fleeting vision of a woman who crossed the shadowy gap. Eudoxie! Eudoxie! The fairy woman from La Muse hunted like a satyr, away back in the country, that morning we brought back Volpat wounded, and Fouillade the woman I saw leaning from the spinney's edge and bound to Farfadet in a mutual smile. It is she whom I just glimpsed like a gleam of sunshine in that alley. But the gleam was eclipsed by the tail of a wall, and the place thereof relapsed upon gloom. She is here already. Then she has followed our long and painful trek. She is attracted? And she looks like one allured, too brief glimpse though it was of her face and its crown of fair hair plainly i saw that she was serious thoughtful absent-minded lamuse following close on my heels saw nothing and i do not tell him he will discover quite soon enough the bright presence of the lovely flame where he could fain cast himself bodily though it evades him like a will-o'-the-wisp for the moment besides we are on business bent 
the coveted corner must be won we resume the hunt with the energy of despair bach leads us on he has taken the matter to heart he is trembling you can see it in his dusty scalp he guides us nose to the wind he suggests that we make an attempt on that yellow door over there forward near the yellow door we encounter a shape down bent blair his foot on a milestone is reducing the bulk of his boot with his knife and plaster-like debris is falling fast he might be engaged in sculpture you never had your feet so white before jeers bach rotting apart says blair you don't know where it is that special van he goes on to explain i've got to look up the dentist van so they can grapple with my ivories and strip off the old grinders that's left we oui. seems it's stationed here the chop caravan he folds up his knife pockets it and goes off alongside the wall possessed by the thought of his jaw-bones new lease of life once more we put our beggar's petition good day madame you haven't got a little corner where we could feed we would pay of course we would pay through the glass of a low window we see lifted the face of an old man like a fish in a bowl it looks a face curiously flat and lined with parallel wrinkles like a page of old manuscript you've the little shed there there's no room in the shed and when the washing's done there bach seizes the chance it'll do very likely may we see it we do the washing there mutters the woman continuing to wield her broom you know says buck with a smile and an engaging air we're not like those disagreeable people who get drunk and make themselves a nuisance may we have a look the woman has let her broom rest she is thin and inconspicuous her jacket hangs from her shoulders as from a valise her face is like cardboard stiff and without expression she looks at us and hesitates then grudgingly leads the way into a very dark little place made of beaten earth and piled with dirty linen it's splendid cries lamuse in all honesty isn't she a darling the little kitty says bach as he pats the round cheek like a painted india rubber of a little girl who is staring at us with her dirty little nose uplifted in the gloom is she yours madame and that one too risks marthereau as he espies an overripe infant on whose bladder-like cheeks are shining deposits of jam for the ensnaring of the dust in the air he offers a half-hearted caress in the direction of the moist and bedaubed countenance the woman does not deign an answer so there we are trifling and grinning like beggars whose pleas still hangs fire lamuse whispers to me in a torment of fear and cupidity let's hope she'll catch on the filthy old slut it's grand here and you know everything else is pinched there's no table the woman says at last don't worry about the table bach exclaims tenez there put away in that corner the old door that would make us a table you're not going to trail me about and upset all my work replies the cardboard woman suspiciously and with obvious regret that she had not chased us away immediately don't worry i tell you look i'll show you hey lamuse old cock give me a hand under the displeased glances of the virago we place the old door on a couple of barrels with a bit of a rub down says i that will be perfect hey we oui, mamma a flick with a brush'll do us instead of a tablecloth the woman hardly knows what to say she watches us spitefully there's only two stools and how many are there of you about a dozen a dozen jesus maria what does it matter that'll be all right seeing there's a plank here and that's a bench ready made eh lamuse course says lamuse i want that plank says the woman some soldiers that were here before you have tried already to take it away but us we're not thieves suggests lamuse gently so as not to irritate the creature that has our comfort at her disposal i don't say you are but soldiers vous savez they smash everything up oh the misery of this war well then how much it'll be to hire the table and to heat up a thing or two on the stove it'll be twenty sous a day announces the hostess with restraint as though we were wringing that amount from her it's dear says lamuse 
it's what the others gave me that were here and they were very kind too those gentlemen and it was worth my while to cook for them i know it's not difficult for soldiers if you think it's too much it's no job to find other customers for this room and this table and the stove and who wouldn't be in twelves they're coming along all the time and they'd pay still more if i wanted a dozen lamuse hastens to add i said it's dear but still it'll do eh you others on this downright question we record our votes we could do well with a drop to drink says lamuse do you sell wine no said the woman but added shaking with anger you see the military authority forces them that's got wine to sell it at fifteen sous fifteen sous the misery of this cursed war one loses at it at fifteen sous monsieur so i don't sell any wine i've got plenty for ourselves i don't say but sometimes and just to oblige i don't allow some to people that one knows people that knows what things are but of course monsieur not at fifteen sous lamuse is one of those people that knows what things are he grabs at his water bottle which is hanging as usual on his hip give me a liter of it that'll be what that'll be twenty-two sous same as it cost me but you know it's just to oblige you because you're soldiers buck losing patience mutters an aside the woman throws him a surly glance and makes as if to hand lamuse's bottle back to him but lamuse launched upon the hope of drinking wine at last so that his cheeks redden as if the draught already pervaded them with its grateful hue hastens to intervene don't be afraid it's between ourselves la mer we won't give you away she raves on rigid and bitter against the limited price on wine and overcome by his lusty thirst lamuse extends a humiliation and surrender of conscience so far as to say no help for it madame it's a military order so it's no use trying to understand it she leads us into the storeroom three fat barrels occupy it in impressive rotundity is this your little private store she knows her way about the old lady growls bark the shrew turns on her heel truculent would you have me ruin myself by this miserable war i've about enough of losing money all ways at once how insists buck i can see you're not going to risk your money that's right we only risk our skins we intervene disturbed by the tone of menace for our present concern that the conversation has assumed but the door of the wine cellar is shaken and a man's voice comes through hey palmyra it calls the woman hobbles away discreetly leaving the door open that's all right we've taken root lamuse says what dirty devils these people are murks buck who finds his reception hard to stomach it's shameful and sickening says Marthereau. one would think it was the first time you'd had any of it and you old gabbler chides buck that says prettily to the wine robber can't be helped it's a military order gad old man you're not short of cheek what else could i do or say we should have had to go into mourning for our table and our wine she could make us pay forty sous for the wine and we should have had it all the same shouldn't we very well then got to think ourselves jolly lucky i'll admit i'd no confidence and i was afraid it was no go i know it's the same tale everywhere and always but all the same damn the thieving natives ah we oui. some of em must be making fortunes everybody can't go and get killed ah the gallant people of the east yes and the gallant people of the north who welcome us with open arms with open hands yes i tell you marthereau says again it's a shame and it's sickening shut it up there's a she-beast coming back we took a turn round to quarters to announce our success and then went shopping when we returned to our new dining-room we were hustled by the preparations for lunch buck had been to the rations distributions and had managed thanks to personal relations with the cook who was a conscientious objector to fractional divisions to secure the potatoes and meat that formed the rations for all the fifteen men of the squad he had bought some lard a little lump for fourteen sous and some one was frying he had already acquired some green peas in tins four tins 
Mesnil André's tin of veal and jelly would be hors d'oeuvre. And not a dirty thing in all the lot, said Lamuse, enchanted. We inspected the kitchen. Barque was moving cheerfully about the iron Dutch oven whose hot and steaming bulk furnished all one side of the room. I've added a stew pan on the quiet for the soup, he whispered to me, lifting the lid off the stove. Fire isn't too hot. It's half an hour since I chucked the meat in, and the water's clean yet. A minute later we heard someone arguing with the hostess. This extra stove was the matter in dispute. There was no more room left for her on the stove. They had told her they would only need a casserole, and she had believed them. If she had known they were going to make trouble, she would not have let the room to them. Bach, the good fellow, replied jokingly, and succeeded in soothing the monster. One by one the others arrived. They winked and rubbed their hands together, full of toothsome anticipation, like the guests at a wedding breakfast. As they break away from the dazzling light outside and penetrate this cube of darkness, they are blinded and stand like bewildered owls for several minutes. "'It's not too brilliant in here,' says Mesnil Joseph. "'Come on, old chap, what do you want?' The others exclaim in chorus, "'We're damned well off here,' and I can see the heads nodding assent in the cavern's twilight. An incident. Farfadet, having by accident rubbed against the damp and dirty wall, his shoulder has brought away from it a smudge so big and black that it can be seen even here. Farfadet, so careful of his appearance, growls, and in avoiding a second contact with the wall, knocks the table so that his spoon drops to the ground. Stooping, he fumbles among the loose earth, where dust and spider's webs for years have silently fallen. When he recovers his spoon, it is almost black, and webby threads hang from it. Evidently, it is disastrous to let anything fall on the ground. One must live here with great care. Lamuse brings down his fat hand like a pork pie between two of the places at a table. Allons, à table. We fall too. The meal is abundant and of excellent quality. The sound of conversation mingles with those of emptying bottles and filling jaws. While we taste the joy of eating at a table, a glimmer of light trickles through a vent hole and wraps in dusty dawn a piece of the atmosphere and a patch of the table, while it reflects lights up a plate, a cap's peak, an eye. Secretly, I take stock of this gloomy little celebration that overflows with gaiety. Biquet is telling about his suppliant sorrows in quest of a washerwoman who would agree to do him the good turn of washing some linen. But it was too damn dear. Tulac describes the queue outside the grocer's. One might not go in. Customers were herded outside like sheep. And although you were outside, if you weren't satisfied and groused too much, they chased you off. Any news yet? It is said that severe penalties have been imposed on those who plunder the population, and there is already a list of convictions. Volpat has been sent down. Men of class 93 are going to be sent to the rear, and Pepper is one of them. When Bach brings in the harvest of the fry pan, he announces that our hostess has soldiers at her table, ambulance men of the machine guns. They thought they were the best off, but it is us that's that, says Fouillade with decision, lolling grandly in the darkness of the narrow and tainted hole, where we are just as confusedly heaped together as in a dugout. But who would think of making the comparison? Vous savez pas, says Pépin, the chaps of the ninth, they're in clover. An old woman has taken them in for nothing because of her old man that's been dead fifty years and was a rifleman once on a time. Seems she's even given them a rabbit for Nix, and they're just worrying it's jugged. There's good sorts everywhere, but the boys of the ninth had famous luck to fall into the only shop of good sorts in the whole village. Palmyra comes with the coffee which she supplies. She thaws a little, listens to us, and even asks questions in her supercilious way. Why do you call the adjutant le juteux? Bach replies sententiously, "'Twas ever thus. When she has disappeared, we criticize our coffee. Talk about clear. You can see the sugar ambling round the bottom of the glass. She charges six sous for it. It's filtered water. The door half opens and admits a streak of light. The face of a little boy is defined in it. We entice him in like a kitten and give him a bit of chocolate. Then... My name's Charlie, 
chirps the child our house that's close by we've got soldiers too we always had them we had we sell them everything they want only voila sometimes they get drunk tell me little one come here a bit says cocon taking the boy between his knees listen now your papa he says doesn't he let's hope the war goes on eh note two see page thirty four ante chapter five note three another reference to the famous phrase pourvu que les civils tiennent of course says the child tossing his head because we're getting rich he says by the end of may we shall have got fifty thousand francs fifty thousand francs impossible yes yes the child insists stamping he said it to mamma papa wished it could be always like that mamma sometimes she isn't sure because my brother adolphe is at the front but we're going to get him sent to the rear and then the war can go on these confidences are disturbed by sharp cries coming from the rooms of our hosts biquet the mobile goes to inquire it's nothing says he coming back is the good man slanging the woman because she doesn't know how to do things he says because she's made the mustard in a tumbler and he never heard of such a thing he says we get up and leave the strong odor of pipes wine and stale coffee in our cave as soon as we have crossed the threshold a heaviness of heat puffs in our faces fortified by the mustiness of frying that dwells in the kitchen and emerges every time the door is opened we pass through legions of flies which massed on the walls in black hordes fly abroad in buzzing swarms as we pass it's beginning again like last year flies outside lice inside and microbes still farther inside in a corner of this dirty little house and its litter of old rubbish its dusty debris of last year and the relics of so many summers gone by among the furniture and household gear something is moving it is an old simpleton with a long bald neck pink and rough making you think of a fowl's neck which has prematurely moulted through disease his profile is that of a hen too no chin and a long nose a grey overlay of beard felts his receded cheek and you see his heavy eyelids rounded and horny move up and down like shutters on the dull beads of his eyes back has already noticed him watch him he's a treasure seeker he says there's one somewhere in this hovel that he's stepfather to you'll see him directly go on all fours and push his old fizz hog in every corner there is tiens watch him with the aid of his stick the old man proceeded to take methodical soundings he tapped along the foot of the walls and on the floor tiles he was hustled by the coming and going of the occupants of the house by callers and by the swing of palmyra's broom but she let him alone and said nothing thinking to herself no doubt that the exploitation of the national calamity is a more profitable treasure than problematical caskets two gossips are standing in a recess and exchanging confidences in low voices hard by an old map of russia that is peopled with flies we oui, but it's with the piquant bitters that you've got to be careful if you haven't got a light touch you can't get your sixteen glasses out of a bottle and so you lose too much profit i don't say but what one's all right in one's purse even so but one doesn't make enough to guard against that the retailers ought to agree among themselves but the understanding's so difficult to bring off even when it's in the general interest outside there is a torrid sunshine riddled with flies the little beasts quite scarce but a few days ago multiply everywhere the murmur of their minute and innumerable engines i go out in the company of lamuse we are going for a saunter one can be at peace to-day it is complete rest by reason of the overnight march we might sleep but it suits us better to use the rest for an extensive promenade to-morrow the exercise and fatigues will get us again there are some less lucky than we who are already caught in the cog wheels of fatigue to lamuse who invites him to come and stroll with us corvisart replies screwing up the little round nose that is laid flatly on his oblong face like a cork can't i'm on manure he points to the shovel and broom by whose help he is performing his task of scavenger and night soil man we walk languidly the afternoon lies heavy on the drowsy land and on stomachs richly provided and embellished with food 
the remarks we exchange are infrequent over there we hear noises barque has fallen a victim to a menagerie of housewives and the scene is pointed by a pale little girl her hair tied behind in a pencil of tow and her mouth embroidered with fever spots and by women who are busy with some unsavoury job of washing in the meagre shade before their doors six men go by led by a quartermaster corporal they carry heaps of new greatcoats and bundles of boots lamuse regards his bloated and horny feet i must have some new sheds and no mistake a bit more and you'll see my splay feet through these ones can't go marching on the skin of my tongs eh an aeroplane booms overhead we follow its evolutions with our faces skyward our necks twisted our eyes watering at the piercing brightness of the sky lamuse declares to me when we have brought our gaze back to earth those machines will never become practical never how can you say that look at the progress they've made already and the speed of it yes but they'll stop there they'll never do any better never this time i do not challenge the dull and obstinate denial that ignorance opposes to the promise of progress and i let my big comrade alone in his stubborn belief that the wonderful effort of science and industry has been suddenly cut short having thus begun to reveal to me his inmost thoughts lamuse continues coming nearer and lowering his head he says to me you know she's here you duck see ah said i yes old chap you never notice anything you don't but i noticed and lamuse smiles at me indulgently now do you catch on if she's come here it's because we interest her eh she's followed us for one of us and don't you forget it he gets going again my boy do you want to know what i say she's come after me are you sure of it old chap yes says the ox man in a hollow voice first i want her then twice old man i found her exactly in my path in mine do you understand you may tell me that she ran away that's because she's timid that yes he stopped dead in the middle of the street and looked straight at me the heavy face greasily moist on the cheeks and nose was serious his rotund fist went up to the dark yellow moustache so carefully pointed and smoothed it tenderly then he continued to lay bare his heart to me i want her but you know i shall marry her all right i shall she's called eudoxie du maille at first i wasn't thinking of marrying her but since i've got to know her family name it seems to me that it's different and i should get on all right ah non de dieu she's so pretty that woman and it's not only that she's pretty ah the huge child was overflowing with sentiment and emotion and trying to make them speak to me ah uh, my boy there are times when i've just got to hold myself back with a hook came the strained and gloomy tones while the blood flushed to the fleshy parts of his cheeks and neck she's so beautiful she's and me i'm she's so unlike you'll have noticed it surely you that notices she's a country girl oui eh bien she's got a god knows what that's better than a parisienne even a toffed up and stylish parisienne pa she as for me i he puckered his red eyebrows he would have liked to tell me all the splendour of his thoughts but he knew not the art of expressing himself so he was silent he remained alone in his voiceless emotion as always alone we went forward side by side between the rows of houses in front of the doors drays laden with casks were drawn up the front windows blossomed with many hued heaps of jam pots stacks of tinder pipe lighters everything that the soldier is compelled to buy nearly all the natives had gone into grocery business had been getting out of gear locally for a long time but now it was booming everyone smitten with the fever of some totals and dazzled by the multiplication table plunged into trade bells tolled and the procession of a military funeral came out a forage wagon driven by a transport man carried a coffin wrapped in a flag following were a detachment of men an adjutant a padre and a civilian the poor little funeral with its tail lopped off said lamuse ah those that are dead are very happy but only sometimes not always voila 
we have passed the last of the houses in the country beyond the end of the street the fighting convoy and the regimental convoy have settled themselves the travelling kitchens and jingling carts that follow them with odds and ends of equipment the red cross wagons the motor lorries the forage carts the baggage master's gig the tents of drivers and conductors swarm around the vehicles on the open spaces horses lift their metallic eyes to the sky's emptiness with their feet on barren earth four poilus are setting up a table the open-air smitty is smoking this heterogeneous and swarming city planted in ruined fields whose straight or winding ruts are stiffening in the heat is already broadly balanced with rubbish and dung on the edge of the camp a big white-painted van stands out from the others in its tidy cleanliness had it been in the middle of a fair one would have said it was the stylish show where one pays more than at the others this is the celebrated stomatological van that blair was asking about in point of fact blair is there in front looking at it for some long time no doubt he has been going round it and gazing field hospital orderly sans of the division returning from errands is climbing the portable stair of painted wood which leads to the van door in his arms he carries a bulky box of biscuits a loaf of fancy bread and a bottle of champagne blair questions him tell me sir rump this horse box is it the dentist's it's written up there replies sans a little corpulent man clean close-shaven and his chin starch white if you can't see it you don't want the dentist to look after your grinders you want the vet to clean your eyesight blair comes nearer and scrutinizes the establishment it's a queer shop he says he goes nearer yet draws back hesitates to risk his gums in that carriage at last he decides puts a foot on the stair and disappears inside the caravan we continue our walk and turn into a footpath where are high dusty bushes and the noises are subdued the sunshine blazes everywhere it heats and roasts the hollow of the way spreading blinding and burning whiteness in patches and shimmers in the sky of faultless blue at the first turning almost before we had heard the light grating of a footstep we are face to face with eudoxie la muse utters a deep exclamation perhaps he fancies once more that she is looking for him and believes that she is the gift of his destiny he goes up to her all the bulk of him she looks at him and stops framed by the hawthorn her strangely slight and pale face is apprehensive the lids tremble on her magnificent eyes she is bareheaded and in the hollowed neck of her linen corsage there is the dawning of her flesh so near she is truly enticing in the sunshine this woman crowned with gold and one's glance is impelled and astonished by the moon-like purity of her skin her eyes sparkle her teeth too glisten white in the living wound of her half-open mouth red as her heart tell me i am going to tell you pants lamuse i like you so much he outstretches his arm towards the motionless beloved wayfarer she starts and replies to him leave me alone you disgust me the man's hand is thrown over one of her little ones she tries to draw it back and shakes it to free herself her intensely fair hair falls loose flaming he draws her to him his head bends towards her and his lips are ready his desire the wish of all his strength and all his life is to caress her he would die that he might touch her with his lips but she struggles and utters a choking cry she is trembling and her beautiful face is disfigured with abhorrence i go up and put my hand on my friend's shoulder but my intervention is not needed lamuse recoils and growls vanquished are you taken that way often cries eudoxy no groans the miserable man baffled overwhelmed bewildered don't do it again vous savez she says and goes off panting and he does not even watch her go he stands with his arms hanging gazing at the place whence she has gone tormented to the quick torn from his dreams of her and nothing left him to desire i lead him away and he comes in dumb agitation sniffling and out of breath as though he had run a long way the mass of his big head is bent in the pitiless light of eternal spring 
he is like the poor cyclops who roamed the shores of ancient sicily in the beginnings of time like a huge toy a thing of derision that a child's shining strength could subdue the itinerant wine seller whose barrow is hunchbacked with a barrel has sold several liters to the men on guard duty he disappears round the bend in the road with his face flat and yellow as a camembert his scanty thin hair frayed into dusty flakes and so emaciated himself that one could fancy his feet were fastened to his trunk by strings through his flopping trousers and among the idle poilu of the guard-room at the end of the place under the wing of the shaking and rattling signboard which serves as advertisement of the village a conversation is set up on the subject of this wandering buffoon note three every french village has a plaque attached to the first house on each road of approach giving its name and the distance to the next he has a dirty neb says bigorneau and i'll tell you what i think they've no business to let civvies mess about at the front with their pretty ringlets and especially individuals that you don't know where they come from you're quite crushing you portable louse replies cornet never mind shoe sole face bigorneau insists we trust em too much i know what i'm saying when i open it you don't says canard the pair's going to the rear the woman here murmurs la molette they're ugly they're a lot of frights the other men on guard their concentrated gaze roaming in space watch two enemy aeroplanes and the intricate skeins they are spinning around the stiff mechanical birds up there that appear now black like crows and now white like gulls according to the play of the light clouds of bursting shrapnel stipple the azure and seem like a long flight of snowflakes in the sunshine as we are going back two strollers come up carassus and chassier they announce that messman pepere is going to the rear to be sent to a territorial regiment having come under the operation of the delbiez act that's a hint for blair says carassus who has a funny big nose in the middle of his face that suits him ill in the village groups of poilus go by or in twos joined by the crossing bonds of converse we see the solitary ones unite in couples separate then come together again with new inspiration of talk drawn to each other as if magnetized in the middle of an excited crowd white papers are waving it is the newspaper hawker who is selling for two sous papers which should be one sou fouillade is standing in the middle of the road thin as the legs of a hare at the corner of a house paradis shows to the sun face pink as ham Biquet joins us again, in undress, with a jacket and cap of the police. He is licking his chops. I met some pals and we've had a drink. You see, tomorrow one starts scratching again, and cleaning his old rags and his catapult. But my great coat? Going to be some job to filter that. It isn't a great coat any longer. It's armor plate. Montreuil, a clerk at the office, appears and hails Biquet. Hey, riffraff! A letter! Been chasing you an hour! you're never to be found rotter can't be both here and there loony give us a squint he examines the letter balances it in his hand and announces as he tears the envelope it's from the old woman we slacken our pace as he reads he follows the lines with his finger wagging his head with an air of conviction and his lips moving like a woman's in prayer the throng increases the nearer we draw to the middle of the village we salute the commandant and the black-skirted padre who walks by the other side like his nurse we are questioned by pigeon guenon young escutenaire and chasseur clodor la muse appears blind and deaf and concerned only to walk pizouarne charion and roquette arrive excitedly to announce big news do you know pepere is going to the rear funny says biquet raising his nose from his letter how people kid themselves the old woman's bothered about me he shows me a passage in the maternal epistle when you get my letter he spells out no doubt you will be in the cold and mud deprived of everything mon pauvre jeanne he laughs it's ten days since she put that down for me and she's clean off it we're not cold cause it's been fine since this morning and we're not miserable because we've got a room that's good enough we've had hard times but we're all right now as we reach the kennel in which we are lodgers we are thinking that sentence over its touching simplicity affects me shows me a soul a host of souls because the sun has shown himself because we have felt a gleam and similitude of comfort suffering exists no longer either of the past or the terrible future 
we are all right now there is no more to say biquet establishes himself at the table like a gentleman to write a reply carefully he lays abroad his pen ink and paper and examines each then smilingly traces the strictly regular lines of his big handwriting across the meagre page you'd laugh he says if you knew what i've written to the old woman he reads his letter again fondles it and smiles to himself End of chapter 5 Read by Céline Major Section 7 of Under Fire, The Story of a Squad This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Under Fire, The Story of a Squad by Henri Barbousse. Translated by William Fitzwater Ray. Chapter Six Habits. We are enthroned in the back yard. The big hen, white as a cream cheese, is brooding in the depths of a basket near the coop whose imprisoned occupant is rummaging about. But the black hen is free to travel. She erects and withdraws her elastic neck in jerks and advances with a large and affected gait. One can just see her profile and its twinkling spangle, and her talk appears to proceed from a metal spring. She marches, glistening black and glossy like the love-locks of a gypsy, and as she marches she unfolds here and there upon the ground a faint trail of chickens. These trifling little yellow balls, kept always by a whispering instinct on the ebb-tide to safety, hurry along under the maternal march in short sharp jerks pecking as they go now the train comes to a full stop for two of the chickens are thoughtful and immobile careless of the parental clucking a bad sign says parody the hen that reflects is ill and parody uncrosses and recrosses his legs beside him on the bench blair extends his own lets loose a great yawn that he maintains in placid duration, and sets himself again to observe, for of all of us he most delights in watching fowls during the brief life when they are in such a hurry to eat. And we watch them in unison, not forgetting the shabby old cock, worn threadbare. Where his feathers have fallen appears the naked india-rubber leg, lurid as a grilled cutlet. He approaches the white sitter, which first turns her head away in tart denial, with several no's in a muffled rattle, and then watches him with the little blue enamel dials of her eyes. "'We're all right,' says Bark. "'Watch the little ducks,' says Blair, going along the communication trench. We watch a single file of all golden ducklings go past, still almost eggs on feet their big heads pulling their little lame bodies along by the string of their necks, and that quickly. From his corner the big dog follows them also with his deeply dark eye, on which the slanting sun has shaped a fine tawny ring. Beyond this rustic yard and over the scalloping of the low wall, the orchard reveals itself, where a green carpet, moist and thick, covers the rich soil and is topped by a screen of foliage with a garniture of blossom, some white as statuary, others pied and glossy as knots in neckties. Beyond again is the meadow where the shadowed poplars throw shafts of dark or golden green. Still farther again is a square patch of upstanding hops, followed by a patch of cabbages, sitting on the ground and dressed in line. In the sunshine of air and earth we hear the bees, as they work and make music in deference to the poets, and the cricket which, in defiance of the fable, sings with no humility and fills space by himself. Over yonder there falls eddying from a poplar's peak a magpie, half white, half black, like a shred of partly burned paper. The soldiers outstretch themselves luxuriously on the stone bench, their eyes half closed, 
and bask in the sunshine that warms the basin of the big yard till it is like a bath that's seventeen days we've been here after thinking we were going away day after day one never knows said paradis wagging his head and smacking his lips through the yard gate that opens onto the road we see a group of poilets strolling nose in air devouring the sunshine and then all alone telluro in the middle of the street he oscillates the preposterous abdomen of which he is proprietor and rocking on legs arched like basket handles he expectorates in wide abundance all around him we thought too that we should be as badly off here as in other quarters but this time it's real rest both in the time it lasts and the kind it is you're not given too many exercises and fatigues and between whiles you come in here to loll about the old man huddled up at the end of the seat no other than the treasure-seeking grandfather whom we saw the day of our arrival came nearer and lifted his finger when i was a young man i was thought a lot of by women he asserted shaking his head i have led young ladies astray ah said we heedless our attention taken away from his senile prattle by the timely noise of a cart that was passing laden and labouring nowadays the old man went on i only think about money ah we oui, the treasure you're looking for papa that's it said the old rustic though he felt the scepticism around him he tapped his cranium with his forefinger which he then extended towards the house take that insect there he said indicating a little beast that ran along the plaster what does it say it says i am the spider that spins the virgin's thread and the archaic simpleton added one must never judge what people do for one can never tell what may happen that's true replied Parody politely he's funny said mesnil andre between his teeth while he sought the mirror in his pocket to look at the facial benefit of fine weather he's crazy murmured bach in his ecstasy i leave you said the old man yielding in annoyance he got up to go and look for his treasure again entered the house that supported our backs and left the door open where beside the huge fireplace in the room we saw a little girl so seriously playing with a doll that blair fell considering and said she's right the games of children are a momentous preoccupation only the grown-ups play after we have watched the animals and the strollers go by we watch the time go by we watch everything we are seeing the life of things we are present with nature blended with climates mingled even with the sky coloured by the seasons we have attached ourselves to this corner of the land where chance has held us back from our endless wanderings in longer and deeper peace than elsewhere and this closer intercourse makes us sensible to all its traits and habits september the morrow of august and eve of october most affecting of months is already sprinkling the fine days with subtle warnings already one knows the meaning of the dead leaves that fall about the flat stones like a flock of sparrows in truth we have got used to each other's company we and this place so often transplanted we are taking root here and we no longer actually think of going away even when we talk about it the eleventh division jolly well stayed a month and a half resting said blair and the three hundred and seventy fifth too nine weeks replied spark in a tone of challenge i think we shall stay here at least as long at least i say we could finish the war here all right bark is affected by the words not very far from believing them after all it will finish some day what after all repeat the others to be sure one never knows says paradis he says this weakly without deep conviction it is however a saying which leaves no room for reply we say it over again softly lulling ourselves with it as with an old song farfaday rejoined us a moment ago 
he took his place near us but a little withdrawn all the same and sits on an overturned tub his chin on his fists this man is more solidly happy than we are we know it well and he knows it well lifting his head he has looked in turn with the same distant gaze at the back of the old man who went to seek his treasure and at the group that talks of going away no more there shines over our sensitive and sentimental comrade a sort of personal glamour which makes of him a being apart which gilds him and isolates him from us in spite of himself as though an officer's tabs had fallen on him from the sky his idyll with eudoxy has continued here we have had the proofs and once indeed he spoke of it she is not very far away and they are very near to each other did i not see her the other evening passing along the wall of the parsonage her hair but half quenched by a mantilla as she went obviously to a rendezvous did i not see that she began to hurry and to lean forward already smiling although there is no more between them yet than promises and assurances she is his and he is the man who will hold her in his arms then too he is going to leave us called to the rear to brigade h q where they want a weakling who can work a typewriter it is official it is in writing he is saved that gloomy future at which we others dare not look is definite and bright for him he looks at the open window and the dark gap behind it of some room or other over there a shadowy room that bemuses him his life is twofold in hope he is happy for the imminent happiness that does not yet exist is the only real happiness down here so a scanty spirit of envy grows around him one never knows murmurs paradis again but with no more confidence than when before in the straitened scene of our life to-day he uttered those immeasurable words end of chapter six section eight of under fire the story of a squad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org under fire the story of a squad by henri barbus translated by william fitzwater ray chapter seven in training the next day barque began to address us and said i'll just explain to you what it is there are some i a ferocious whistle cut his explanation off short on the syllable we were in a railway station on a platform a night alarm had torn us from our sleep in the village and we had marched here the rest was over our sector was being changed they were throwing us somewhere else we had disappeared from gauchin under cover of darkness without seeing either the place or the people without bidding them good-bye even in a look without bringing away a last impression a locomotive was shunting near enough to elbow us and screaming full-lunged i saw barque's mouth stoppered by the clamour of our huge neighbour pronounce an oath and i saw the other faces grimacing in deafened impotence faces helmeted and chin strapped for we were sentries in the station after you yelled barque furiously addressing the white plumed whistle but the terrible mechanism continued more imperiously than ever to drive his words back in his throat when it ceased and only its echo rang in our ears the thread of the discourse was broken for ever and barque contented himself with the brief conclusion we then we looked around us we were lost in a sort of town interminable strings of trucks trains of forty to sixty carriages were taking shape like rows of dark fronted houses low built all alike and divided by alleys before us alongside the collection of moving houses was the main line a limitless street where the white rails disappeared at both ends swallowed up in distance sections of trains and complete trains were staggering in great horizontal columns leaving their places then taking them again on every side one heard the regular hammering on the armoured ground piercing whistles 
the ringing of warning bells the solid metallic crash of the colossal cubes telescoping their steel stumps with the counter blows of chains and the rattle of the long carcasses vertebrae on the ground floor of the building that arises in the middle of the station like a town hall the hurried bell of telegraph and telephone was at work punctuated by vocal noises all about on the dusty ground were the goods sheds the low stores through whose doors one could dimly see the stacked interiors the pointsmen's cabins the bristling switches the hydrants the latticed iron posts whose wires rule the sky like music paper here and there the signals and rising naked over this flat and gloomy city two steam cranes like steeples farther away on waste ground and vacant sites in the environs of the labyrinth of platforms and buildings military carts and lorries were standing idle and rows of horses drawn out farther than one could see talk about the job this is going to be a whole army corps beginning to entrain this evening tiens they're coming now a cloud which overspread a noisy vibration of wheels and the rumble of horses hoofs was coming near and getting bigger in the approach to the station formed by converging buildings there are already some guns on board on some flat trucks down there between two long pyramidal dumps of chests we saw indeed the outline of wheels and some slender muzzles ammunition wagons guns and wheels were streaked and blotched with yellow brown and green there camoufles down there there are even horses painted look spot that one there with the big feet as if he had trousers on well he was white and they've slapped some paint on to change his color the horse in question was standing apart from the others which seemed to mistrust it and displayed a grayish yellow tone obviously with intent to deceive poor devil said Tilaque. you see said paradis we not only take em to get killed but mess them about first it's for their good anyway eh hey, we and us too it's for our good towards evening soldiers arrived from all sides they flowed towards the station deep-voiced non-coms ran in front of the files they were stemming the tide of men and massing them along the barriers or in railed squares pretty well everywhere the men piled their arms dropped their knapsacks and not being free to go out waited buried side by side in shadow the arrivals followed each other in volume that grew as the twilight deepened along with the troops the motors flowed up and soon there was an unbroken roar limousines glided through an enormous sea of lorries little middling and big all these cleared aside wedged themselves in subsided in their appointed places a vast hum of voices and mingled noises arose from the ocean of men and vehicles that beat upon the approaches to the station and began in places to filter through that's nothing yet said cocon the man of figures at army corps headquarters alone there are thirty officers motors and you don't know he added how many trains of fifty trucks it takes to entrain all the corpsmen and all the box of tricks except of course the lorries that'll join the new sector on their feet don't guess flat face it takes ninety great scott and there are thirty-three corps there are thirty-nine lousy one the turmoil increases the station becomes still more populous as far as the eye can make out a shape or the ghost of a shape there is a hurly-burly of movement as lively as a panic all the hierarchy of the non-coms expand themselves and go into action pass and repass like meteors wave their bright striped arms and multiply the commands and counter commands that are carried by the worming orderlies and cyclists the former tardy the latter manoeuvring in quick dashes like fish in water here now is evening definitely the blots made by the uniforms of the poilu grouped about the hillocks of rifles become indistinct and blend with the ground and then their mass is betrayed only by the glow of pipes and cigarettes in some places on the edge of the clusters the little bright points festoon the gloom like illuminated streamers in a merry-making street over this confused and heaving expanse an amalgam of voices rises like the sea breaking on the shore 
and above this unending murmur renewed commands shouts the din of a shot load or of one transferred the crash of steam hammers redoubling their dull endeavours and the roaring of boilers in the immense obscurity surcharged with men and with all things lights begin everywhere to appear these are the flash lamps of officers and detachment leaders and the cyclists acetylene lamps whose intensely white points zigzag hither and thither and reveal an outer zone of pallid resurrection an acetylene searchlight blazes blindingly out and depicts a dome of daylight other beams pierce and rend the universal grey then does the station assume a fantastic air mysterious shapes spring up and adhere to the sky's dark blue mountains come into view rough mottled and vast as the ruins of a town one can see the beginning of unending rows of objects finally plunged in night one guesses what the great bulks may be whose outermost outlines flash forth from a black abyss of the unknown on our left detachments of cavalry and infantry move ever forward like a ponderous flood we hear the diffused obscurity of voices we see some ranks delineated by a flash of phosphorescent light or a ruddy glimmering and we listen to long-drawn trails of noise up the gangways of the vans whose grey trunks and black mouths one sees by the dancing and smoking flame of torches artillerymen are leading horses there are appeals and shouts a frantic trampling of conflict and the angry kicking of some restive animal insulted by its guide against the panels of the van where he is cloistered not far away they are putting wagons on to railway trucks swarming humanity surrounds a hill of trusses of fodder a scattered multitude furiously attacks great strata of bales that's three hours we've been on our pins sighs paradis and those there what are they in some snatches of light we see a group of goblins surrounded by glow-worms and carrying strange instruments come out and then disappear that's the searchlight section says cocon you've got your considering cap on comrade what's it about there are four divisions at present in an army corps replies cocon the number changes sometimes it is three sometimes five just now it's four and each of our divisions continues the mathematical one whom our squad glories in owning includes three r i regiments of infantry two b c p battalions of chasseurs pieds one r t i regiment of territorial infantry without counting the special regiments artillery engineers transport etc and not counting either headquarters of the d i and the departments not brigaded but attached directly to the d i a regiment of the line of three battalions occupies four trains one for h q the machine-gun company and the c h r compagnie orang and one to each battalion all the troops won't entrain here they'll entrain in echelons along the line according to the position of the quarters and the period of reliefs i'm tired says tulacque we don't get enough solids to eat mark you we stand up because it's the fashion but we've no longer either force or freshness i've been getting information cocon goes on the troops the real troops will only entrain as from midnight they are still mustered here and there in the villages ten kilometres round about all the departments of the army corps will first set off and the e n e element non en division cocon obligingly explains that is attached directly to the a c among the e n e you won't see the balloon department nor the squadron they're too big goods and they navigate on their own with their staff and officers and hospitals the chasseur regiment is another of these e n e there's no regiment of chasseurs says barque thoughtlessly it's battalions one says such and such a battalion of chasseurs we can see cocon shrugging his shoulders in the shadows and his glasses cast a scornful gleam think so duck neb then i'll tell you since you're so clever there are two foot chasseurs and horse chasseurs gad i forgot the horsemen says barque only them cocon said in the e n e of the army corps there's the corps artillery that is to say the central artillery that's additional to that of the divisions it includes the h a heavy artillery the t a trench artillery the a d artillery depot the armoured cars the anti-aircraft batteries do i know or don't i 
there's the engineers the military police to wit the service of cops on foot and slops on horseback the medical department the veterinary ditto a squadron of the draft corps a territorial regiment for the guards and fatigues at h q headquarters the service de l'intendance and the supply column there's also the drove of cattle the remount depot the motor department talk about the swarm of soft jobs i could tell you about in an hour if i wanted to the paymaster that controls the pay offices and the post the council of war the telegraphists and all the electrical lot all those have chiefs commandants sections and subsections and they're rotten with clerks and orderlies of sorts and all the bally box of tricks you can see from here the sort of job the c o of a corps got at this moment we were surrounded by a party of soldiers carrying boxes in addition to their equipment and parcels tied up in paper that they bore reluctantly and anon placed on the ground puffing those are the staff secretaries they are a part of the hq headquarters that is to say a sort of general suite when they're flitting they lug about their chests of records their tables their registers and all the dirty oddments they need for their writing tiens see that there it's a typewriter those two are carrying the old papa and the little sausage with a rifle threaded through the parcel they're in three offices and there's also the dispatch writer section the chancellerie the a c t s army corps topographical section that distributes maps to the divisions and makes maps and plans from the aviators and the observers and the prisoners it's the officers of all the departments who under the orders of two colonels form the staff of the army corps but the h q properly so called which also includes orderlies cooks storekeepers workpeople electricians police and the horsemen of the escort is bossed by a commandant at this moment we receive collectively a tremendous bump hey look out out of the way cries a man by way of apology who is being assisted by several others to push a cart towards the wagons the work is hard for the ground slopes up and so soon as they cease to buttress themselves against the cart and adhere to the wheels it slips back the sullen men crush themselves against it in the depth of the gloom grinding their teeth and growling as though they fell upon some monster barque all the while rubbing his back questions one of the frantic gang think you're going to do it old duckfoot nom de dieu roars he engrossed in his job mind these sets you're going to wreck the show with a sudden movement he jostles barque again and this time turns round on him what are you doing there dung guts numbskull no it can't be that you're drunk barque retorts what am i doing here it's good that tell me you lousy gang wouldn't you like to do it too out of the way cries a new voice which precedes some men doubled up under burdens incongruous but apparently overwhelming one can no longer remain anywhere everywhere we are in the way we go forward we scatter we retire in the turmoil in addition i tell you continues cocon tranquil as a scientist there are the divisions each organized pretty much like an army corps we we know it miss the deal he makes a fine to-do about it all that mountebank in the horse-box on castors what a mother-in-law he'd make i'll bet that's the major's wrong-headed horse the one that the vet said was a calf in process of becoming a cow it's well organized all the same all that no doubt about it says lamuse admiringly forced back by a wave of artillerymen carrying boxes that's true martereau admits to get all this lot on the way you've not got to be a lot of turnip heads nor a lot of custards bon dieu look where you're putting your damn boots you black-livered beast talk about a flitting when i went to live at marcoussi with my family there was less fuss than this but then i'm not built that way myself we are silent and then we hear cocon saying for the whole french army that holds the lines to go by i'm not speaking of those who are fixed up at the rear where there are twice as many men again and services like the ambulance that cost nine million francs and can clear you seven thousand cases a day to see them go by in trains of sixty coaches each following each other without stopping at intervals of a quarter of an hour it would take forty days and forty nights ah they say it is too much effort for their imagination they lose interest and sicken of the magnitude of these figures they yawn and with watering eyes they follow in the confusion of haste and shouts and smoke of roars and gleams and flashes the terrible line of the armoured train that moves in the distance with fire in the sky behind it 
End of chapter 7「Section 9 of Under Fire, the Story of a Squad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Under Fire, the Story of a Squad by Henri Barbus, translated by William Fitzwater Ray. Chapter 8 on leave eudore sat down a while there by the roadside well before taking the path over the fields that led to the trenches his hands crossed over one knee his pale face uplifted he had no moustache under his nose only a little flat smear over each corner of his mouth he whistled and then yawned in the face of the morning till the tears came an artilleryman who was quartered on the edge of the wood over there where a line of horses and carts looked like a gypsy's bivouac came up with the well in his mind and two canvas buckets that danced at the end of his arms in time with his feet in front of the sleepy unarmed soldier with a bulging bag he stood fast on leave yes said eudore just back good for you said the gunner as he made off you've nothing to grumble at with six days leave in your water bottle and here see are four more men coming down the road their gait heavy and slow their boots turned into enormous caricatures of boots by reason of the mud as one man they stopped on espying the profile of eudore there's eudore hello eudore hello the old sport you're back then they cried together and they hurried up and offered him hands as big and ruddy as if they were hidden in woollen gloves morning boys said eudore had a good time what have you got to tell us my boy yes replied eudore not so bad we've been on wine fatigue and we've finished let's go back together pa in single file they went down the embankment of the road arm in arm they crossed the field of grey mud where their feet fell with the sound of dough being mixed in the kneading trough well you've seen your wife your little mariette the only girl for you that you could never open your jaw without telling us a tale about her eh eudore's wan face winced my wife yes i saw her sure enough but only for a little while there was no way of doing any better but no luck i admit and that's all about it how's that how you know that we live at villiers la baille a hamlet of four houses neither more nor less a straddle over the road one of those houses is our cafe and she runs it or rather she is running it again since they gave up shelling the village now then with my leave coming along she asked for a permit to mont saint eloi where my old folks are and my permit was for mont saint eloi too see the move being a little woman with a headpiece you know she had applied for her permit long before the date when my leave was expected all the same my leave came before her permit spite of that i set off for one doesn't let his turn in the company go by eh so i stayed with the old people and waited i like em well enough but i got down in the mouth all the same as for them it was enough that they could see me and it worried them that i was bored by their company how else could it be at the end of the sixth day at the finish of my leave and the very evening before returning a young man on a bicycle son of the florence family brings me a letter from mariette to say that her permit had not yet come ah rotten luck cried the audience and that continued eudore there was only one thing to do i was to get leave from the mayor of mont saint eloi who would get it from the military and go myself at full speed to see her at villers you should have done that the first day not the sixth so it seems but i was afraid we should cross and me miss her you see as soon as i landed i was expecting her all the time and every minute i fancied i could see her at the open door so i did as she told me after all you saw her just one day or rather just one night quite sufficient merrily said lamuse and eudore the pale and serious shook his head under the shower of pointed and perilous jests that followed 
Shut your great mouths for five minutes, chaps. Get on with it, petit. There isn't a great lot of it, said Eudor. Well, then you were saying you had got a hump with your old people. Ah, yes. They had tried their best to make up for Mariette with lovely rashers of our own ham and plum brandy and patching up my linen and all sorts of little spoiled kid tricks, and I noticed they were still slanging each other in the old familiar way. But you talk about a difference. I always had my eye on the door to see if some time or other it wouldn't get a move on and turn into a woman. So I went and saw the mare and set off yesterday towards two in the afternoon, towards fourteen o'clock i might well say seeing that i had been counting the hours since the day before i had just one day of my leave left then as we drew near in the dusk through the carriage window of the little railway that still keeps going down there on some fag ends of line i recognized half the country and the other half i didn't here and there i got the sense of it all at once and it came back all fresh to me and melted away again just as if it was talking to me then it shut up in the end we got out and i found the limit that was that we had to pad the hoof to the last station never old man have i been in such weather it had rained for six days for six days the sky washed the earth and then washed it again the earth was softening and shifting and filling up the holes and making new ones same here it only stopped raining this morning it was just my luck and everywhere there were swollen new streams washing away the borders of the fields as though they were lines on paper there were hills that ran with water from top to bottom gusts of wind sent the rain in great clouds flying and whirling about and lashing our hands and faces and necks so you bet when i tramped to the station if someone had pulled a really ugly face at me it would have been enough to make me turn back but when we did get to the place there were several of us some more men on leave they weren't bound for villiers but they had to go through it to get somewhere else so it happened that we got there in a lump five old cronies that didn't know each other i could make out nothing of anything they've been worse shelled over there than here and then there was the water everywhere and it was getting dark i told you there are only four houses in the little place only they're a good bit off from each other you come to the lower end of a slope i didn't know too well where i was no more than my pals did though they belonged to the district and had some notion of the lay of it and all the less because of the rain falling in buckets full it got so bad that we couldn't keep from hurrying and began to run we passed by the farm of the Alou, that's the first of the houses and it looked like a sort of stone ghost bits of walls like splintered pillars standing up out of the water the house was shipwrecked the other farm a little further was as good as drowned dead our house is the third it's on the edge of the road that runs along the top of the slope we climbed up facing the rain that beat on us in the dusk and began to blind us the cold and wet fairly smacked us in the eye flop and broke our ranks like machine guns the house i ran like a greyhound like an african attacking mariette i could see her with her arms raised high in the doorway behind that fine curtain of night and rain of rain so fierce that it drove her back and kept her shrinking between the doorposts like a statue of the virgin in its niche i just threw myself forward but remembered to give my pals the sign to follow me the house swallowed the lot of us mariette laughed a little to see me with a tear in her eye she waited till we were alone together and then laughed and cried all at once i told the boys to make themselves at home and sit down some on the chairs and the rest on the table where are they going say monsieur asked mariette we are going to vauvelle jesus she said you'll never get there you can't do those two miles and more in the night with the roads washed away and swamps everywhere you mustn't even try to well we'll go on to-morrow then only we must find somewhere to pass the night i'll go with you i said as far as the pendu farm they're not short of room in that shop you'll snore in there all right and you can start at daybreak right let's get a move on so far we went out again what a downpour we were wet past bearing the water poured into our socks through the boot soles and by the trouser bottoms and they too were soaked through and through up to the knees 
before we got to this pendu we meet a shadow in a big black cloak with a lantern the lantern is raised and we see a gold stripe on the sleeve and then an angry face what the hell are you doing there says the shadow drawing back a little and putting one fist on his hip while the rain rattled like hail on his hood there are men on leave for vauvel they can't set off again to-night they would like to sleep in the pendu farm what do you say sleep here this is the police station i am the officer on guard and there are boak prisoners in the buildings and i'll tell you what he said as well i must see you hop it from here in less than two seconds bonsoir so we right about face and started back again stumbling as if we were boozed slipping puffing splashing and bespattering ourselves one of the boys cried to me through the wind and rain we'll go back with you as far as your home all the same if we haven't a house we've time enough where will you sleep oh we'll find somewhere don't worry for the little time we have to kill here yes we'll find somewhere all right i said come in again for a minute meanwhile i won't take no and mariette sees us enter once more in single file all five of us soaked like bread in soup so there we all were with only one little room to go round in and go round again the only room in the house seeing that it isn't a palace tell me madame says one of our friends isn't there a cellar here there's water in it says mariette you can't see the bottom step and it's only got two damn says the man for i see there's no loft either after a minute or two he gets up good night old pal he says to me and they get their hats on what are you going off in weather like this boys do you think says the old sport that we're going to spoil your stay with your wife but my good man but me no buts it's nine o'clock and you've got to take your hook before day so good night coming you others rather say the boys good night all there they are at the door and opening it mariette and me we look at each other but we don't move once more we look at each other and then we sprang at them i grabbed the skirt of a coat and she a belt all wet enough to wring out never we won't let you go it can't be done but but me no buts i reply while she locks the door then what asked lamuse then nothing at all replied eudor we just stayed like that very discreetly all the night sitting propped up in the corners yawning like the watchers over a dead man we made a bit of talk at first from time to time some one said is it still raining and went and had a look and said it's still raining we could hear it by the way a big chap who had a moustache like a bulgarian fought against sleeping like a wild man sometimes one or two among the crowd slept but there was always one to yawn and keep an eye open for politeness who stretched himself or half got up so that he could settle more comfortably mariette and me we never slept we looked at each other but we looked at the others as well and they looked at us and there you are morning came and cleaned the window i got up to go and look outside the rain was hardly less in the room i could see dark forms that began to stir and breathe hard mariette's eyes were red with looking at me all night between her and me a soldier was filling his pipe and shivering some one beats a tattoo on the window and i half open it a silhouette with a streaming hat appears as though carried and driven there by the terrible force of the blast that came with it and asks hey in the cafe there is there any coffee to be had coming sir coming cried mariette she gets up from her chair a little benumbed without a word she looks at herself in our bit of a mirror touches her hair lightly and says quite simply the good lass i am going to make coffee for everybody when that was drunk off we had all of us to go besides customers turned up every minute hey la petite mere they cried shoving their noses in at the half-open window let's have a coffee or three or four and two more again says another voice we go up to mariette to say good-bye they knew they had played gooseberry that night most damnably but i could see plainly that they didn't know if it would be the thing to say something about it or just let it drop altogether then the bulgarian made up his mind we've made a hell of a mess of it for you a ma petite dame he said that to show he'd been well brought up the old sport mariette thanks him and offers him her hand that's nothing at all sir i hope you'll enjoy your leave and me i held her tight in my arms and kissed her as long as i could half a minute discontented my god there was reason to be but glad that mariette had not driven the boys out like dogs and i felt sure she liked me too for not doing it 
but that isn't all said one of the leave men lifting the skirt of his cape and fumbling in his coat pocket that's not all what do we owe you for the coffees nothing for you stayed the night with me you are my guests oh madame we can't have that and how they set to to make protests and compliments in front of each other old oh, man you can say what you like we may be only poor devils but it was astonishing that little palaver of good manners come along let's be hopping it eh they go out one by one i stay till the last just then another passer-by begins to knock on the window another who was dying for a mouthful of coffee mariet by the open door leaned forward and cried one second then she put into my arms a parcel that she had ready i had bought a knuckle of ham it was for supper for us for us too and a liter of good wine but ma foi when i saw there were five of you i didn't want to divide it out so much and i want still less now there's the ham the bread and the wine i give them to you so that you can enjoy them by yourself my boy as for them we have given them enough she says poor mariette sighs eudore fifteen months since i'd seen her and when shall i see her again ever it was jolly that idea of hers she crammed all that stuff into my bag he half opens his brown canvas pouch look here they are the ham here and the bread and there's the booze well seeing it's there you don't know what we're going to do with it we're going to share it out between us eh old pals end of chapter eight on leave section ten of under fire the story of a squad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org under fire the story of a squad by henri barbusse translated by william fitzwater ray chapter nine the anger of volpate when volpate arrived from his sick leave after two months absence we surrounded him but he was sullen and silent and tried to get away well what about it volpate have you nothing to tell us tell us all about the hospital and the sick leave old cock from the day when you set off in your bandages with your snout in parenthesis you must have seen something of the official shops speak then nom de dieu i don't want to say anything at all about it said volpate what's that what are you talking about i'm fed up that's what i am the people back there i'm sick of them they make me spew and you can tell em so what have they done to you a lot of sods they are says volpate there he was with his head as of yore his ears stuck on again and his mongolian cheekbones stubbornly set in the middle of the puzzled circle that besieged him and we felt that the mouth fast closed on ominous silence meant high pressure of seething exasperation in the depth of him some words overflowed from him at last he turned round facing towards the rear in the bases and shook his fist at infinite space there are too many of them he said between his teeth there are too many he seemed to be threatening and repelling a rising sea of phantoms a little later we questioned him again knowing well that his anger could not thus be retained within and that the savage silence would explode at the first chance it was in a deep communication trench away back where we had come together for a meal after a morning spent in digging torrential rain was falling we were muddled and drenched and hustled by the flood and we ate standing in single file without shelter under the dissolving sky only by feats of skill could we protect the bread and bully from the spouts that flowed from every point in space and while we ate we put our hands and faces as much as possible under our cowls the rain rattled and bounced and streamed on our limp woven armor and worked with open brutality or sly secrecy into ourselves and our food our feet were sinking farther and farther taking deep root in the stream that flowed along the clayey bottom of the trench some faces were laughing though their mustaches dripped others grimaced at the spongy bread and flabby meat or at the missiles which attacked their skin from all sides at every defect in their heavy and miry armor-plate 
barque who was hugging his mess tin to his heart bawled at volpate well then a lot of sods you say that you've seen down there where you've been for instance cried blair while a redoubled squall shook and scattered his words what have you seen in the way of sods there are volpate began and then there are too many of them nom de dieu there are he tried to say what was the matter with him but could only repeat there are too many of them oppressed and panting he swallowed a pulpy mouthful of bread as if there went with it the disordered and suffocating mass of his memories is it the shirkers you want to talk about by god he had thrown the rest of his beef over the parapet and this cry this gasp escaped violently from his mouth as if from a valve don't worry about the soft job brigade old cross patch advised barque banteringly but not without some bitterness what good does it do concealed and huddled up under the fragile and unsteady roof of his oiled hood while the water poured down its shining slopes and holding his empty mess tin out for the rain to clean it volpate snarled i'm not daft not a bit of it and i know very well there've got to be these individuals at the rear let them have their dead heads for all i care but there's too many of them and they're all alike and all rotters voila relieved by this affirmation which shed a little light on the gloomy farrago of fury he was loosing among us volpate began to speak in fragments across the relentless sheets of rain at the very first village they sent me to i saw duds and duds galore and they began to get on my nerves all sorts of departments and sub-departments and managements and centres and offices and committees you're no sooner there than you meet swarms of fools swarms of different services that are only different in name enough to turn your brain i tell you the man that invented the names of all those committees he was wrong in his head so could i help but be sick of it ah mon vieux said our comrade musing all those individuals fiddle faddling and making believe down there all spruced up with their fine caps and officers coats and shameful boots that gulp dainties and can put a dram of best brandy down their gullets whenever they want and wash themselves often or twice than once and go to church and never stop smoking and pack themselves up in feathers at night to read the newspaper and then they say afterwards i've been in the war one point above all had got hold of volpate and emerged from his confused and impassioned vision all those soldiers they haven't to run away with their table tools and get a bite in the old way they've got to be at their ease they'd rather go and sit themselves down with some tart in the district at a special reserve table and guzzle vegetables and the fine lady puts their crockery out all square for them on the dining-table and their pots of jam and every other blasted thing to eat in short the advantages of riches and peace in that doubly damned hell they call the rear volpate's neighbor shook his head under the torrents that fell from heaven and said so much the better for them i'm not crazy volpate began again perhaps but you're not fair volpate felt himself insulted by the word he started and raised his head furiously and the rain that was waiting for the chance took him plump in the face not fair me not fair to those dunghills exactly monsieur the neighbor replied i tell you that you play hell with them and yet you'd jolly well like to be in the rotter's place very likely but what does that prove rump face to begin with we we've been in danger and it ought to be our turn for the other but they're always the same i tell you and then there's young men there strong as bulls and poised like wrestlers and then there are too many of them do you hear it's always too many i say because it is so too many what do you know about it villain these departments and committees do you know what they are 
i don't know what they are volpate set off again but i know don't you think they need a crowd to keep all the army's affairs going i don't care a damn but but you wish it was you eh chaffed the invisible neighbor who concealed in the depth of the hood on which the reservoirs of space were emptying either a supreme indifference or a cruel desire to take a rise out of volpate i can't help it said the other simply there's those that can help it for you interposed the shrill voice of barque i knew one of em i too i've seen em volpate yelled with a desperate effort through the storm tiens not far from the front don't know where exactly where there's an ambulance clearing station and a sous intendance i met the reptile there the wind as it passed over us tossed him the question what was it at that moment there was a lull and the weather allowed volpate to talk after a fashion he said he took me round all the jumble of the depot as if it was a fair although he was one of the sights of the place he led me along the passages and into the dining-rooms of houses and supplementary barracks he half opened doors with labels on them and said look here and here too look i went inspecting with him but he didn't go back like i did to the trenches don't fret yourself and he wasn't coming back from them either don't worry the reptile the first time i saw him he was walking nice and leisurely in the yard i'm in the expenses department he says we talked a bit and the next day he got an orderly job so as to dodge getting sent away seeing it was his turn to go since the beginning of the war on the step of the door where he'd laid all night on a feather bed he was polishing the pumps of his monkey master beautiful yellow pumps rubbing em with paste fairly glazing em my boy i stopped to watch him and the chap told me all about himself mon vieux i don't remember much more of the stuffing that came out of his crafty skull than i remember of the history of france and the dates we wind at school never i tell you had he been sent to the front although he was class nineteen o three and a lusty devil at that he was danger and dog tiredness and all the ugliness of war not for him but for the others we he knew damned well that if he set foot in the firing line the line would see that the beast got it so he ran like hell from it and stopped where he was he said they'd tried all ways to get him but he'd given the slip to all the captains all the colonels all the majors and they were all damnably mad with him he told me about it how did he work it he'd sit down all of a sudden put on a stupid look do the scrim shanker stunt and flop like a bundle of dirty linen i've got a sort of general fatigue he'd blubber they didn't know how to take him and after a bit they just let him drop everybody was fit to spew on him and he changed his tricks according to the circumstances do you catch on sometimes he had something wrong with his foot he was damn clever with his feet and then he contrived things and he knew one head from another and how to take his opportunities he knew what's what he did you could see him go and slip in like a pretty poilu among the depot chaps where the soft jobs were and stay there and then he'd put himself out no end to be useful to the pals he'd get up at three o'clock in the morning to make the juice go and fetch the water while the others were getting their grub at last he'd wormed himself in everywhere he came to be one of the family the rod of the carrion he did it so he wouldn't have to do it he seemed to me like an individual that would have earned five quid honestly with the same work and bother that he puts into forging a one-pound note but there he'll get his skin out of it all right he will at the front he'd be lost sight of in the throng of it but he's not so stupid be damned to them he says that take their grub on the ground and be damned to them still more when they're under it when we've all done with fighting he'll go back home and he'll say to his friends and neighbors here i am safe and sound and his pals will be glad because he's a good sort with engaging manners contemptible creature that he is and and this is the most stupid thing of all but he takes you in and you swallow him whole the son of a bug 
and then those sort of beings don't you believe there's only one of them there are barrels of em in every depot that hang on and writhe when their time comes to go and they say i'm not going and they don't go and they never succeed in driving them as far as the front nothing new in all that said barque we know it we know it then there are the offices volpate went on engrossed in his story of travel whole houses and streets and districts i saw that my little corner in the rear was only a speck and i had full view of them no i'd never have believed there'd be so many men on chairs while war was going on a hand protruded from the rank and made trial of space no more sauce falling then we're going out bet your life on it so march was the cry the storm held its peace we filed off in the long narrow swamp stagnating in the bottom of the trench where the moment before it had shaken under slabs of rain volpate's grumbling began again amidst our sorry stroll and the eddies of floundering feet i listened to him as i watched the shoulders of a poverty-stricken overcoat swaying in front of me drenched through and through this time volpate was on the track of the police the farther you go from the front the more you see of them their battlefield is not the same as ours tulacque had an ancient grudge against them look he said how the bobbies spread themselves about to get good lodgings and good food and then after the drinking regulations they dropped on the secret wine cellars you saw them lying in wait with a corner of an eye on the shop doors to see if there weren't any poilus slipping quietly out two face that they are leering to left and to right and licking their moustaches there are good ones among em i knew one in my country the cote door where i shut up was tulacque's peremptory interruption they're all alike there isn't one that can put another right yes they're lucky said volpate but do you think they're contented not a bit they grouse at least he corrected himself there was one i met and he was a grouser he was devilish bothered by the drill manual it isn't worth while to learn the drill instruction he said they're always changing it for instance take the department of military police well as soon as you've got the gist of it it's something else ah when will this war be over he says they do what they're told to do those chaps ventured eudore surely it isn't their fault at all it doesn't alter the fact that these professional soldiers pensioned and decorated in the time when we're only civvies will have made war in a damned funny way that reminds me of a forester that i saw as well said volpate who played hell about the fatigues they put him to it's disgusting the fellow said to me what they do with us we're all non-coms soldiers that have done four years of service at least we're paid on the higher scale it's true but what of that we are officials and yet they humiliate us at h q they set us to cleaning and carrying the dung away the civilians see the treatment they inflict on us and they look down on us and if you look like grousing they'll actually talk about sending you off to the trenches like foot soldiers what's going to become of our prestige when we go back to the parishes as rangers after the war if we do come back from it the people of the villages and forests will say ah it was you that was sweeping the streets at x to get back our prestige compromised by human injustice and ingratitude i know well he says that we shall have to make complaints and make complaints and make em with all our might to the rich and to the influential he says i knew a gendarme who was all right said lamuse the police are tempered enough in general he says but there are always dirty devils everywhere pa the civilian is really afraid of the gendarme says he and that's a fact and so i admit it there are some who take advantage of it and those ones the tag rag of the gendarmerie know where to get a glass or two if i was chief or brigadier i'd screw em down not half i wouldn't he says for public opinion he says again lays the blame on the whole force when a single one with a grievance makes a complaint as for me says paradis one of the worst days of my life was once when i saluted a gendarme taking him for a lieutenant with his white stripes fortunately i don't say it to console myself but because it's probably true fortunately i don't think he saw me a silence we evidently the men murmured but what about it no need to worry 
a little later when we were seated along a wall with our backs to the stones and our feet plunged and planted in the ground volpate continued unloading his impressions i went into a big room that was a depot office bookkeeping department i believe it swarmed with tables and people in it like in a market clouds of talk all along the walls on each side and in the middle personages sitting in front of their spread out goods like waste paper merchants i put in a request to be put back into my regiment and they said to me take your damned hook and get busy with it i lit on a sergeant a little chap with airs spick as a daisy with a gold-rimmed spyglass eyeglasses with a tape on them he was young but being a re-enlisted soldier he had the right not to go to the front i said to him sergeant but he didn't hear me being busy slanging a secretary it's unfortunate mon garçon he was saying i've told you twenty times that you must send one notice of it to be carried out by the squadron commander provost of the c a and one by way of advice without signature but making mention of the signature to the provost of the force publique d'amiens and of the centres of the district of which you have the list in envelopes of course of the general commanding the district it's very simple he says i'd drawn back three paces to wait till he'd done with jawing five minutes after i went up to the sergeant he said to me my dear sir i have not the time to bother with you i have many other matters to attend to as a matter of fact he was all in a flummox in front of his typewriter the chump because he'd forgotten he said to press on the capital letter lever and so instead of underlining the heading of his page he damn well scored a line of eights in the middle of the top so he couldn't hear anything and he played hell with the americans seeing the machine came from there after that he growled against another woolly leg because on the memorandum of the distribution of maps they hadn't put the names of the ration department the cattle department and the administrative convoy of the three hundred and twenty eighth d i alongside a fool was obstinately trying to pull more circulars off a jellygraph than it would print doing his damnedest to produce a lot of ghosts that you could hardly read others were talking where are the parisian fasteners asked a toff and they don't call things by their proper names tell me now if you please what are the elements quartered at x the elements what's all that sort of babble asked volpate at the end of the big table where these fellows were that i've mentioned and that i'd been to and the sergeant floundering about behind a hillock of papers at the top of it and giving orders a simpleton was doing nothing but tap on his blotting-pad with his hands his job the mug was the department of leave papers and as the big push had begun and all leave was stopped he hadn't anything to do capital he says and all that that's one table in one room in one department in one depot i've seen more and then more and more and more again i don't know but it's enough to drive you off your nut i tell you have they got brisks not many there but in the department of the second line every one had em you had museums of them there whole zoological gardens of stripes prettiest thing i've seen in the way of stripes said tulacque was a motorist dressed in cloth that you'd have said was satin with new stripes and the leathers of an english officer though a second-class soldier as he was with his finger on his cheek he leaned with his elbows on that fine carriage adorned with windows that he was the valet de chambre of he'd have made you sick the dainty beast he was just exactly the poilu that you see pictures of in the ladies papers the pretty little naughty papers each has now his memories his tirade on this much excogitated subject of the shirkers and all begin to overflow and to talk at once a hubbub surrounds the foot of the mean wall where we are heaped like bundles with a grey muddy and trampled spectacle lying before us laid waste by rain orderly and waiting to the road department then at the bakery then cyclist to the revittling department of the eleventh battery 
every morning he had a note to take to the service de l'intendance to the gunnery school to the bridges department and in the evening to the a d and the a t that was all when i was coming back from leave said that orderly the women cheered us at all the level crossing gates that the train passed they took you for soldiers i said ah i said you're called up then are you certainly he says to me considering that i've been a round of meetings in america with a ministerial deputation perhaps it's not exactly being called up that anyway mon ami he says i don't pay any rent so i must be called up and me to finish cries volpate silencing the hum with his authority of a traveller returned from down there to finish i saw a whole legion of em all together at a blow-out for two days i was a sort of helper in the kitchen of one of the centres of the c o a cause they couldn't let me do nothing while waiting for my reply which didn't hurry seeing they'd sent another inquiry and a super inquiry after it and the reply had too many halts to make in each office going and coming in short i was cook in the shop once i waited at table seeing that the head cook had just got back from leave for the fourth time and was tired i saw and i heard those people every time i went into the dining-room that was in the prefecture and all that hot and illuminated row got into my head they were only auxiliaries in there but there were plenty of the armed service among the number too they were almost all old men with a few young ones besides sitting here and there i'd begun to get about enough of it when one of the broomsticks said the shutters must be closed it's more prudent my boy they were a lump of a hundred and twenty-five miles from the firing line but that pock marked puppy he wanted to make believe there was danger of bombardment by aircraft and there's my cousin said tulacque fumbling who wrote to me look here's what he says mon cher adolphe here i am definitely settled in paris as attache to guard-room sixty while you are down there i must stay in the capital at the mercy of a taube or a zeppelin the phrase sheds a tranquil delight abroad and we assimilate it like a tit-bit laughing after that volpate went on those layers of soft jobbers fed me up still more as a dinner it was all right cod seeing it was friday but prepared like soles a la marguerite i know all about it but the talk they call the bayonet rosalie don't they yes the padded loonies but during dinner these gentlemen talked above all about themselves every one so as to explain why he wasn't somewhere else as good as said but all the while saying something else and gorging like an ogre i'm ill i'm feeble look at me ruin that i am me i'm in my dotage they were all seeking inside themselves to find diseases to wrap themselves up in i wanted to go to the war but i've a rupture two ruptures three ruptures ah non that feast the orders that speak of sending everybody away explained a funny man they're like the comedies he explained there's always a last act to clear up all the jobbery of the others that third act is this paragraph unless the requirements of the department stand in the way there was one that told this tale i had three friends that i counted on to give me a lift up i was going to apply to them but one after another a little before i put in my request they were killed by the enemy look at that he says i've no luck another was explaining to another that as for him he would very much have liked to go but the surgeon major had taken him round the waist to keep him by force in the depot with the auxiliary eh bien he says i resign myself after all i shall be of greater value in putting my intellect to the service of the country than in carrying a knapsack and him that was alongside said we oui, with his headpiece feathered on top he jolly well consented to go to bordeaux at the time when the bocas were getting near paris and then bordeaux became the stylish place but afterwards he returned firmly to the front to paris and said something like this my ability is of value to france it is absolutely necessary that i guard it for france 
they talked about other people that weren't there of the commandant who was getting an impossible temper and they explained that the more imbecile he got the harsher he got and the general that made unexpected inspections with the idea of kicking all the soft jobbers out but who'd been laid up for eight days very ill he's certainly going to die his condition no longer gives rise to any uneasiness they said smoking the cigarettes that society swells send to the depots for the soldiers at the front do you know they said little Frazy, who is such a nice boy the cherub he's at last found an excuse for staying behind they wanted some cattle slaughterers for the abattoir and he's enlisted himself in there for protection although he's got a university degree and in spite of being an attorney's clerk as for flandrin's son he's succeeded in getting himself attached to the road menders road mender him do you think they'll let him stop so certain sure replies one of the cowardly milksops a road mender's job is for a long time talk about idiots martereau growls and they were all jealous i don't know why of a chap called Borin formerly he moved in the best parisian circles he lunched and dined in the city he made eighteen calls a day and fluttered about the drawing-rooms from afternoon tea till daybreak he was indefatigable in leading cotillions organizing festivities swallowing theatrical shows without counting the motoring parties and all the lot running with champagne then the war came so he's no longer capable the poor boy of staying on the lookout a bit late at an embrasure or of cutting wire he must stay peacefully in the warm and then him a parisian to go into the provinces and bury himself in the trenches never in this world i realize too replied an individual that at thirty-seven i've arrived at the age when i must take care of myself and while the fellow was saying that i was thinking of dumont the gamekeeper who was forty-two and was done in close to me on hill one thirty-two so near that after he got the handful of bullets in his head my body shook with the trembling of his and what were they like with you these thieves to hell with me it was but they didn't show it too much only now and again when they couldn't hold themselves in they looked at me out of the corner of their eyes and took damn good care not to touch me in passing for i was still war mucky it disgusted me a bit to be in the middle of that heap of good-for-nothings but i said to myself come it's only for a bit fermin there was just one time that i very near broke out with the itch and that was when one of em said later when we return if we do return no he had no right to say that sayings like that before you let them out of your gob you've got to earn them it's like a decoration let them get cushy jobs if they like but not play at being men in the open when they've damned well run away and you hear em discussing the battles for they're in closer touch than you with the big bugs and with the way the war's managed and afterwards when you return if you do return it's you that'll be wrong in the middle of all that crowd of humbugs with the poor little truth that you've got ah that evening i tell you all those heads in the reek of the light the foolery of those people enjoying life and profiting by peace it was like a ballet at the theatre or the make-believe of a magic lantern there were there were there are a hundred thousand more of them volpate at last concluded in confusion but the men who were paying for the safety of the others with their strength and their lives enjoyed the wrath that choked him that brought him to bay in his corner and overwhelmed him with the apparitions of shirkers lucky he doesn't start talking about the factory hands who've served their apprenticeship in the war and all those who've stayed at home under the excuse of national defence that was put on its feet in five sects murmured tourette he'd keep us going with them till doomsday you say there are a hundred thousand of them flea bite chaffed barquet well in nineteen fourteen do you hear me milleron the war minister said to the m p s there are no shirkers milleron growled volpate i tell you i don't know the man but if he said that he's a dirty sloven sure enough one is always said bertrand a shirker to someone else 
that's true no matter what you call yourself you'll always always find worse blackguards and better blackguards than yourself all those that never go up to the trenches are those who never go into the first line and even those who only go there now and then they're shirkers if you like to call em so and you'd see how many there are if they only gave stripes to the real fighters there are two hundred and fifty to each regiment of two battalions said cocon there are the orderlies and a bit since there were even the servants of the adjutants the cooks and the undercooks the sergeant majors and the quartermaster sergeants as often as not the mess corporals and the mess fatigues some office props and the guard of the colours the baggage masters the drivers the labourers and all the section with all its non-coms and even the sappers the cyclists not all of them nearly all the red cross service not the stretcher bearers of course for they've not only got a devilish rotten job but they live with the companies and when attacks are on they charge with their stretchers but the hospital attendants nearly all parsons especially at the rear for you know parsons with knapsacks on i haven't seen a devil of a lot of em have you nor me either in the papers but not here there are some it seems ah anyway the common soldiers taken something on in this war there are others that are in the open we're not the only ones we are said Tulacque sharply we're almost the only ones he added you may say i know well enough what you'll tell me that it was the motor lorries and the heavy artillery that brought it off at verdun it's true but they've got a soft job all the same by the side of us we're always in danger against their once and we've got the bullets and the bombs too that they haven't the heavy artillery reared rabbits near their dugouts and they've been making themselves omelettes for eighteen months we are really in danger those that only get a bit of it or only once aren't in it at all otherwise everybody would be the nursemaids strolling the streets of paris would be too since there are the taubes and the zeppelins as that pudding had said that the pal was talking about just now in the first expedition to the dardanelles there was actually a chemist wounded by a shell you don't believe me but it's true all the same an officer with green facings wounded that's chance as i wrote to magust driver of a remount horse for the section that got wounded but it was done by a motor lorry that's it it's like that after all a bomb can tumble down on a pavement in paris or in bordeaux oui oui so it's too easy to say don't let's make distinctions in danger wait a bit since the beginning there are some of those others who've got killed by an unlucky chance among us there are some that are still alive by a lucky chance it isn't the same thing that seeing that when you're dead it's for a long time yes says tourette but you're getting too venomous with your stories of shirkers as long as we can't help it it's time to turn over i'm thinking of a retired forest ranger at chery where we were last month who went about the streets of the town spying everywhere to rout out some civilian of military age and he smelled out the dodgers like a mastiff behold him pulling up in front of a sturdy good wife that had a moustache and he only sees her moustache so he bully rags her why aren't you at the front you for my part says papin i don't fret myself about the shirkers or the semi shirkers it's wasting one's time but where they get on my nerves it's when they swank i'm of volpate's opinion let em shirk good that's human nature but afterwards they shouldn't say i've been a soldier take the engages for instance that depends on the engages those who have offered for the infantry without conditions i look up to those men as much as to those that have got killed but the engages in the departments or special arms even in the heavy artillery they begin to get my back up we know em when they're doing the agreeable in their social circle they'll say i've offered for the war ah what a fine thing you have done of your own free will you have defied the machine guns well yes madame la marquise i'm built like that eh get out of it humbug 
we oui, it's always the same tale they wouldn't be able to say in the drawing-rooms afterward tenez here i am look at me for a voluntary engage i know a gentleman who enlisted in the aerodromes he had a fine uniform he'd have done better to offer for the opera comique what am i saying he'd have done better he'd have done a damn sight better we oui. at least he'd have made other people laugh honestly instead of making them laugh with the spleen in it there are a lot of cheap china fresh painted and plastered with ornaments and all sorts of falderalls but they don't go under fire if there'd only been people like those the bocchus would be at bayonne when war's on one must risk his skin eh corporal yes said bertrand there are some times when duty and danger are exactly the same thing when the country when justice and liberty are in danger it isn't in taking shelter that you defend them on the contrary war means danger of death and sacrifice of life for everybody for everybody no one is sacred one must go for it upright right to the end and not pretend to do it in a fanciful uniform these services at the bases and they're necessary must be automatically guaranteed by the really weak and the really old besides there are too many rich and influential people who have shouted let us save france and begin by saving ourselves on the declaration of war there was a big rush to get out of it that's what there was and the strongest succeeded i noticed myself in my little corner it was especially those that jawed most about patriotism previously anyway as the others were saying just now if they get into a funk hole the worst filthiness they can do is to make people believe they've run risks cause those that have really run risks they deserve the same respect as the dead well what then it's always like that old man you can't change human nature it can't be helped grouse complain tiens talking about complaining did you know margoulin margoulin the good sort that was with us that they left to die at la crassier because they thought he was dead well he wanted to make a complaint every day he talked about protesting against all those things to the captain and the commandant he'd say after breakfast i'll go and say it as sure as that pint of wine's there and a minute later if i don't speak there's never a pint of wine there at all and if you were passing later you'd hear him again tiens is that a pint of wine there well you'll see if i don't speak result he said nothing at all you'll say but he got killed true but previously he had god's own time to do it two thousand times if he'd dared all that it makes me ill growled blair sullen but with a flash of fury we others we've seen nothing seeing that we don't see anything but if we did see old chap volpate cried those depots take notice of what i say you'd have to turn the seine the garonne the rhone and the loire into them to clean them in the interval they're living and they live well and they go to doze peacefully every night every night the soldier held his peace in the distance he saw the night as they would pass it cramped up trembling with vigilance in the deep darkness at the bottom of the listening hole whose ragged jaws showed in black outline all around whenever a gun hurled its dawn into the sky bitterly said cocon all that it doesn't give you any desire to die yes it does someone replies tranquilly yes it does don't exaggerate old kipperskin end of chapter nine the anger of volpate section eleven of under fire the story of a squad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by joseph mcwombie under fire the story of a squad by henri barbus translated by william fitzwalter ray chapter ten agoval the twilight of evening was coming near from the direction of the country and a gentle breeze soft as a whisper came with it in the houses alongside this rural way a main road 
garbled for a few paces like a main street. The rooms whose pallid windows no longer fed them with the limpidity of space found their own light from lamps and candles, so that the evening left them and went outside, and one saw light and darkness gradually changing places. On the edge of the village, towards the fields, some unladen soldiers were wandering, facing the breeze. We were ending the day in peace, and enjoying that idle ease whose happiness one only realises when one is really weary. It was fine weather. We were at the beginning of rest, and dreaming about it. Evening seemed to make our faces bigger before it darkened them, and they shone with the serenity of nature. Sergeant Swillart came to me, took my arm, and led me away. Come, he said, and I'll show you something. The approaches to the village abounded in rows of tall and tranquil trees, and we followed them along. Under the pressure of the breeze, their vast verdure yielded from time to time in slow majestic movements. Swillart went in front of me. He led me into a deep lane, which twisted about between high banks, and on each side grew a border of bushes, whose tops met each other. For some moments we walked in a bower of tender green. A last gleam of light, falling aslant across the lane, made points of bright yellow among the foliage, and round as gold coins. This is pretty, I said. He said nothing, but looked aside and hard. Then he stopped. It must be there. He made me climb up a bit of a track to a field, a great quadrangle within tall trees, and full of the scent of hay. Tian, I said, looking at the ground. It's all trampled here. There's been something to do. Come, said Swillart to me. He led me into the field, not far from its gate. There was a group of soldiers there, talking in low voices. My companion stretched out his hand. It's there, he said. A very short post, hardly a yard high, was implanted a few paces from the hedge, composed just there of young trees. It was there, he said, that they shot a soldier of the 204th this morning. They planted that post in the night. They brought the chap here at dawn, and these are the fellows of his squad who killed him. He tried to dodge the trenches. During relief he stayed behind, and then went quietly off to quarters. He did nothing else. They meant, no doubt, to make an example of him. We came near to the conversation of the others. No, no, not at all, said one. He wasn't a ruffian. He wasn't one of those toughs that we all know. We all enlisted together. He was a decent sort, like ourselves. No more, no less. A bit funky, that's all. He was in the front line from the beginning. He was, and I've never seen him boozed. I haven't. Yes, but all must be told. Unfortunately for him, there was a previous conviction. There were two, you know, that did the trick. The other got two years. But Keja, because of the sentence he got in civil life, couldn't benefit by extenuating circumstances. He'd done some giddy-goat trick in civil life, when he was drunk. You can see a little blood on the ground if you look, said a stooping soldier. There was the whole ceremonial, another went on. From A to Z, the colonel on horseback, the degradation, then they tied him to the little post, the cattle stoop. He had to be forced to kneel or sit on the ground with a similar post. It's past understanding, said a third, after a silence. If it wasn't for the example the sergeant spoke about... On the post the soldiers had scrawled inscriptions and protests. A croix de guerre, cut clumsily out of wood, was nailed to it and read, A. Kujia, mobilised in August 1914, in gratitude to France. Returning to quarters, I met Volpat, still surrounded and talking. He was relating some new anecdotes of his journey among the happy ones. End of chapter 10 Recording by Joseph McWombie Section 12 of Under Fire, The Story of a Squad This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Lynn Thompson Under Fire the Story of a Squad by Henri Barbousse, translated by William Fitzwater Ray. Chapter 11. The Dog The weather was appalling. 
water and wind attacked the passer-by riddled flooded and upheaved the roads i was returning from fatigue to our quarters at the far end of the village the landscape that morning showed dirty yellow through the solid rain and the sky was dark as a slated roof the downpour flogged the horse trough as with birchen rods along the walls human shapes went in shrinking files stooping abashed splashing in spite of the rain and the cold and bitter wind a crowd had gathered in front of the door of the barn where we were lodging all close together and back to back the men seemed from a distance like a great moving sponge those who could see over shoulders and between heads opened their eyes wide and said he has a nerve the boy then the inquisitive ones broke away with red noses and streaming faces into the downpour that lashed and the blast that bit and letting the hands fall that they had upraised in surprise they plunged them in their pockets in the centre and running with rain abode the cause of the gathering fouillard bare to the waist and washing himself in abundant water thin as an insect working his long slender arms in riotous frenzy he soaped and splashed his head neck and chest down to the upstanding gridirons of his sides over his funnel-shaped cheeks the brisk activity had spread a flaky beard like snow and piled on the top of his head a greasy fleece that the rain was puncturing with little holes by way of a tub the patient was using three mess tins which he had filled with water no one knew how in a village where there was none and as there was no clean spot anywhere to put anything down in that universal streaming of earth and sky he thrust his towel into the waistband of his trousers while the soap went back into his pocket every time he used it they who still remained wondered at his heroic gesticulation in the face of adversity and said again as they wagged their heads it's a disease of cleanliness he's got you know he's going to be carpeted they say for that affair of the shell hole with volpat and they mixed the two exploits together in a muddled way that of the shell hole and the present and looked on him as the hero of the moment while he puffed sniffled grunted spat and tried to dry himself under the celestial shower bath with rapid rubbing and as a measure of deception then at last he resumed his clothes after his wash fouillard feels cold he turns about and stands in the doorway of the barn that shelters us the arctic blast discolours and disparages his long face so hollow and sunburned it draws tears from his eyes and scatters them on the cheeks once scorched by the mistral his nose too weeps increasingly yielding to the ceaseless bite of the wind that grips his ears in spite of the muffler knotted round his head and the calves in spite of the yellow puttees with which his cockerel legs are enwound he re-enters the barn but comes out of it again at once rolling ferocious eyes and muttering oaths with the accent one hears in that corner of the land over six hundred miles from here whence he was driven by war so he stands outside erect more truly excited than ever before in these northern scenes and the wind comes and steals into him and comes again roughly shaking and maltreating his scarecrow's slight and fleshless figure ye gods it is almost uninhabitable the barn they have assigned to us to live in during this period of rest it is a collapsing refuge gloomy and leaky confined as well one half of it is under water we see rats swimming in it and the men are crowded in the other half the walls composed of laths stuck together with dried mud are cracked sunken holed in all their circuit and extensively broken through above the night we got here until the morning we plugged as well as we could the openings within reach by inserting leafy branches and hurdles but the higher holes and those in the roof still gaped and always when dawn hovers there weakling and early the wind for contrast rushes in and blows round every side with all its strength 
and the squad endures the hustling of an everlasting draught when we are there we remain upright in the ruined obscurity groping shivering complaining fouillard who has come in once more goaded by the cold regrets his ablutions he has pains in his loins and back he wants something to do but what sit down impossible it is too dirty inside there the ground and the paving stones are plastered with mud the straw scattered from our sleeping is soaked through by the water that comes through the holes and by the boots that wipe themselves with it besides if you sit down you freeze and if you lie on the straw you are troubled by the smell of manure and sickened by the vapours of ammonia fouillard contents himself by looking at his place and yawning wide enough to dislocate his long jaw further lengthened by a goatee beard where you would see white hairs if the daylight were really daylight the other pals and boys said martereau they're no better off than we are after breakfast i went to see a jailbird of the eleventh on the farm near the hospital you've to clamber over a wall by a ladder that's too short talk about a scissor cut says martereau who is short in the leg and when once you're in the hen run and rabbit hutch you're shoved and poked by everybody and a nuisance to em all you don't know where to put your pasties down i've a moose from there and sharp for my part says cocon i wanted to go to the blacksmith's when we'd got quit of grubbing to imbibe something hot and pay for it yesterday he was selling coffee but some bobbies called there this morning so the good man's got the shakes and he's locked his door lamuse has tried to clean his rifle but one cannot clean his rifle here even if he squats on the ground near the door nor even if he takes away the sodden tent cloth hard and icy which hangs across the doorway like a stalactite it is too dark and then old chap if you let a screw fall you may as well hang yourself as try to find it especially when your fists are frozen silly as for me i ought to be sewing some things but what cheer one alternative remains to stretch oneself on the straw covering the head with handkerchief or towel to isolate it from the searching stench of fermenting straw and sleep fouillard master of his time to-day being on neither guard nor fatigues decides he lights a taper to seek among his belongings and unwinds the coils of his comforter and we see his emaciated shape sculptured in black relief folding and refolding it potato fatigue inside there my little lambs a sonorous voice bellows at the door the hooded shape from which it comes is sergeant Onrio. he is a malignant sort of simpleton and though all the while joking in clumsy sympathy he supervises the evacuation of quarters with a sharp eye for the evasive malingerer outside on the streaming road in the perpetual rain the second section is scattered also summoned and driven to work by the adjutant the two sections mingle together we climb the street and the hillock of clayey soil where the travelling kitchen is smoking now then my lads get on with it it isn't a long job when everybody sets to come what have you got to grumble about you that does no good twenty minutes later we return at a trot as we grope about in the barn we cannot touch anything but what is sodden and cold and the sour smell of wet animals is added to the vapour of the liquid manure that our beds contain we gather again standing around the props that hold the barn up and around the rills that fall vertically from the holes in the roof faint columns which rest on vague bases of splashing water here we are again we cry two lumps in turn block the doorway soaked with the rain that drains from them lamuse and bark who have been in quest of a brazier and now return from the expedition empty-handed sullen and vicious not a shadow of a fire bucket and what's more no wood or coal either not for a fortune it is impossible to have any fire if i can't get any no one can says bark with a pride which a hundred exploits justify we stay motionless or move slowly in the little space we have 
aghast at so much misery. "'Whose is the paper?' "'It's mine,' says Becu. "'What does it say?' "'Ah, zoot! One can't read in this darkness.' "'It says they've done everything necessary now for the soldiers to keep them warm in the trenches. "'They've got all they want, and blankets and shirts and braziers and fire buckets and buckets full of coal, "'and that it's like that in the first-line trenches.' "'That yeah, damnation!' growl some of the poor prisoners of the barn and they shake their fists at the emptiness without, and at the newspaper itself. But Fouillard has lost interest in what they say. He has bent his long Don Quixote carcass down in the shadow, and outstretched the lean neck that looks as if it were braided with violin strings. There is something on the ground that attracts him. It is Labrie, the other squad's dog, an uncertain sort of mongrel sheep-dog with a lopped tail, curled up on a tiny litter of straw dust. Fouillard looks at Labrie, and Labrie at him. Becouille comes up and says, with an intonation of the Lille district, he won't eat his food, the dog isn't well. Hey, Labrie, what's the matter with you? There's your bread and meat. Eat it up. It's good when it's in your bucket. He's poorly. One of these mornings we shall find him dead. Labrie is not happy. The soldier to whom he is entrusted is hard on him, and usually ill-treats him, when he takes any notice of him at all. The animal is tied up all day. It is cold and ill, and left to himself. He only exists. From time to time, when there is movement going on around him, he has hopes of going out, rises and stretches himself, and bestirs his tail to incipient demonstration but he is disillusioned and lies down again gazing past his nearly full mess tin he is weary and disgusted with life even if he has escaped the bullet or bomb to which he is as much exposed as we he will end by dying here fouillard puts his thin hand on the dog's head and it gazes at him again their two glances are alike the only difference is that one comes from above and the other from below Fouillard sits down also, the worse for him, in a corner, his hands covered by the folds of his greatcoat, his long legs doubled up like a folding bed. He is dreaming, his eyes closed under their bluish lids. There is something that he sees again. It is one of those moments when the country from which he is divided assumes in the distance the charms of reality, the perfumes and colours of Leroux, the streets of set he sees so plainly and so near that he hears the noise of the chalots in the canal du midi and the unloading at the docks and their call to him is distinctly clear above the road where the scent of thyme and immortel is so strong that it is almost a taste in the mouth in the heart of the sunshine whose winging shafts stir the air into a warmed and scented breeze on mont saint clair blossoms and flourishes the home of his folks up there one can see with the same glance where the lake of tau which is green like glass joins hands with the mediterranean sea which is azure and sometimes one can make out as well in the depths of the indigo sky the carven phantoms of the pyrenees there he was born there he grew up happy and free there he played on the golden or ruddy ground, played even at soldiers. The eager joy of wielding a wooden sabre flushed the cheek now sunken and seamed. He opens his eyes, looks about him, shakes his head, and falls upon regret for the days when glory and war to him were pure, lofty, and sunny things. The man puts his hand over his eyes to retain the vision within. Nowadays it is different. It was up there in the same place later that he came to know Clemence. She was just passing the first time, sumptuous with sunshine, and so fair that the loose sheaf of straw she carried in her arms seemed to him nut brown by contrast. The second time she had a friend with her, and they both stopped to watch him. He heard them whispering, and turned towards them. Seeing themselves discovered, 
the two young women made off with a sibilance of skirts and giggles like the cry of a partridge and it was there too that he and she together set up their home over its front travels a vine which he coddled under a straw hat whatever the season by the garden gate stands the rose tree that he knows so well it never used its thorns except to try to hold him back a little as he went by will he return again to it all ah he has looked too deeply into the profundity of the past not to see the future in appalling accuracy he thinks of the regiment decimated at each shift of the big knocks and hard he has had and will have of sickness and of wear he gets up and snorts as though to shake off what was and what will be he is back in the middle of the gloom and is frozen and swept by the wind among the scattered and dejected men who blindly await the evening he is back in the present and he is shivering still two paces of his long legs make him butt into a group that is talking by way of diversion or consolation of good cheer at my place says one they make enormous loaves round ones big as cartwheels they are and the man amuses himself by opening his eyes wide so that he can see the loaves of his homeland where i come from interposes the poor southerner holiday feasts last so long that the bread that's new at the beginning is stale at the end there's a jolly wine it doesn't look much that little wine where i come from but if it hasn't fifteen degrees of alcohol it hasn't anything fouillard speaks then of a red wine which is almost violet which stands dilution as well as if it had been brought into the world to that end we've got the jurançon wine says a bernais the real thing not what they sell you for jurançon which comes from paris indeed i know one of the makers if it comes to that said fouillard in our country we've got muscatels of every sort all the colours of the rainbow like patterns of silk stuff you come home with me some time and every day you shall taste a non such my boy sounds like a wedding feast said the grateful soldier so it comes about that fouillard is agitated by the vinous memories into which he has plunged which recall to him as well the dear perfume of garlic of that far-off table the vapours of the blue wine in big bottles and the liqueur wine so delicately varied mount to his head amid the sluggish and mournful storm that fills the barn suddenly he calls to mind that there is settled in the village where they are quartered a tavern keeper who is a native of Béziers, called Magnac. Magnac had said to him, Come and see me, mon comrade, one of these mornings, and we'll drink some wine from down there. We will. I've several bottles of it, and you shall tell me what you think of it. This sudden prospect dazzles Fouillard. Through all his length runs a thrill of delight, as though he had found the way of salvation. Drink the wine of the South, of his own particular south even drink much of it it would be so good to see life rosy again if only for a day ah yes he wants wine and he gets drunk in a dream but as he goes out he collides at the entry with corporal broyer who is running down the street like a peddler and shouting at every opening morning parade the company assembles and forms in squares on the sticky mound where the travelling kitchen is sending soot into the rain i'll go and have a drink after parade says fouillard to himself and he listens listlessly full of his plan to the reading of the report but carelessly as he listens he hears the officer read it is absolutely forbidden to leave quarters before five p m and after eight p m and he hears the captain without noticing the murmur that runs round the poilus add this comment on the order this is divisional headquarters however many there are of you don't show yourselves keep under cover if the general sees you in the street he will have you put to fatigues at once he must not see a single soldier stay where you are all day in your quarters do what you like as long as no one sees you no one we go back into the barn two o'clock it is three hours yet and then it will be totally dark 
before one may risk going outside without being punished. Shall we sleep while waiting? Fouillard is sleepy no longer. The hope of wine has shaken him up. And then, if one sleeps in the day, he will not sleep at night. No, to lie with your eyes open is worse than a nightmare. The weather gets worse. Wind and rain increase, without and within. Then what? If one may not stand still, nor sit down, nor lie down, nor go for a stroll, nor work, what? Deepening misery settles on the party of benumbed and tired soldiers. They suffer to the bone, nor know what to do with their bodies. Nom de Dieu, we're badly off, is the cry of the derelicts, a lamentation, an appeal for help. Then, by instinct, they give themselves up to the only occupation possible to them in there, to walk up and down on the spot, and thus ward off anchylosis. So they begin to walk quickly to and fro in the scanty place that three strides might compass. They turn about and cross and brush each other, bent forward, hands pocketed, tramp, tramp. These human beings, whom the blast cuts even among their straw, are like a crowd of the wretched wrecks of cities who await, under the lowering sky of winter, the opening of some charitable institution, but no door will open for them, unless it be four days hence, one evening at the end of the rest, to return to the trenches. Alone in a corner, Cocon cowers. He is tormented by lice, but weakened by the cold and wet, he has not the pluck to change his linen, and he sits there sullen, unmoving, and devoured. As five o'clock draws near, in spite of all, Fouillard begins again to intoxicate himself with his dream of wine, and he waits, with its gleam in his soul. What time is it? A quarter to five. Five minutes to five. Now! He is outside in black night. With great splashing skips he makes his way toward the tavern of Magnac the generous and communicative Biterrois, only with great trouble does he find the door in the dark and the inky rain. By God, there is no light. Great God, again, it is closed. The gleam of a match that his great lean hand covers, like a lampshade, shows him the fateful notice. Out of bounds. Magnac, guilty of some transgression, has been banished into gloom and idleness. Fouillard turns his back on the tavern that has become the prison of its lonely keeper. He will not give up his dream. He will go somewhere else and have Van Ordinaire, and pay for it, that's all. He puts his hand in his pocket to sound his purse. It is there. There ought to be thirty-seven sous in it, which will not run to the wine of Prue, but... But suddenly he starts, stops dead, and smites himself on the forehead. His long-drawn face is contracted in a frightful grimace, masked by the night. No, he no longer has thirty-seven sous, fool that he is. He has forgotten the tin of sardines that he bought the night before. So disgusting did he find the dark macaroni of the soldier's mess, and the drinks he stood to the cobbler who put him some nails in his boots. Misery! There could not be more than thirteen sous, left to get as elevated as one ought and to avenge himself on the life of the moment he would certainly need damnation a litre and a half in this place a litre of red ordinary costs twenty-one sous it won't go his eyes wander around him in the darkness looking for someone perhaps there is a pal somewhere who will lend him money or stand him a litre but who who? Not Becu. He has only a marraine, who sends him tobacco and note-paper every fortnight. Not Bark, who would not toe the line. Nor Blair, the miser. He wouldn't understand. Not Biquet, who seems to have something against him. Nor Pepin, who himself begs and never pays, even when he is host. Ah, if Volpat were here. There is Mesnil André, but he is actually in debt to Fouillard on account of several drinks round. Corporal Bertrand? Following on a remark of Fouillard's, Bertrand told him to go to the devil, 
and now they look at each other sideways. Farfadet? Fouillard hardly speaks a word to him in the ordinary way. No, he feels that he cannot ask this of Farfadet. And then, a thousand thunders, what is the use of seeking saviours in one's imagination? Where are they, all these people, at this hour? Slowly he goes back towards the barn. Then mechanically he turns and goes forward again, with hesitating steps. He will try all the same. Perhaps he can find convivial comrades. He approaches the central part of the village, just when night has buried the earth. The lighted doors and windows of the taverns shine again in the mud of the main street. There are taverns every twenty paces. One dimly sees the heavy spectres of soldiers, mostly in groups, descending the street. When a motor-car comes along, they draw aside to let it pass, dazzled by the headlights and bespattered by the liquid mud that the wheels hurl over the whole width of the road. The taverns are full. Through the steamy windows one can see they are packed with compact clouds of helmeted men. Fouillard goes into one or two, on chance. Once over the threshold, the dram-shop's tepid breath, the light, the smell, and the hubbub affect him with longing. This gathering at tables is at least a fragment of the past in the present. He looks from table to table and disturbs the groups as he goes up to scrutinise all the merrymakers in the room. Alas, he knows no one. Elsewhere it is the same. He has no luck. In vain he has extended his neck and sent his desperate glances in search of a familiar head among the uniformed men who in clumps or couples drink and talk or in solitude write. He has the air of a cadger, and no one pays him heed. Finding no soul to come to his relief, he decides to invest at least what he has in his pocket. He slips up to the counter. A pint of wine, and good. White? Eh, oui. You, mon garçon, you're from the south, says the landlady, handing him a little full bottle and a glass, and gathering his twelve sous. He places himself at the corner of a table already overcrowded by four drinkers, who are united in a game of cards. He fills the glass to the brim and empties it, then fills it again. "'Hey, good help to you! Don't drink the tumbler!' yelps in his face a man who arrives in the dirty blue jumper of fatigues and displays a heavy crossbar of eyebrows across his pale face, a conical head and half a pound's weight of ears. It is Harlang, the armourer. It is not very glorious to be seated alone before a pint in the presence of a comrade who gives signs of thirst, but Fouillard pretends not to understand the requirements of the gentleman who dallies in front of him with an engaging smile, and he hurriedly empties his glass. The other turns his back, not without grumbling that they're not very generous, but on the contrary greedy, these southerners. Fouillard has put his chin on his fists and looks unseeing at a corner of the room where the crowded poilus elbow, squeeze, and jostle each other to get by. It was pretty good, that swig of white wine, but of what use are those few drops in the Sahara of Fouillard? The blues did not far recede, and now they return. The southerner rises and goes out with his two glasses of wine in his stomach and one sou in his pocket, he plucks up courage to visit one more tavern, to plumb it with his eyes, and by way of excuse to mutter as he leaves the place, "'Curse him! He's never there, the animal!' Then he returns to the barn, which still, as always, whistles with wind and water. Fouillard lights his candle, and by the glimmer of the flame that struggles desperately to take wing and fly away, he sees La Brie. He stoops low, with his light over the miserable dog. Perhaps it will die first. La Brie is sleeping, but feebly, for he opens an eye at once, and his tail moves. The southerner strokes him, and says to him in a low voice, It can't be helped. He will not say more to sadden him, but the dog signifies appreciation by jerking his head before closing his eyes again. Fouillard rises stiffly by reason of his rusty joints and makes for his couch. For only one thing more, 
he is now hoping to sleep that the dismal day may die that wasted day like so many others that there will be to endure stoically and to overcome before the last day arrives of the war or of his life End of chapter 11section thirteen of under fire the story of a squad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org under fire the story of a squad by henri barbus translated by william fitzwater ray chapter twelve the doorway part one it's foggy would you like to go it is potterloo who asks as he turns towards me and shows eyes so blue they make his fine fair head seem transparent potterloo comes from souchet and now that the chasseurs have at last retaken it he wants to see again the village where he lived happily in the days when he was only a man it is a pilgrimage of peril not that we should have far to go souchet is just there for six months we have lived and worked in the trenches almost within hail of the village we have only to climb straight from here on to the bethune road along which the trench creeps the road honeycombed underneath by our shelters and descend it for four or five hundred yards as it dips down towards souchet but all that ground is under regular and terrible attention since their recoil the germans have constantly sent huge shells into it their thunder shakes us in our caverns from time to time and we see high above the scarps now here now there the great black geysers of earth and rubbish and the piled columns of smoke as high as churches why do they bombard souchet one cannot say why for there is no longer anybody or anything in the village so often taken and retaken that we have so fiercely wrested from each other but this morning a dense fog enfolds us and by favour of the great curtain that the sky throws over the earth one might risk it we are sure at least of not being seen the fog hermetically closes the perfect retina of the sausage that must be somewhere up there enshrouded in the white wadding that raises its vast wall of partition between our lines and those observation posts of lens and angres whence the enemy spies upon us right you are i say to Paterloo. adjutant barth informed of our project wags his head up and down and lowers his eyelids in token that he does not see we hoist ourselves out of the trench and behold us both upright on the bethune road it is the first time i've walked there during the day i've never seen it except from afar the terrible road that we have so often travelled or crossed in leaps bowed down in the darkness and under the whistling of missiles well are you coming old man after some paces Pantaloo had stopped in the middle of the road where the fog-like cotton wool unravels itself into pendant fragments and there he dilates his sky-blue eyes and half opens his scarlet mouth ah la la ah la la he murmurs when i turn to him he points to the road shakes his head and says this is it bon dieu to think this is it this bit where we are i know it so well that if i shut my eyes i can see it as it was exactly old chap it's awful to see it again like that it was a beautiful road planted all the way along with big trees and now what is it look at it a sort of long thing without a soul sad sad look at these two trenches on each side alive this ripped up paving bored with funnels uh, these trees uprooted split scorched broken like faggots thrown all ways pierced by bullets look this pockmarked pestilence here ah oh, my boy my boy you can't imagine how it is disfigured this road and he goes forward seeing some new amazement at every step 
It is a fantastic road enough, in truth. On both sides of it are crouching armies, and their missiles have mingled on it for a year and a half. It is a great disheveled highway, travelled only by bullets and by ranks and files of shells that have furrowed and upheaved it, covered it with earth of the fields, scooped it, and laid bare its bones. It might be under a curse. It is a way of no colour, burned and old, sinister and awful to see. If you'd only known it, how clean and smooth it was, says Potterloo all sorts of trees were there and leaves and colors like butterflies and there was always some one passing on to give good day to some good woman rocking between two baskets or people shouting to each other in a chaise with a good wind ballooning their smocks ah how happy life was once on a time he dives down to the banks of the misty stream that follows the roadway towards the land of the parapets stooping he stops by some faint swellings of the ground on which crosses are fixed tombs recessed at intervals into the wall of fog like the stations of the cross in a church i call him we shall never get there at such a funeral pace alons we come to a wide depression in the land i in front and potterloo lagging behind his head confused and heavy with thought as he tries in vain to exchange with inanimate things his glances of recognition just there the road is lower a fold secretes it from the side towards the north on this sheltered ground there is a little traffic along the hazy filthy and unwholesome space where withered grass is embedded in black mud there are rows of dead they are carried there when the trenches or the plain are cleared during the night. They are waiting, some of them have waited long, to be taken back to the cemeteries after dark. We approach them slowly. They are close against each other, and each one indicates with arms or legs some different posture of stiffened agony. There are some with half mouldy faces, the skin rusted or yellow with dark spots. Of several, the faces are black as tar, the lips hugely distended, the heads of negroes blown out in gold-beater's skin. Between two bodies, protruding uncertainly from one or the other, is a severed wrist, ending with a cluster of strings. Others are shapeless larvae of pollution, with dubious items of equipment pricking up, or bits of bone. Farther on, a corpse has been brought in such a state that they have been obliged, so as not to lose it on the way, to pile it on a lattice of wire which was then fastened to the two ends of a stake, and thus it was carried in the hollow of its metal hammock and laid there. You cannot make out either end of the body, alone, in the heap that it makes. One recognizes the gape of a trouser pocket. An insect goes in and out of it. Around the dead flutter letters that have escaped from pockets or cartridge pouches while they were being placed on the ground. Over one of these bits of white paper, whose wings still beat, though the mud ensnares them, I stoop slightly and read a sentence. My dear Henry, what a fine day it is for your birthday. The man is on his belly. His loins are rent from hip to hip by a deep furrow. His head is half turned round. We see a sunken eye, and on temples, cheek, and neck, a kind of green moss is growing. A sickening atmosphere roams with the wind around these dead and the heaped-up debris that lies about them, tent cloth or clothing in stained tatters, stiff with dried blood, charred by the scorch of the shell, hardened, earthy, and already rotting quick with swarming and questing things. It troubles us. We look at each other and shake our heads, nor dare admit aloud that the place smells bad. All the same, we go away slowly. Now come breaking out of the fog the bowed backs of men who are joined together by something they are carrying. They are territorial stretcher-bearers with a new corpse. They come up with their old wan faces, toiling, sweating, and grimacing with the effort. To carry a dead man in the lateral trenches when they are muddy 
is a work almost beyond human power. They put down the body which is dressed in new clothes. It's not long since now that he was standing, says one of the bearers. It's two hours since he got his bullet in the head for going to look for a Bosch rifle in the plain. He was going on leave on Wednesday and wanted to take a rifle home with him. He is a sergeant of the 405th, class 1914. A nice lad, too. He takes away the handkerchief that is over the face. It is quite young and seems to sleep, except that an eyeball has gone. The cheek looks waxen and a rosy liquid has run over the nostrils, mouth and eyes. The body strikes a note of cleanliness in the charnel house, this still pliant body that lulls its head aside when it is moved as if to lie better. It gives a childish illusion of being less dead than the others, but being less disfigured it seems more pathetic, nearer to one, more intimate as we look. And had we said anything in the presence of all that heap of beings destroyed, it would have been poor boy we take the road again which at this point begins to slope down to the depth where suchet lies under our feet in the whiteness of the fog it appears like a valley of frightful misery the piles of rubbish of remains and of filthiness accumulate on the shattered spine of the road's paving and on its miry borders in final confusion the trees bestrew the ground or have disappeared torn away their stumps mangled the banks of the road are overturned and overthrown by shell-fire, all the way along on both sides of this highway, where only the crosses remain standing, are trenches twenty times blown in, and re-hollowed cavities, some with passages into them, hurdles on quagmires. The more we go forward, the more is everything turned terribly inside out, full of putrefaction, cataclysmic. We walk on a surface of shell fragments, and the foot trips on them at every step. We go among them as if they were snares, and stumble in the medley of broken weapons or bits of kitchen utensils, of water bottles, fire buckets, sewing machines, among the bundles of electrical wiring, the French and German accoutrements all mutilated and encrusted in dried mud and among the sinister piles of clothing stuck together with a reddish-brown cement and one must look out too for the unexploded shells which everywhere protrude their noses or reveal their flanks or their bases painted red blue and tawny brown that's the old bosch trench that they cleared out of in the end it is choked up in some places and others riddled with shell holes the sandbags have been torn asunder and gutted they are crumbled emptied scattered to the wind the wooden props and beams are splintered and point all ways. The dugouts are filled to the brim with earth and with no one knows what. It is all like the dried bed of a river, smashed, extended, slimy, that both water and men have abandoned. In one place the trench has been simply wiped out by the guns. The wide fosse is blocked and remains no more than a field of new-turned earth, made of holes symmetrically bored side by side in length and in breadth i point out to parolu this extraordinary field that would seem to have been traversed by a giant plough but he is absorbed to his very vitals in the metamorphosis of the country's face he indicates a space in the plain with his finger and with a stupefied air as though he came out of a dream the red tavern it is a flat field carpeted with broken bricks. And what is that there? A milestone. No, it is not a milestone. It is a head, a black head, tanned and polished. The mouth is all askew, and you can see something of the moustache bristling on each side. The great head of a carbonized cat. The corpse, it is German, is underneath, buried upright. And that? It is a ghastly collection containing an entirely white skull, and then, six feet away, a pair of boots, and between the two, a heap of frayed leather and of rags cemented by brown mud. Come on, there's less fog already, we must hurry. A hundred yards in front of us, among the more transparent waves of fog that are changing places with us and hide us less and less, 
a shell whistles and bursts it has fallen in the spot we are just nearing we are descending and the gradient is less steep we go side by side my companion says nothing but looks to right and to left and then he stops again as he did at the top of the road i hear his faltering voice almost inaudible what's this we're there this is it in point of fact we have not left the plain the vast plain seared and barren but we are in Suchet. the village has disappeared nor have i seen a village go so completely a blonde saint nazir and currency these still retain some shape of a place with their collapsed and truncated houses their yards heaped high with plaster and tiles here within the framework of slaughtered trees that surrounds us as a spectral background in the fog there is no longer any shape there is not even an end of wall fence or porch that remains standing and it amazes one to discover that there are paving stones under the tangle of beams stones and scrap iron this here was a street it might have been a dirty and boggy waste near a big town whose rubbish of demolished buildings and its domestic refuse had been shot here for years till no spot was empty we plunge into a uniform layer of dung and debris and make but slow and difficult progress the bombardment has so changed the face of things that it has diverted the course of the mill stream which now runs haphazard and forms a pond on the remains of the little place where the cross stood here are several shell holes where swollen horses are rotting in others the remains of what were once human beings are scattered distorted by the monstrous injury of shells here athwart the track we are following that we ascend as through an avalanche of inundation of ruin under the unbroken melancholy of the sky here is a man stretched out as if he slept but he has that close flattening against the ground which distinguishes a dead man from a sleeper he is a dinner fatigue man with a chaplet of loaves threaded over a belt and a bunch of his comrades water bottles slung on his shoulder by a skein of straps it must have been only last night that the fragment of a shell caught him in the back no doubt we are the first to find him this unknown soldier secretly dead perhaps he will be scattered before others find him so we look for his identity disc it is stuck in a clotted blood where his right hand stagnates i copy down the name that is written in letters of blood potterloo lets me do it by myself he is like a sleepwalker he looks and looks in despair everywhere he seeks endlessly among those evanished and eviscerated things through the void he gazes to the haze of the horizon and then he sits down on a beam having first sent flying with a kick a saucepan that lay on it and i sit by his side a light drizzle is falling the fog's moisture is resolving in little drops that cover everything with a slight gloss he murmurs Allah, Allah He wipes his forehead and raises imploring eyes to me He's trying to make out and to take in the destruction of all this corner of the earth and the mournfulness of it He stammers disjointed remarks and interjections He takes off his great helmet and his head is smoking and then he says to me with difficulty Old man you cannot imagine you you cannot you cannot he whispers the red tavern where that where that bosch's head is and litters of beastliness all around and that sort of cesspool it was on the edge of the road a brick house and two outbuildings alongside how many times old man on the very spot where we stood how many times there the good woman who joked with me on her doorstep i've given her good day as i wipe my mouth and look towards souchet that i was going back to and then after a few steps i've turned round to shout some nonsense to her oh you cannot imagine but that now that he makes an inclusive gesture to indicate all the emptiness that surrounds him we mustn't stay here too long old chap the fog's lifting you know he stands up with an effort alons the most serious part is yet to come 
his house. He hesitates, turns towards the east, goes. It's there. No, I've passed it. It's not there. I don't know where it is or where it was. Oh, misery, misery. He wrings his hands in despair and staggers in the middle of the medley of plaster and bricks. Then, bewildered by this encumbered plain of lost landmarks, he looks questioningly about in the air like a thoughtless child, like a madman. He's looking for the intimacy of the bedroom scattered in infinite space, for their inner form and their twilight now cast upon the winds. After several goings and comings, he stops at one spot and draws back a little. It was there, right there. Look, it's that stone there that I knew it by. There was a vent hole there. You can see the mark of the bar of iron that was over the hole before it disappeared. Sniffling, he reflects, and gently shaking his head, as though he could not stop it. It is when you no longer have anything that you understand how happy you were, Ah, uh, how happy we were! He comes up to me and laughs nervously. It's out of the common, that, eh? I'm sure you've never seen yourself like it. Can't find the house where you've always lived since, since always. He turns about, and it is he who leads me away. Well, let's leg it, since there is nothing. Why spend a whole hour looking at places where things were? Let's be off, old man. We depart. The only two living beings to be seen in that unreal and miasmal place, that village which bestrews the earth and lies under our feet. We climb again. The weather is clearing and the fog scattering quickly. My silent comrade, who is making great strides with lowered head, points out a field. The cemetery, he says. It was there before it was everywhere, before it laid hold on everything without end, like a plague. Halfway we go more slowly, and Potterloo comes close to me. You know, it's too much, all that. It's wiped out too much, all my life up to now. It makes me afraid. It is so completely wiped out. Come, your wife's in good health, you know, your little girl, too. He looks at me comically. My wife? I'll tell you something, my wife. Well... "'Well, old chap, I've seen her again.' "'You've seen her? I thought she was in the occupied country. "'Yes, she's at Lens with my relations. Well, I've seen her. Ah, and then, after all, zut! I'll tell you all about it. Well, I was at Lens three weeks ago. It was the eleventh. That's, that's twenty days since.' I look at him astounded, but he looks like one who is speaking the truth. He talks in sputters at my side as we walk in the increasing light. They told us, you remember, perhaps, but you weren't there, I believe. They told us the wire has got to be strengthened in front of the billard trench. You know what that means, eh? They hadn't been able to do it till then. As soon as one gets out of the trench, he's on a downward slope. That's got a funny name. The toboggan? Yes, that's it and the place is as bad by night or in fog as in broad daylight because of the rifles trained on it beforehand on trestles and the machine guns they point during the day when they can't see any more the boches sprinkle the lot they took the pioneers of the c h r but there were some missing and they replaced them with a few poilus i was one of them good we climb out not a single rifle shot what does it mean we say and behold, we see a Bosch, two Bosches, three Bosches, coming out of the ground, the grey devils, and they make signs to us and shout, Comrade, we're Alsatians, they says, coming more and more out of their communications trench, the international. They won't fire on you up there, they says. Don't be afraid, friends, just let us bury our dead. And behold us working aside of each other, and even talking together since they were from Alsace, and to tell the truth they groused about the war and about their officers. Our sergeant knew all right that it was forbidden to talk with the enemy, and that even read out to us that we were only to talk to them with our rifles. But the sergeant, he says to himself that this is God's own chance to strengthen the wire, and as long as they are letting us work against them, we just got to take advantage of it. Then behold one of the Boches that says, 
There isn't perhaps one of you that comes from the invaded country and would like news of his family. Old chap, that was a bit too much for me. Without thinking if I did right or wrong, I went up to him and said, yes, that's me. The Bosch asked me questions. I tell him my wife at Lens with her relations, and the little one, too. He asked where she's staying. I explained to him, and he says he can see it from there. Listen, he says, I'll take her a letter, and not only that, but I'll bring you an answer. And then all of a sudden he taps his forehead, the Bosch, and comes close to me. Listen, my friend, to a lot better still. If you like to do what I say, you shall see your wife and your kids as well, and all the lot, sure as I see you. He tells me to do it. I've only got to go with him at a certain time with a Bosch greatcoat and a shako that he'll have for me. He'll mix me up in a coal fatigue in Lens, and we'd go to our house. I could go and have a look on condition that I laid low and didn't show myself, and he'd be responsible for the chaps of the fatigue. But there were none comes in the house that he wouldn't answer for, and old chap, I agreed. That was serious. Yes, for sure it was serious. I decided all at once, without thinking and without wishing to think, seeing I was dazzled with the idea of seeing my people again. And if I got shot afterwards, well, so much the worse. But give and take. The supply of law and demand, they call it, don't they? My boy, it all went swimmingly. The only hitch was they had such hard work to find a shako big enough, for as you know I'm well off for head. But even that was fixed up. They raked me out in the end of a louse box big enough to hold my head. I've already some bosch boots, those that were Karen's, you know. So behold us setting off in the bosch trenches, and they're most damnably like ours, with these good sorts of bosch comrades who told me in very good French, same as I'm speaking, not to fret myself. There was no alarm, nothing. Getting there came off all right. Everything went off so sweet and simple that I fancied I must be a defaulting Bosch. We got to Lens at nightfall. I remember we passed in front of La Perche and went down the Rue du Quatorze Juillet. I saw some of the townsfolk walking about in the streets like they do in our quarters. I didn't recognize them because of the evening, nor them me because of the evening too, and because of the seriousness of things. It was so dark you couldn't put your finger into your eye when I reached my folks' garden. My heart was going top speed. I was all trembling from head to foot as if I were only a sort of heart myself, and I had to hold myself back from carrying on aloud and in French too. I was so happy and upset. The comrade says to me, You go, pass once, then another time, and look in at the door and the window. Don't look as if you were looking. Be careful. So I get hold of myself again and swallow my feelings all at a gulp. Not a bad sort, that devil, seeing he'd have a hell of a time if I got nailed. At our place, you know, same as everywhere in the Pas de Calais, the outside doors of the houses are cut in two at the bottom. It's a sort of barrier, halfway up your body and above you might call it a shutter, so you can shut the bottom half and be one half private. The top half was open, and the room, that's the dining room, and the kitchen as well, of course, was lighted up, and I heard voices. I went by with my neck twisted sideways. There were heads of men and women with a rosy light on them, round the round table and the lamp. My eyes fell on her, on Clotilde. I saw her plainly. She was sitting between two chaps, non-comes, I believe, and they were talking to her. And what was she doing? Nothing. She was smiling, and her face was prettily bent forward and surrounded with a light little framework of fair hair, and the lamp gave it a bit of a golden look. She was smiling. She was contented. She had a look of well-being off by the side of the Bosch officer, and the lamp and the fire that puffed an unfamiliar warmth out on me. I passed, and then I turned round and passed again. I saw her again, and she was always smiling, not a forced smile, not a debtor's smile, none, a real smile that came from her that she gave, and during that time of illumination that I passed in two senses, I could see my baby as well, stretching her hands out to a great striped simpleton and trying to climb on his knee, 
and then just by who do you think i recognized madeline vandart vandart's wife my pal of the nineteenth that was killed at the main at montian she knew he'd been killed because she was in mourning and she she was having good fun and laughing outright i tell you and she looked at one and the other as much as to say i'm all right here Ah, oh, my boy i cleared out of that and butted into the comrades that were waiting to take me back how i got back i couldn't tell you i was knocked out i went stumbling like a man under a curse and if anybody had said a wrong word to me just then i should have shouted out loud i should have made a row so as to get killed and be done with this filthy life do you catch on she was smiling my wife my clotilde at this time in the war and why have we only got to be away for a time for us not to count any more you take your damned hook from home to go to the war and everything seems finished with and they worry for a while that you're gone but bit by bit you become as if you didn't exist they can do without you to be as happy as they were before and to smile ah christ i'm not talking of the other woman that was laughing but my clotilde mine who at that chance moment when i saw her whatever you may say was getting on damned well without me and then if she'd been with friends or relations but no actually with bosch officers tell me shouldn't i have had good reason to jump into the room fetch her a couple of swipes and wring the neck of the other old hen in mourning yes yes i thought of doing it i know all right i was getting violent i was getting out of control mark me i don't want to say more about it than i have said she's a good lass clotilde i know her and i've confidence in her i'm not far wrong you know if i were done in she'd cry all the tears in her body to begin with she thinks i'm alive i admit but that isn't the point she can't prevent herself from being well off and contented and letting herself go when she's a good fire a good lamp and company whether i'm there or not i led potterloo away you exaggerate old chap you're getting absurd notions come we had walked very slowly and were still at the foot of the hill the fog was becoming like silver as it prepared for departure sunshine was very near end of chapter 12 Part 1、Section 14 of Under Fire The Story of a Squad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Under Fire, The Story of a Squad by Henri Barbousse, translated by William Fitzwater Ray. Chapter 12, The Door, Part 2. Potterloo looked up and said, We'll go round by the Carency Road and go in at the back. We struck off at an angle into the fields. At the end of a few minutes he said to me, i exaggerate you think you say that i exaggerate he reflected ah and then he added with a shaking of the head that had hardly left him all the morning what about it all the same it's a fact we climbed the slope the cold had become tepidity arrived on a little plateau let's sit here again before going on he proposed he sat down heavy with the world of thought that entangled him his forehead was wrinkled and then he turned towards me with an awkward air as if he were going to beg some favor tell me mate i'm wondering if i'm right but after looking at me he looked at everything else as though he would rather consult them than me a transformation was taking place in the sky and on the earth the fog was hardly more than a fancy distances revealed themselves the narrow plain gloomy and gray was getting bigger chasing its shadows away and assuming color the light was passing over it from east to west like sails and down there at our very feet by the grace of distance and of light we saw souchet among the trees 
the little place arose again before our eyes new-born in the sunshine am i right repeated potterloo more faltering more dubious before i could speak he replied to himself at first almost in a whisper as the light fell on him she's quite young you know she's twenty-six she can't hold her youth in it's coming out of her all over and when she's resting in the lamplight and the warmth she's got to smile and even if she burst out laughing it would just simply be her youth singing in her throat it isn't on account of others if truth were told it's on account of herself it's life she lives ah yes she lives and that's all it isn't her fault if she lives you wouldn't have her die very well what do you want her to do cry all day on account of me and the boches grouse one can't cry all the time nor grouse for eighteen months can't be done it's too long i tell you that's all there is to it he stops speaking to look at the view of notre dame de lorette now wholly illuminated same with the kid when she found herself alongside a simpleton that doesn't tell her to go and play with herself she ends by wanting to get on his knee perhaps she'd prefer that it was her uncle or a friend or her father perhaps but she tries it on all the same with the only man that's always there even if it is a great hog in spectacles ah he cries as he gets up and comes gesticulating before me there's a good answer one could give me if i didn't come back from the war i should say my lad you've gone to smash no more clotilde no more love you'll be replaced in her heart sooner or later no getting around it your memory the portrait of you that she carries in her that'll fade bit by bit and another come on top of it and she'll begin another life again ah if i didn't come back he laughs heartily but i mean to come back ah yes one must be there otherwise i must be there look you he says again more seriously otherwise if you're not there even if you're dealing with saints and angels you'll be at fault in the end that's life but i'm there he laughs well i'm a little there as one might say i get up too and tap him on the shoulder you're right old pal it'll all come to an end he rubs his hands and goes on talking yes by god it'll all finish don't worry oh i know well there'll be hard graft before it's finished and still more after we've got to work and i'd only mean work with the arms it'll be necessary to make everything over again very well we'll do it the house gone the garden nowhere all right we'll rebuild the house we'll remake the garden the less there is the more we'll make over again after all it's life and we're made to remake her eh? and we'll remake our life together and happiness we'll make the days again we'll remake the nights and the other side too they'll make their world again do you know what i say perhaps it won't be as long as one thinks tiens i can see madeline vandart marrying another chap she's a widow but old man she's been a widow eighteen months do you think it's not a big slice that eighteen months they even leave off wearing mourning i believe about that time people don't remember that when they say what a strumpet she is and when in effect they ask her to commit suicide but mon vieux one forgets one is forced to forget it isn't the people that make you forget you do it yourself it's just forgetfulness mind you i find madeline again all of a sudden and to see her frivling there it broke me up as much as if her husband had been killed yesterday it's natural but it's a devil of a long time since he got spiked poor lad it's a long time since it's too long since people are no longer the same but mark you one must come back one must be there we shall be there and we shall be busy with beginning again on the way he looks and winks cheered up by finding a peg on which to hang his ideas he says i can see it from here after the war all the souchet people setting themselves again to work and to life what a business tiens papa ponce for example the back number 
He was so persnickety that you could see him sweeping the grass in his garden with a horsehair brush, or kneeling on his lawn and trimming the turf with a pair of scissors. Very well, he'll treat himself to that again. And Madame Imaginaire, that lived in one of the last houses towards the Chateau de Carlol, a large woman who seemed to roll along the ground as if she'd got casters under her big circular petticoats. She had a child every year, regular, punctual, a proper machine gun of kids. Very well, she'll take that occupation up again with all her might. He stops and ponders and smiles a very little, almost within himself. Tiens, I tell you, I noticed it isn't very important, this, he insists, as though suddenly embarrassed by the triviality of this parenthesis. But I noticed, you notice it in a glance when you're noticing something else, that it was cleaner in our house than in my time. We come on some little rails on the ground, climbing almost hidden in the withered grass underfoot. Potterloo points out with his foot this bit of abandoned track and smiles. That, that's our railway. It was a cripple, as you may say. That means something that doesn't move. It didn't work very quickly. A snail could have kept pace with it. We shall remake it. But certainly it won't go any quicker. That can't be allowed. When we reached the top of the hill, Potterloo turned round and threw a last look over the slaughtered places that we had just visited. Even more than a minute ago, distance recreated the village across the remains of trees, shortened and sliced that now looked like young saplings. Better even than just now, the sun shed on that white and red accumulation of mingled material an appearance of life, and even an illusion of meditation. Its very stones seemed to feel the vernal revival. The beauty of sunshine heralded what would be and revealed the future. The face of the watching soldier, too, shone with the glamour of reincarnation, and the smile on it was born of the springtime and of hope. His rosy cheeks and blue eyes seemed brighter than ever. We go down into the communication trench, and there is sunshine there. The trench is yellow, dry, and resounding. I admire its finely geometrical depth, its shovel-smooth and shining flanks, and I find it enjoyable to hear the clean, sharp sound of our feet on the hard ground or on the cable tees. I look at my watch. It tells me that it's nine o'clock, and it shows me, too, a dial of delicate color where the sky is reflected in rose pink and blue, and the fine fretwork of bushes that are planted there above the margins of the trench. And Potterloo and I look at each other with a kind of confused delight. We are glad to see each other as though we were meeting after absence. He speaks to me, and though I am quite familiar with the sing-song accent of the North, I discover that he is singing. We have had bad days and tragic nights in the cold and the rain and the mud. Now, although it is still winter, the first fine morning shows and convinces us that it will soon be spring once more. Already the top of the trench is graced by green young grass, and amid its newborn quivering some flowers are awakening. It means the end of contracted and constricted days. Spring is coming from above and from below. We inhale with joyful hearts. We are uplifted. Yes, the bad days are ending. The war will end too, que diable and no doubt it will end in the beautiful season that is coming, that already illumines us, whose zephyrs already caress us. A whistling sound. Tiens, a spent bullet? A bullet? Nonsense. It's a blackbird. Curious how similar the sound was. The blackbirds and the birds of softer song, the countryside and the pageant of the seasons, the intimacy of dwelling rooms arrayed in light, Oh, the war will end soon. We shall go back for good to our own. Wife, children, or to her who is at once wife and child. And we smile towards them in this young glory that already unites us again. At the forking of the two trenches, in the open and on the edge, here is something like a doorway. 
two posts lean one upon the other with a confusion of electric wires between them hanging down like tropical creepers it looks well you would say it was a theatrical contrivance or scene a slender climbing plant twines round one of the posts and as you follow it with your glance you see that it already dares to pass from one to the other soon passing along this trench whose grassy slopes quiver like the flanks of a fine horse we come out into our own trench on the bethune road and here is our place our comrades are there in clusters they are eating and enjoying the goodly temperature the meal finished we clean our aluminum mess tins or plates with a morsel of bread tiens the sun's going it is true a cloud has passed over and hidden it it's going to splash my little lads says lamuse that it's our luck all over just as we were going off a damned country says fouad in truth this northern climate is not worth much it drizzles and mizzles reeks and rains and when there is any sun it soon disappears in the middle of this great damp sky our four days in the trenches are finished and the relief will commence at nightfall leisurely we get ready for leaving we fill and put aside the knapsacks and bags we give a rub to the rifles and wrap them up it's already four o'clock darkness is falling quickly and we grow indistinct to each other damnation here's the rain a few drops and then the downpour oh la 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 we don our capes and tent cloths we go back unto the dugout dabbling and gathering mud on our knees hands and elbows for the bottom of the trench is getting sticky once inside we have hardly time to light a candle stuck on a bit of stone and to shiver all round come on en route we hoist ourselves into the wet and windy darkness outside i can dimly see Potterloo's powerful shoulders in the ranks we are always side by side when we get going i call to him are you there old chap yes in front of you he cries to me turning round as he turns he gets a buffet in the face from wind and rain but he laughs his happy face of the morning abides with him no downpour shall rob him of the content that he carries in his strong and steadfast heart no evil night put out the sunshine that i saw possess his thoughts some hours ago we march and jostle each other and stumble the rain is continuous and water runs in the bottom of the trench the floor gratings yield as the soil becomes soaked some of them slope to right or left and we skid on them in the dark too one cannot see them so we miss them at the turnings and put our feet into holes full of water even in the grayness of the night i will not lose sight of the slaty shine of potterloo's helmet which streams like a roof under the torrent nor of the broad back that is adorned with a square of glistening oilskin i lock my step in his and from time to time i question him and he answers me always in good humour always serene and strong when there are no more of the wooden floor gratings we tramp in the thick mud it is dark now there is a sudden halt and i am thrown on Potterloo. up higher we hear half angry reproaches what the devil will you get on we shall get broken up i can't get my trotters unstuck replies a pitiful voice the engulfed one gets clear at last and we have to run to overtake the rest of the company we begin to pant and complain and bluster against those who are leading our feet go down haphazard we stumble and hold ourselves up by the walls so that our hands are plastered with mud the march becomes a stampede full of the noise of metal things and of oaths in redoubled rain there is a second halt someone has fallen and the hubbub is general he picks himself up and we're off again i exert myself to follow Potterloo's helmet closely that gleams feebly in the night before my eyes and i shout from time to time all right yes yes all right he replies puffing and blowing and his voice always sing-song and resonant our knapsacks tossed in this rolling race under the assault of the elements drag and hurt our shoulders the trench is blocked by a recent landslide and we plunge into it 
we have to tear our feet out of the soft and clinging earth lifting them high at each step and then when this crossing is laboriously accomplished we topple down again into the slippery stream in the bottom of which are two narrow ruts boot worn which hold one's foot like a vice and there are pools into which it goes with a great splash in one place we must stoop very low to pass under a heavy and glutinous bridge that crosses the trench and we only get through with difficulty it obliges us to kneel in the mud to flatten ourselves on the ground and to crawl on all fours for a few paces a little farther there are evolutions to perform as we grasp a post that the sinking of the ground has set a slope across the middle of the fairway we come to a trench crossing allons forward look out for yourselves boys says the adjutant who has flattened himself in a corner to let us pass and to speak to us this is a bad spot we're done up shouts a voice so hoarse that i cannot identify the speaker damn i've had enough of it i'm stopping here groans another at the end of his wind and his muscle what do you want me to do replies the adjutant no fault of mine eh allons get a move on it's a bad spot it was shelled at the last relief we go on through the tempest of wind and water we seem to be going ever down and down as in a pit we slip and tumble butt into the wall of the trench into which we drive our elbows hard so as to throw ourselves upright again our going is a sort of long slide on which we keep up just how and where we can what matters is to stumble only forward and as straight as possible where are we i lift my head in spite of the billows of rain out of this gulf where we are struggling against the hardly discernible background of the buried sky i can make out the rim of the trench and there rising before my eyes all at once and towering over that rim is something like a sinister doorway made of two black posts that lean one upon the other with something hanging from the middle like a torn off scalp it is the doorway forward forward i lower my head and see no more but again i hear the feet that sink in the mud and come out again the rattle of the bayonets the heavy exclamations and the rapid breathing once more there is a violent back eddy we pull up sharply and again i am thrown upon Paterloo and lean on his back his strong back and solid like the trunk of a tree like healthfulness and like hope he cries to me cheer up old man we're there we are standing still it is necessary to go back a little nom de dio no we're moving on again and suddenly a fearful explosion falls on us i tremble to my skull a metallic reverberation fills my head a scorching and suffocating smell of sulphur pierces my nostrils the earth has opened in front of me i feel myself lifted and hurled aside doubled up choked and half blinded by this lightning and thunder but still my recollection is clear and in that moment when i looked wildly and desperately for my comrade in arms i saw his body go up erect and black both his arms outstretched to their limit and the flame in the place of his head. End of chapter 12。Section 15 of Under Fire The Story of a Squad. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org under fire the story of a squad by henri barbus translated by william fitzwater ray chapter thirteen the big words barkway notices that i am writing he comes towards me on all fours through the straw and lifts his intelligent face to me with its reddish forelock and the little quick eyes over which circumflex accents fold and unfold themselves his mouth is twisting in all directions by reason of a tablet of chocolate that he crunches and chews while he holds the moist stump of it in his fist with his mouth full and wafting me the odour of a sweet shop he stammers 
tell me you writing chap you'll be writing later about soldiers you'll be speaking of us eh why yes sonny i shall talk about you and about the boys and about our life tell me then he indicates with a nod the papers on which i have been making notes with hovering pencil i watch and listen to him he has a question to put to me tell me then though you needn't if you don't want there's something i want to ask you this is it if you make the common soldiers talk in your book are you going to make them talk like they do talk or shall you put it all straight into pretty talk it's about the big words that we use for after all now besides falling out sometimes and blackguarding each other you'll never hear two poilus open their heads for a minute without saying and repeating things that the printers wouldn't much like to print then what if you don't say em your portrait won't be a lifelike one it's as if you were going to paint them and then left out one of the gaudiest colours wherever you found it all the same it isn't usually done i shall put the big words in their place da da for they're the truth but tell me if you put em in won't the people of your sort say you're swine without worrying about the truth very likely but i shall do it all the same without worrying about those people do you want my opinion although i know nothing about books it's brave to do that because it isn't usually done and it'll be spicy if you dare do it but you'll find it hard when it comes to it you're too polite that's just one of the faults i've found in you since we've known each other that and also that dirty habit you've got when they're serving brandy out to us you pretend it'll do you harm and instead of giving your share to a pal you go and pour it on your head to wash your scalp end of chapter thirteen the big words section sixteen of under fire the story of a squad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org under fire the story of a squad by henri barbus translated by william fitzwater ray chapter fourteen of burdens at the end of the yard of the muet's farm among the outbuildings the barn gapes like a cavern it is always caverns for us even in houses when you have crossed the yard where the manure yields underfoot with a spongy sound or have gone round it instead on the narrow paved path of difficult equilibrium and when you have arrived at the entrance to the barn you can see nothing at all then if you persist you make out a misty hollow where equally misty and dark lumps are a squat or prone or wandering from one corner to another at the back on the right and on the left the pale gleams of two candles each with the round halo of a distant moon allow you at last to make out the human shape of these masses whose mouths emit either steam or thick smoke our hazy retreat which i allow carefully to swallow me whole is a scene of excitement this evening we leave for the trenches to-morrow morning and the nebulous tenants of the barn are beginning to pack up although darkness falls on my eyes and chokes them as i come in from the pallid evening i still dodge the snares spread over the ground by water bottles mess tins and weapons but i butt full into the loaves that are packed together exactly in the middle like the paving of a yard i reach my corner something alive is there with a huge back fleecy and rounded squatting and stooping over a collection of little things that glitter on the ground and i tap the shoulder upholstered in sheepskin the being turns round and by the dull and fitful gleam of a candle which a bayonet stuck in the ground upholds i see one half of a face an eye the end of a moustache and the corner of a half-open mouth it growls in a friendly way and resumes the inspection of its possessions what are you doing there 
I'm fixing things and clearing up. The quasi-brigand who appears to be checking his booty is my comrade Volpate. He has folded his tent cloth in four and placed it on his bed, that is, on the truss of straw assigned to him, and on this carpet he has emptied and displayed the contents of his pockets. And it is quite a shop that he broods over with the housewife's solicitous eyes, watchful and jealous, lest someone walks over him. With my eye I tick off his copious exhibition. Alongside his handkerchief, pipe, tobacco pouch, which also contains a notebook, knife, purse, and pocket pipe lighter, which comprise the necessary and indispensable groundwork, here are two leather laces twisted like earthworms round a watch, enclosed in a case of transparent celluloid, which has curiously dulled and blanched with age. Then a little round mirror, and another square one, this last, though broken, is of better quality and bevel-edged. A flask of essence of turpentine, a flask of mineral oil, nearly empty, and a third flask, empty. A German belt plate bearing the device Gott mit uns, a dragoon's tassel of similar origin, half-wrapped in paper, an aviator's arrow in the form of a steel pencil and pointed like a needle folding scissors and a combined knife and fork of similar pliancy a stump of pencil and one of candle a tube of aspirin also containing opium tablets and several tin boxes observing that my inspection of his personal possessions is detailed volpate helps me to identify certain items that that's a leather officer's glove I cut the fingers off to stop up the mouth of my blunderbuss with that that's telephone wire the only thing to fasten buttons on your greatcoat with if you want em to stay there and here inside here do you know what that is white thread good stuff not what you're put off with when they give you new things a sort of macaroni au fromage that you pull out with a fork and there's a set of needles on a postcard the safety pins, they're there, separate. And here, that's the paper department, quite a library. There is indeed a surprising collection of papers among the things disgorged by Volpate's pockets, the violet packet of writing paper, whose unworthy printed envelope is out at heels, an army squad book of which the dirty and desiccated binding, like the skin of an old tramp, has perished and shrunk all over, a notebook with a chafed moleskin cover, and packed with papers and photographs, those of his wife and children enthroned in the middle out of this bundle of yellowed and darkened papers volpate extracts this photograph and shows it to me once more i renew acquaintance with madame volpate and her generous bosom her mild and mellow features and with the two little boys in white collars the elder slender the younger round as a ball i've only got photos of old people says biquet who is twenty years old he shows us a portrait holding it close to the candle of two aged people who look at us with the same well-behaved air as volpate's children i've got mine with me too says another i always stick to the photo of the nestlings course every man carries his crowd along adds another it's funny barque declares a portrait wears itself out just with being looked at you haven't got to gape at it too often or be too long about it. In the long run, I don't know what happens, but the likeness mizzles. You're right, says Blair. I found it like that, too, exactly. I've got a map of the district as well among my papers, Volpate continues. He unfolds it to the light, illegible and transparent at the creases. It looks like one of those window blinds made of squares sewn together i've some newspaper too he unfolds a newspaper article upon poilus and a book a twopence halfpenny novel called twice a maid tiens another newspaper cutting from the etant b 
don't know why i've kept that but there must be a reason somewhere i'll think about it when i have time and then my pack of cards and a set of draughts with a paper board and the pieces made of sealing wax barque comes up regards the scene and says i've a lot more things than that in my pockets he addresses himself to volpate have you got a bosch paybook louse head some files of iodine and a browning i've all that and two knives i've no revolver says volpate nor a bosch paybook but i could have had two knives or even ten knives but i only need one that depends says barque and have you any mechanical buttons fathead i haven't any cries becoué the private can't do without em lamuse asserts without them to make your braces stick to your breeches the game's up and i've always got in my pocket says blair so's there within reach my case of rings he brings it cut wrapped up in a gas mask bag and shakes it the files ring inside and we hear the jingle of aluminum rings in the rough i've always got string says biquet that's the useful stuff not so useful as nails says pepin and he shows three in his hand big little and average one by one the others come to join in the conversation to chaffer and cadge we are getting used to the half-darkness but corporal salivaire who has a well-earned reputation for dexterity makes a hanging lamp with a candle and a tray the latter contrived from a camembert box and some wire we light up and around its illumination each man tells what he has in his pockets with parental preferences and bias to begin with how many have we how many pockets eighteen says some one cocon of course the man of figures eighteen pockets your codding rat nose says big lamuse exactly eighteen replies cocon count them if you're as clever as all that lamuse is willing to be guided by reason in the matter and putting his two hands near the light so as to count accurately he tells off his great brick-red fingers two pockets in the back of the great coat one for the first aid packet which is used for tobacco two inside the great coat in front two outside it on each side with flaps three in the trousers and even three and a half counting the little one in front i'll bet a compass on it says farfadet and i my bits of tinder i says tiloir i'll bet a teeny whistle that my wife sent me when she said if you're wounded in the battle you must whistle so that your comrades will come and save your life we laugh at the artless words tulacque intervenes and says indulgently to tiloir they don't know what war is back there and if you started talking about the rear it'd be you that talk rot we won't count that pocket says salivaire it's too small that makes ten in the jacket four that only makes fourteen after all there are the two cartridge pockets the two new ones that fasten with straps sixteen says salivaire now blockhead and son of misery turn my jacket back you haven't counted those two pockets now then what more do you want and yet they're just in the usual place they're your civilian pockets where you shoved your nose rag your tobacco and the address where you'd got to deliver your parcel when you were a messenger eighteen says salivaire as grave as a judge there are eighteen and no mistake that's done it at this point in the conversation some one makes a series of noisy stumbles on the stones of the threshold with the sound of a horse pawing the ground and blaspheming then after a silence the barking of a sonorous and authoritative voice hey inside there getting ready everything must be fixed up this evening and packed tight and solid you know going into the first line this time and we may have a hot time of it right you are right you are mon ajoutant heedless voices answer how do you write arnes asks benesh who is on all fours at work with a pencil and an envelope 
while cocon spells ernest for him and the voice of the vanished adjutant is heard afar repeating his harangue blair picks up the thread and says you should always my children listen to what i am telling you put your drinking cup in your pocket i have tried to stick it everywhere else but only the pockets really practical you take my word if you are in marching order or if you have doffed your kit to navigate the trenches either you have always got it under your fist when chances come like when a pal who has got some gargle and feels good towards you says lend us your cup or a peddling wine cellar either my young bucks listen to what i tell you you'll always find it good put your cup in your pocket no fear says lamuse you won't see me put my cup in my pocket damned silly idea no more or less i'd a sight sooner sling it on a strap with a hook fasten it on the greatcoat button like the gas helmet bag that's a lot better for suppose you take off your accoutrements and there's any wine passing you look soft i've got a bosh drinking cup says barquet it's flat so it goes into a side pocket if you like or it goes very well into a cartridge pouch once you've fired the damn things off or pitched them into a bag a bosh cup's nothing special says pepin it won't stand up it's just lumber you wait and see maggot snout says tourette who is something of a psychologist if we attack this time same as the adjutant seemed to hint perhaps you'll find a bosch cup and then it'll be something special the adjutant may have said that eudor observes but he doesn't know it holds more than a half pint the bosch cup remarks cocon seeing that the exact capacity of the half pint is marked in the cup three-quarters way up and it's always good for you to have a big one for if you've got a cup that only just holds a half pint then so that you can get your half pint of coffee or wine or holy water or what not it's get to be filled right up and they don't ever do it at serving out and if they do you spill it i believe you that they don't fill it says paradis exasperated by the recollection of that ceremony the quartermaster sergeant he pours it with his blasted finger in your cup and gives it two raps on its bottom result you get a third in your cups in mourning with three black bands on top of each other yes says barquet that's true but you shouldn't have a cup too big either because the chap that's pouring it out for you he suspects you and lets it go in damned drops and so as not to give you more than your measure he gives you less and you can whistle for it with your tureen in your fists volpate puts back in his pockets one by one the items of his display when he came to the purse he looked at it with an air of deep compassion he's damnably flat poor chap he counted the contents three francs my boy i must set about feathering this nest again or i shall be stony when we get back you're not the only one that's broken backed in the treasury the soldier spends more than he earns and don't you forget it i wonder what become of a man that only had his pay paradis replies with concise simplicity he'd kick the bucket and see here look what i've got in my pocket and never let go of pepin with merry eyes shows us some silver table things they belonged he says to the ugly trollop where we were quartered at grand rosoy perhaps they still belong to her pepin made an uncertain gesture in which pride mingled with modesty then growing bolder he smiled and said i knew her the old sneak certainly she'll spend the rest of her life looking in every corner for her silver things for my part says volpate i've never been able to rake in more than a pair of scissors some people have the luck i haven't so naturally i watch em close though i admit i've no use for em i've pinched a few bits of things here and there but what of it the sappers have always left me behind in the matter of pinching so what about it you can do what you like you're always got at by some one in your turn eh my boy don't fret about it i keep my wife's letters says blair and i send mine back to her and i keep them too here they are eudore exposes a packet of worn and shiny paper whose grimy condition the twilight modestly veils i keep them sometimes i read them again when i'm cold and humpy i read them again it doesn't actually warm you up but it seems to 
there must be a deep significance in the curious expression for several men raise their heads and say yes that's so by fits and starts the conversation goes on in the bosom of this fantastic barn and the great moving shadows that cross it night is heaped up in its corners and pointed by a few scattered and sickly candles i watch these busy and burdened flitters come and go outline themselves strangely then stoop and slide down to the ground they talk to themselves and to each other their feet are encumbered by the litter they are showing their riches to each other tiens look great they reply enviously what they have not got they want there are treasures among the squad long coveted by all the two-liter water bottle for instance preserved by barque that a skilful rifle shot with a blank cartridge has stretched to the capacity of two and a half liters and bertrand's famous great knife with the horn handle among the heaving swarm there are sidelong glances that skim these curiosities and then each man resumes eyes right devotes himself to his belongings and concentrates upon getting it in order they are mournful belongings indeed everything made for the soldier is commonplace ugly and of bad quality from his cardboard boots attached to the uppers by a criss-cross of worthless thread to his badly cut badly shaped and badly sewn clothes made of shoddy and transparent cloth blotting paper that one day of sunshine fades and an hour of rain wets through to his emaciated leathers brittle as shavings and torn by the buckle spikes to his flannel underwear that is thinner than cotton to his straw-like tobacco martereau is beside me and he points to our comrades look at them these poor chaps gaping into their bags of tricks you'd say it was a mother's meeting ogling their kids hark to em they're calling for their knick-knacks tiens that one the times he says my knife same as if he was calling lon or charles or dolphus and you know it's impossible for them to make their load any less can't be did it isn't that they don't want our job isn't one that makes us any stronger eh but they can't too proud of em the burdens to be borne are formidable and one knows well enough parbleu that every item makes them more severe each little addition is one bruise more for it is not merely a matter of what one buries in his pockets and pouches to complete the burden there is what one carries on his back the knapsack is the trunk and even the cupboard and the old soldier is familiar with the art of enlarging it almost miraculously by the judicious disposal of his household goods and provisions besides the regulation and obligatory contents two tins of pressed beef a dozen biscuits two tablets of coffee and two packets of dried soup the bag of sugar fatigue smock and spare boots we find a way of getting in some pots of jam tobacco chocolate candles soft-soled shoes and even soap a spirit lamp some solidified spirit and some woollen things with the blanket sheet tent cloth trenching tool water bottle and an item of the field cooking kit the burden gets heavier and taller and wider monumental and crushing and my neighbor says truly that every time he reaches his goal after some miles of highway and communication trenches the poilu swears hard that the next time he'll leave a heap of things behind and give his shoulders a little relief from the yoke of the knapsack but every time he is preparing for departure he assumes again the same overbearing and almost superhuman load he never lets it go though he curses it always there are some bad boys says lamuse among the shirkers that find a way of keeping something in the company wagon or the medical van i know one that's got two shirts and a pair of drawers in an adjutant's canteen but you see there's two hundred and fifty chaps in the company and they're all up to the dodge and not many of em can profit by it it's chiefly the non-coms 
the more stripes they've got the easier it is to plant their luggage not forgetting that the commandant visits the wagons sometimes without warning and fires your things into the middle of the road if he finds em in a horse-box where they've no business be off with you not to mention the bully-wagging and the clink in the early days it was all right my boy there were some chaps i've seen em who stuck their bags and even their knapsacks in baby carts and pushed em along the road ah not half those were the good times of the war but all that's changed Wilpate, deaf to all the talk, muffled in his blanket as if in a shawl which makes him look like an old witch, revolves round an object that lies on the ground. I'm wondering, he says, addressing no one, whether to take away this damned tin stove. It's the only one in the squad, and I've always carried it. We, oui, but it leaks like a cullender. He cannot decide and makes a really pathetic picture of separation." barque watches him obliquely and makes fun of him we hear him say senile dodderer but he pauses in his chaffing to say after all if we were in his shoes we should be equally fat-headed volpate postpones his decision till later i'll see about it in the morning when i'm loading the camel's back after the inspection and recharging of pockets it is the turn of the bags and then of the cartridge pouches and barquay holds forth on the way to make the regulation two hundred cartridges go into the three pouches in the lump it is impossible they must be unpacked and placed side by side upright head against foot thus can one cram each pouch without leaving any space and make himself a waistband that weighs over twelve pounds rifles have been cleaned already one looks to the swathing of the breech and the plugging of the muzzle precautions which trench dirt renders indispensable how every rifle can easily be recognized is discussed i've made some nicks in the sling see i've cut into the edge i've twisted a boot lace round the top of the sling and that way i can tell it by touch as well as seeing i use a mechanical button no mistake about that in the dark i can find it at once and say that's my pea shooter because you know there are some boys that don't bother themselves they just roll around while the pals are cleaning theirs and then they're devilish quick at putting a quiet fist on a pop-gun that's been cleaned and then after they've even the cheek to go and say mon capitaine i've got a rifle that's a bit of all right i'm not on in that act it's the d system my old wonder a damned dirty dodge and there are times when i'm fed up with it and more and thus though their rifles are all alike they are as different as their handwriting it's curious and funny says martereau to me we're going up to the trenches to-morrow and there's nobody drunk yet nor that way inclined ah uh, i don't say he concedes at once but what those two there aren't a bit fresh nor a little elevated without being absolutely blind they're somewhat boozed perhaps it's poitron and poipo of boyer's squad they are lying down and talking in a low voice we can make out the round nose of one which stands out equally with his mouth close by a candle and with his hand whose lifted finger makes little explanatory signs faithfully followed by the shadow it casts i know how to light a fire but i don't know how to light it again when it's gone out declares poitron as says poipo if you know how to light it you know how to relight it seeing that if you light it it's because it's gone out and you might say that you're relighting it when you're lighting it that's all rot i'm not mathematical and to hell with the gibberish you talk i tell you and i tell you again that when it comes to lighting a fire i'm there but to light it again when it's gone out i'm no good i can't speak any straighter than that I do not catch the insistent retort of Poipo, but, but, you damn numbskull, gurgles Poitron, haven't I told you thirty times that I can't? You must have a pig's head anyway. Martereau confides to me, I've heard about enough of that. Obviously, he spoke too soon just now. 
a sort of fever provoked by farewell libations prevails in the wretched straw-spread hole where our tribe some upright and hesitant others kneeling and hammering like colliers is mending stacking and subduing its provisions clothes and tools there is a wordy growling a riot of gesture from the smoky glimmers rubicund faces start forth in relief and dark hands move about in the shadows like marionettes in the barn next to ours and separated from it only by a wall of a man's height arise tipsy shouts two men in there have fallen upon each other with fierce violence and anger the air is vibrant with the coarsest expressions the human ear ever hears but one of the disputants a stranger from another squad is ejected by the tenants and the flow of curses from the other grows feebler and expires same as us says martereau with a certain pride they hold themselves in it is true thanks to bertrand who is possessed by a hatred of drunkenness of the fatal poison that gambles with multitudes our squad is one of the least befouled by wine and brandy they are shouting and singing and talking all around and they laugh endlessly for in the human mechanism laughter is the sound of wheels that work of deeds that are done one tries to fathom certain faces that show up in provocative relief among this menagerie of shadows this aviary of reflections but one cannot they are visible but you can see nothing in the depth of them ten o'clock already friends says bertrand we'll finish the camel's humps off to-morrow time for bye-bye each one then slowly retires to rest but the jabbering hardly pauses man takes all things easily when he is under no obligation to hurry the men go to and fro each with some object in his hand and along the wall i watch eudore's huge shadow gliding as he passes in front of a candle with two little bags of camphor hanging from the end of his fingers the muse is throwing himself about in search of a good position he seems ill at ease to-day obviously and whatever his capacity may be he has eaten too much some of us want to sleep shut them up you lot of louts cries mesnil joseph from his litter this entreaty has a subduing effect for a moment but does not stop the burble of voices nor the passing to and fro we're going up to-morrow it's true says paradis and in the evening we shall go into the first line but nobody's thinking about it we know it and that's all gradually each has regained his place i have stretched myself on the straw and martereau wraps himself up by my side enter an enormous bulk taking great pains not to make a noise it is the field hospital sergeant a marist brother a huge bearded simpleton in spectacles when he has taken off his great coat and appears in his jacket you are conscious that he feels awkward about showing his legs we see that it hurries discreetly this silhouette of a bearded hippopotamus he blows sighs and mutters martereau indicates him with a nod of his head and says to me look at him those chaps have always got to be talking fudge when we ask him what he does in civil life he won't say i'm a school-teacher he says leering at you from under his specs with the half of his eyes i'm a professor when he gets up very early to go to mass he says i've got belly ache. i must go and take a turn round the corner and no mistake a little farther off papa ramur is talking of his homeland where i live it's just a bit of a hamlet no great shakes there's my old man there seasoning pipes all day long whether he's working or resting he blows his smoke up to the sky or into the smoke of the stove i listen to this rural idol and it takes suddenly a specialized and technical character that's why he makes a paillon do you know what a paillon is you take a stalk of green corn and peel it you split it in two and then in two again and you have different sizes then with a thread and the four slips of straw he goes round the stem of his pipe the lesson ceases abruptly there being no apparent audience there are only two candles alight a wide wing of darkness overspreads the prostrate collection of men private conversation still flickers along the primitive dormitory and some fragments of it reach my ears just now papa ramure is abusing the commandant 
the commandant old man with his four bits of gold string i've noticed he don't know how to smoke he sucks all out at his pipes and he burns em it isn't a mouth he's got in his head it's a snout the wood splits and scorches and instead of being wood it's coal clay pipes they'll stick it better but he roasts em brown all the same talk about a snout so old man mind what i'm telling you he'll come to what doesn't ever happen often through being forced to get white hot and baked to the marrow his pipe will explode in his nose before everybody you'll see little by little peace silence and darkness take possession of the barn and enshroud the hopes and the sighs of its occupants the lines of identical bundles formed by these beings rolled up side by side in their blankets seem a sort of huge organ which sends forth diversified snoring with his nose already in his blanket i hear martereau talking to me about himself i'm a buyer of rags you know he says or to put it better a rag merchant but me i'm wholesale i buy from the little rag and bone men of the streets and i have a shop a warehouse mind you which i use as a depot i deal in all kinds of rags from linen to jam pots but principally brush handles sacks and old shoes and naturally i make a specialty of rabbit skins and a little later i still hear him as for me little and queer shaped as i am all the same i can carry a bin of two hundred pounds weight to the warehouse up the steps and my feet in sabots once i had a to do with a person what i can't abide cries fouillade all of a sudden is the exercises and marches they give us when we're resting my back's mincemeat and i can't get a snooze even i'm that cramped there is a metallic noise in valpate's direction he has decided to take the stove though he chides it constantly for the fatal fault of its perforations one who is but half asleep groans oh la la when will this war finish a cry of stubborn and mysterious rebellion bursts forth they take the very skin off us there follows a single don't fret yourself as darkly inconsequent as the cry of revolt i wake up a long time afterwards as two o'clock is striking and in a pallor of light which doubtless comes from the moon i see the agitated silhouette of pinagal a cock has crowed afar pinagal raises himself halfway to a sitting position and i hear his husky voice well now it's the middle of the night and there's a cock loosing his jaw he's blind drunk that cock he laughs and repeats he's blind that cock and he twists himself again into the woollens and resumes his slumber with a gurgle in which snores are mingled with merriment cocon has been wakened by pinagal the man of figures therefore thinks aloud and says the squad had seventeen men when it set off for the war it has seventeen also at present with the stop gaps each man has already worn out four great coats one of the original blue and three cigar smoke blue two pairs of trousers and six pairs of boots one must count two rifles to each man but one can't count the overalls our emergency rations have been renewed twenty-three times among us seventeen we've been mentioned fourteen times in army orders of which two were to the brigade four to the division and one to the army once we stayed sixteen days in the trenches without relief we've been quartered and lodged in forty-seven different villages up to now since the beginning of the campaign twelve thousand men have passed through the regiment which consists of two thousand a strange lisping noise interrupts him it comes from blair whose new ivories prevent him from talking as they also prevent him from eating but he puts them in every evening and retains them all night with fierce determination for he was promised that in the end he would grow accustomed to the object they have put into his head i raise myself on my elbow as on a battlefield and look once more on the beings whom the scenes and happenings of the times have rolled up all together i look at them all plunged in the abyss of passive oblivion some of them seeming still to be absorbed in their pitiful anxieties their childish instincts and their slave-like ignorance the intoxication of sleep masters me but i recall what they have done and what they will do and with that consummate picture 
of a sorry human night before me a shroud that fills our cavern with darkness i dream of some great unknown light end of chapter fourteen section seventeen of under fire the story of a squad this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by roger moline under fire the story of a squad by henri barbousse translated by william fitzwater ray chapter fifteen the egg we were badly off hungry and thirsty and in these wretched quarters there was nothing something had gone wrong with the revitalizing department and our wants were becoming acute where the sorry place surrounded them with its empty doors its bones of houses and its bald-headed telegraph posts a crowd of hungry men were grinding their teeth and confirming the absence of everything the juice has sloped and the wine's up the spout and the bully's zero cheese nix napoo jam napoo butter on skewers we've nothing and no error nothing and play hell as you like it doesn't help talk about rotten quarters three houses with nothing inside but draughts and damp no good having any of the filthy here you might as well have only the skin of a bob in your purse as long as there is nothing to buy you might be a rothschild or even a military tailor but what use did your brass be yesterday there was a bit of a cat mewing around where the seventh are i feel sure they've eaten it yes there was you could see its ribs like rocks on the seashore there were some chaps says blair who bustled about when the guy got here and managed to find a few bottles of common wine at the baca shop at the corner of the street ah the swine lucky devils to be sliding that down their necks it was muck all the same it'd make your cup as black as your backy pipe there are some they say who've swallowed a fowl damn says fouillade i've hardly had a bite i had a sardine left and a little tea in the bottom of a bag that i chewed up with some sugar you can't even have a bit of a drunk it's off the map and that isn't enough either even when you're not a big eater and you've got a communication trench as flat as a pancake one meal in two days a yellow mess shining like gold no broth and no meat everything left behind and worst of all we've nothing to light a pipe with true and that's misery i haven't a single match i had several bits of ends but they've gone i've hunted in vain through all the pockets of my flea case nix as for buying them it's hopeless as you say i've got the head of a match that i'm keeping it's a real hardship indeed and the sight is pitiful of the poilu who cannot light pipe or cigarette but put them away in their pockets and stroll in resignation by good fortune tilloir has his petrol pipe lighter and it still contains a little spirit those who are aware of it gather round him bringing their pipes packed and cold there is not even any paper to light and the flame itself must be used until the remaining spirit in its tiny insect's belly is burned as for me i've been lucky and i see paradis wandering about his kindly face to the wind grumbling and chewing a bit of wood tiens i say to him 
Take this. A box of matches, he exclaims, amazed, looking at it as one looks at a jewel. Egad, that's capital. Matches. A moment later we see him lighting his pipe, his face saucily sideways and splendidly crimsoned by the reflected flame, and everybody shouts, Paradis got some matches. Towards evening I met Paradis near the ruined triangle of a house front, at the corner of the two streets of this most miserable among villages. He beckons to me. Hist! He has a curious and rather awkward air. I say, he says to me affectionately, but looking at his feet, a bit since you chucked me a box of flamers. Well, you're going to get a bit of your own back for it. Here. He put something in my hand. Be careful, he whispers. It's fragile. Dazzled by the resplendent purity of his present, hardly even daring to believe my eyes, I see an egg. End of chapter 15 Recording by Roger Moline Section 18 of Under Fire, The Story of a Squat This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Thompson Under Fire, The Story of a Squad by Henri Barbousse Translated by William Fitzwater Ray Chapter 16 An Idyll Really and truly, said Paradis, my neighbour in the ranks, believe me or not, I'm knocked out. I've never before been so paid on a march as I've been with this one this evening. His feet were dragging, and his square shoulders bowed under the burden of the knapsack, whose height and big irregular outline seemed almost fantastic. Twice he tripped and stumbled. Parody is tough, but he had been running up and down the trench all night as liaison man while the others were sleeping, so he had good reason to be exhausted and to growl, Quoi? These kilometres must be made of India rubber. There's no way out of it. Every three steps he hoisted his knapsack roughly up with the hitch of his hips, and panted under its dragging, and all the heap that he made with his bundles tossed and creaked like an overloaded wagon. "'We're there,' said a non-com. Non-coms always say that, on every occasion. But, in spite of the non-com's declaration, we were really arriving in a twilight village which seemed to be drawn in white chalk and heavy strokes of black upon the blue paper of the sky, where the sable silhouette of the church, a pointed tower flanked by two turrets more slender and more sharp, was that of a tall cypress. But the soldier, even when he enters the village where he is to be quartered, has not reached the end of his troubles. It rarely happens that either the squad or the section actually lodges in the place assigned to them, and this by reason of misunderstandings and cross-purposes which tangle and disentangle themselves on the spot. And it is only after several quarter hours of tribulation that each man is led to his actual shelter of the moment. So after the usual wanderings we were admitted to our night's lodging, a roof supported by four posts, and with the four quarters of the compass for its walls. But it was a good roof, an advantage which we could appreciate. It was already sheltering a cart and a plough, and we settled ourselves by them. Parody, who had fumed and complained without ceasing during the hour we had spent in tramping to and fro, threw down his knapsack, and then himself, and stayed there a while, weary to the utmost, protesting that his limbs were benumbed, that the soles of his feet were painful, and indeed all the rest of him. But now the house to which our hanging roof was subject, the house which stood just in front of us, was lighted up. 
nothing attracts a soldier in the grey monotony of evening so much as a window whence beams the star of a lamp shall we have a squint proposed volpat so be it said paradis he gets up gradually and hobbling with weariness steers himself towards the golden window that has appeared in the gloom and then towards the door volpat follows him and i volpat we enter and ask the old man who has let us in and whose twinkling head is as threadbare as an old hat if he has any wine to sell no replies the old man shaking his head where a little white fluff crops out in places no beer no coffee anything at all no mes amis nothing of anything we don't belong here we're refugees you know then seeing there's nothing we'll be off we write about face at least we have enjoyed for a moment the warmth which pervades the house and a sight of the lamp already volpat has gained the threshold and his back is disappearing in the darkness but i espy an old woman sunk in the depths of a chair in the other corner of the kitchen who appears to have some busy occupation i pinch paradis's arm there's the bell of the house shall we pay our address to her paradis makes a gesture of lordly indifference he has lost interest in women all those he has seen for a year and a half were not for him and moreover even when they would like to be his he is equally uninterested young or old pooh he says to me beginning to yawn for want of something to do and to lengthen the leaving he goes up to the good wife good evening grandma he mumbles finishing his yawn good evening mes enfants quavers the old dame so near we see her in detail she is shrivelled bent and bowed in her old bones and the whole of her face is white as the dial of the clock and what is she doing wedged between her chair and the edge of the table she is trying to clean some boots it is a heavy task for her infantile hands their movements are uncertain and her strokes with the brush sometimes go astray the boots too are very dirty indeed seeing that we are watching her she whispers to us that she must polish them well and this evening too for they are her little girl's boots who is a dressmaker in the town and goes off first thing in the morning paradis has stooped to look at the boots more closely and suddenly he puts his hand out towards them drop it grandma i'll spruce up the lasses trotter cases for you in three secs the old woman lodges an objection by shaking her head and her shoulders but paradis takes the boots with authority while the grandmother paralyzed by her weakness argues the question and opposes us with shadowy protest paradis has taken a boot in each hand he holds them gingerly and looks at them for a moment and you would even say that he was squeezing them a little and they small he says in a voice which is not what we hear in the usual way he has secured the brushes as well and sets himself to wielding them with zealous carefulness i notice that he is smiling with his eyes fixed on his work then when the mud has gone from the boots he takes some polish off the end of the double-pointed brush and caresses them with it intently they are dainty boots quite those of a stylish young lady rows of little buttons shine on them not a single button missing he whispers to me and there is pride in his tone he is no longer sleepy he yawns no more on the contrary his lips are tightly closed a gleam of youth and springtime lights up his face and he who was on the point of going to sleep seems just to have woke up and where the polish has bestowed a beautiful black his fingers move over the body of the boot which opens widely in the upper part and betrays even such a little the lower curves of the leg his fingers so skilled in polishing are rather awkward all the same as they turn the boots over and turn them again as he smiles at them and ponders profoundly and afar while the old woman lifts her arms in the air and calls me to witness what a very kind soldier he is it is finished the boots are cleaned and finished off in style they are like mirrors nothing is left to do 
He puts them on the edge of the table, very carefully, as if they were saintly relics. Then at last his hands let them go. But his eyes do not at once leave them. He looks at them, and then, lowering his head, he looks at his own boots. I remember that while he made this comparison, the great lad, a hero by destiny, a bohemian, a monk, smiled once more with all his heart. The old woman was showing signs of activity in the depths of her chair. She had an idea. "'I'll tell her. She shall thank you herself, monsieur. Hey, Josephine!' she cried, turning towards the door. But Paradis stopped her with an expansive gesture which I thought magnificent. "'No, it's not worth while, Grandma. Leave her where she is. We're going. We won't trouble her. Allez!' Such decision sounded in his voice that it carried authority and the old woman obediently sank into inactivity and held her peace. We went away to our bed under the wallless roof, between the arms of the plough that was waiting for us, and then Paradis began again to yawn, but by the light of the candle in our crib, a full minute later, I saw that the happy smile remained yet on his face. End of chapter 16《ซ c t i o n 19 of Under Fire The Story of a Squad This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joseph McWomby Under Fire The Story of a Squad by Henri Barbus Translated by William Fitzwater Ray Chapter 17 The Sap in the excitement of a distribution of letters from which the squad were returning, some with the delight of a letter, some with the semi-delight of a postcard, and others with a new load, speedily reassumed, of expectation and hope, a comrade comes with a brandished newspaper to tell us an amazing story. To say, the weasel-faced ancient at Goshan. The old boy who was treasure-seeking, well, he's found it. Jeraware. It's just as I tell you, you great lump. What would you like me to say to you? Mass? Don't know it. Anyway, the yard of his place has been bombed, and a chest full of money was turned up out of the ground near a wall. He got his treasure full on the back, and now the parson's quietly cut in and talks about claiming credit for the miracle. We listen, open-mouthed. A treasure? Well, well. The old bald head. The sudden revelation plunges us in an abyss of reflection. And to think how damned sick we were of the old cackler when he made such a song about his treasure and dinned it into our ears. We were right enough down there, you remember, when we were saying, one never knows. Didn't guess how near we were to being right, either. All the same, there are some things you can be sure of, says Fafa there who as soon as Goshan was mentioned had remained dreaming and distant, as though a lovely face was smiling on him. But as for this, he added, I'd never have believed it either. Shan't I find him stuck up, the old ruin, when I go back there after the war? They want a willing man to help the sappers with a job, says the big adjutant. Not likely, growl the men, without moving. It'll be of use in relieving the boys, the adjutant goes on. With that, the grumbling ceases, and several heads are raised. Here, says Lamuse. Get into your harness, biggin, and come with me. Lamuse buckles on his knapsack, rolls up his blanket, and fetters his pouches. Since his seizure of unlucky affection was allayed, he has become more melancholy than before, and although a sort of fatality makes him continually stouter, he has become engrossed and isolated, and rarely speaks. In the evening, something comes along the trench, rising and falling according to the lumps and holes in the ground, a shape that seems in the shadows to be swimming, that outspreads its arms sometimes, as though appealing for help. It is Lamuse. He is among us again, covered with mould and mud. He trembles and streams with sweat, as one who is afraid. His lips stir, and he gasps, before they can shape a word. Well, what is there? we ask him vainly. He collapses in a corner among us and prostrates himself. 
We offer him wine, and he refuses it with a sign. Then he turns towards me, and beckons me with a movement of his head. When I am by him, he whispers to me, very low, and as if in church. I have seen Udoxi again, he gasps for breath. His chest wheezes, and with his eyeballs fast, fixed upon a nightmare, he says, She was putrid. It was the place we'd lost, the moose went on, and that the colonials took again with the bayonet ten days ago. First, we made a hole for the sap, and I was in at it. Since I was scooping more than the others, I found myself in front. The others were widening and making solid behind. But behold, I find a jumble of beams. I'd lit on an old trench, caved in, evidently, half caved in. There was some space and room. In the middle of those stumps of wood all mixed together that I was lifting away one by one from in front of me, there was something, like a big sandbag in height, upright, and something on the top of it hanging down. And behold, a plank gives way, and the queer sack falls on me, with its weight on top. I was pegged down, and the smell of a corpse filled my throat. On the top of the bundle there was a head, and it was the hair that I'd seen hanging down. You understand, one couldn't see very well, but I recognised the hair, because there isn't any other like it in the world. And then the rest of the face, all stove in and mouldy, the neck pulped, and all the lot dead for a month, perhaps. It was Udoxi, I tell you. Yes, it was the woman I could never go near before, you know, but I only saw a long way off and couldn't ever touch, same as diamonds. She used to run about everywhere, you know. She used even to wander into the lines. One day she must have stopped a bullet and stayed there, dead and lost, until the chance of this sap. You clinch the position? I was forced to hold her up with one arm as well as I could and work with the other. She was trying to fall on me with all her weight. Old man, she wanted to kiss me, and I didn't want... It was terrible. She seemed to be saying to me, You wanted to kiss me? Well then, come, come now. She had on her, she had there, fastened on, the remains of a bunch of flowers, and that was rotten too, and the posy stank in my nose like the corpse of some little beast. I had to take her in my arms, in both of them, and turn gently round so that I could put her down on the other side. The place was so narrow and pinched that as we turned, for a moment, I hugged her to my breast and couldn't help it. With all my strength, old chap, as I should have hugged her once on a time if she'd have let me. I've been half an hour cleaning myself from the touch of her and the smell that she breathed on me, in spite of me and in spite of herself. Ah, lucky for me that I'm as done up as a wretched cart horse. He turns over on his belly, clenches his fists, and slumbers, with his face buried in the ground and his dubious dream of passion and corruption. End of chapter 17 Recording by Joseph McQuamby Section 20 of Under Fire The Story of a Squad This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Under Fire, The Story of a Squad, by Henry Barbus. Translated by William Fitzwater Ray. Chapter 18. A Box of Matches. It is five o'clock in the evening. Three men are seen moving in the bottom of the gloomy trench. Around their extinguished fire in their dirty excavation, they are frightful to see, black and sinister. Rain and negligence have put their fire out, and the four cooks are looking at the corpses of brands that are shrouded in ashes and the stumps of wood whence the flame has flown. Volpat staggers up to the group and throws down the black mass that he had on his shoulder. I've pulled it out of the dugout, where it won't show much. We have wood, says Blair, but we've got to light it, otherwise how are we going to cook this cab horse? It's a fine piece, wails a dark-faced man. Thin flank. In my belief, that's the best bit of the beast, the flank. Fire, Volpat objects. There are no more matches, no more anything. We must have fire, growls Poupardine whose indistinct bulk has the proportions of the bear as he rolls and sways in the dark depth of our cage. No two ways about it, 
We've got to have it, Pepin agrees. He is coming out of the dugout like a sweep out of a chimney. His grey mass emerges and appears like night upon evening. Don't worry, I shall get some, declares Blair in a concentrated tone of angry decision. He has not been cook long and is keen to show himself quite equal to adverse conditions in the exercise of his functions. He spoke as Martin Caesar used to speak when he was alive. His aim is to resemble the great legendary figure of the cook who always found ways for a fire, just as others among the non-coms would fain imitate Napoleon. I shall go if it is necessary and fetch every bit of wood there is at Battalion HQ. I shall go and requisition the colonel's matches. I shall go. Let's go and forage. Poupardin leads the way. His face is like the bottom of a saucepan that the fire has gradually befouled. As it is cruelly cold, he is wrapped up all over. He wears a cape which is half goatskin and half sheepskin, half brown and half whitish, and this twofold skin of tints geometrically cut makes him look like some strange occult animal. Pepin has a cotton cap so soiled and so shiny with grease that it might be made of black silk. Volpat, inside his balaclava and his fleeces, resembles a walking tree trunk. A square opening betrays a yellow face at the top of the thick and heavy bark of the mass he makes, which is bifurcated by a couple of legs. Let's look up the tent. They've always got the needful. They on the pylons road, beyond the bouillon neuf. The four alarming objects get under way, cloud shape in the trench that unwinds itself sinuously before them like a blind alley, unsafe, unlighted and unpaved. It is uninhabited too, in this part, being a gangway between the second lines and the first lines. In the dusty twilight, two Moroccans meet the fire-questing cooks. One has the skin of a black boot and the other of a yellow shoe. Hope gleams in the depth of the cooks' hearts. Matches, boys? Napu, replies the black one, and his smile reveals his long crockery-like teeth in his cigar-coloured mouth of Moroccan leather. In his turn, the yellow one advances and asks, Tobacco? A bit of tobacco? And he holds out his greenish sleeve and his great hard paw, in which the cracks are full of brown dirt and the nails purplish. Pepin growls, rummages in his clothes and pulls out a pinch of tobacco, mixed with dust, which he hands to the sharpshooter. A little farther they meet a sentry who is half asleep in the middle of the evening, on a heap of loose earth. The drowsy soldier says, It's to the right, and then again to the right, and then straight forward. Don't go wrong about it. They march for a long time. We must have come a long way, says Volpat, after half an hour of fruitless paces and encloistered loneliness. I say, we going downhill a hell of a lot, don't you think? asks Blair. Don't worry, old duffer, scoffs Pepin. But if you've got cold feet, you can leave us to it. Still, we tramp on in the falling night. The ever-empty trench, a desert of terrible length, has taken a shabby and singular appearance. The parapets are in ruins. Earth slides have made the ground undulate in hillocks. An indefinite uneasiness lays hold of the four huge fire-hunters and increases as night overwhelms them in this monstrous road. Pepin, who is leading just now, stands fast and holds up his hand as a signal to halt. Footsteps, they say in a sobered tone. Then, and in the heart of them, they are afraid. It was a mistake for them all to leave their shelter for so long. They are to blame and one never knows. Get in there, quick, quick, says Pepin, pointing to a right-angled cranny on the ground level. By the test of a hand, the rectangular shadow is proved to be the entry to a funk hole. They crawl in singly, and the last one, impatient, pushes the others. They become an involuntary carpet in the dense darkness of the hole. A sound of steps and of voices becomes distinct and draws nearer. From the mass of the four men who tightly hung up the burrow, tentative hands are put out at a venture. All at once, 
Pepin murmurs in a stifled voice. What's this? What? Ask the others, pressed and wedged against him. Clips, says Pippin under his breath. Bosch cartridge clips on the shelf. We're in the Bosch trench. Let's hop it. Three men make a jump to get out. Look out. Bon Dieu, don't stir. Footsteps. They hear someone walking with the quick step of a solitary man. They keep still and hold their breath. With their eyes fixed on the ground level, they see the darkness moving on the right, and then a shadow with legs detaches itself, approaches and passes. The shadow assumes an outline. It is topped by a helmet covered with a cloth and rising to a point. There is no other sound than that of his passing feet. Hardly has the German gone by when the four cooks, with no concerted plan and with a single movement, burst forth, jostling each other, run like madmen, and hurl themselves on him. Camarade, messieurs, he says. But the blade of a knife gleams and disappears. The man collapses as if he would plunge into the ground. Pepin seizes the helmet as the Bosch is failing and keeps it in his hand. Let's leg it, growls the voice of Poupardy. Got to search him first. They lift him and turn him over and set the soft, damp and warm body up again. Suddenly, he coughs. He isn't dead. Yes, he is dead. That's the air. They shake him by the pockets. With hasty breathing, the four black men stoop over their task. The helmet's mine, says Pepin. It was me that knifed him. I want the helmet. They tear from the body its pocketbook of still warm papers, its field glass, purse and leggings. Matches, shouts Blair, shaking a box. He's got some. Ah, the fool that you are, hisses Volpat. Now let's be off like hell. They pile the body in a corner and break into a run, prey to a sort of panic, and regardless of the row their disordered flight makes. It's this way. This way. Hurry, lads, for all your worth. Without speaking, they dash across the maze of the strangely empty trench that seems to have no end. My wind's gone, says Blair. I'm... He staggers and stops. Come on, buck up, old chap, gasps Pepin, hoarse and breathless. He takes him by the sleeve and drags him forward like a stubborn shaft horse. We're right, says Poupardin suddenly. Yes, I remember that tree. It's the pylons road. Ah, wails Blair, whose breathing is shaking him like an engine. He throws himself forward with a last impulse and sits down on the ground. Halt, cries a sentry. Good Lord, he stammers as he sees the four poilus. Where the... Where are you coming from that way? They laugh, jump about like puppets, full-blooded and streaming with perspiration, blacker than ever in the night. The German officer's helmet is gleaming in the hands of Pepin. Oh, Christ, murmurs the sentry with gaping mouth. But what's been up? An exuberant reaction excites and bewitches them. All talk at once, in haste and confusion, they act again the drama which hardly yet they realise is over. They had gone wrong when they left the sleepy sentry and had taken the international trench, of which a part is ours and another part German. Between the French and German sections there is no barricade or division. There is merely a sort of neutral zone at the two ends, of which sentries watch ceaselessly. No doubt the German watcher was not at his post, or likely he hid himself when he saw the four shadows, or perhaps he doubled back and had not time to bring up reinforcements, or perhaps, too, the German officer had strayed too far ahead in the neutral zone. In short, one understands what happened without understanding it. The funny part of it, says Pepin, is that we knew all about that and never thought to be careful about it, when we set off. We were looking for matches, says Volpat. And we've got some, cries Pepin. You've not lost the flamers, old broomstick. No damned fear, says Blair. Bosch matches are better stuff than ours. Besides, they're all we've got to light our fire. Lose my box? Let anyone try to pinch it off me. 
We're behind time. The soup water will be freezing. Hurry up so far. Afterwards, there'll be a good yarn to tell in the sewer where the boys are about what we did to the Boshes. End of chapter 18